This is Audible. The Eliminators, Volume Two, written by Jacqueline Druga, narrated by David Dietz. March eighth, day three hundred twenty-five, entry. Rachel. I can't believe it's been over three hundred days of procrastinating on these logs, but if I want to get technical, it has really only been about two fifty. That's how long we've officially been eliminators. Team name: the Flaming Saffrons. Thank you, Casper. I'd like to say I'm the first to make an entry because I'm the creative one of the group. After all, I did invent the winning potato chip flavor for Badu chips. A lot of good that did. Considering the world went to shit after the big unveiling, I do owe the potato chip contest for meeting my team. We all met in the Bahamas. Barry and Riggs were there for vacation. Casper was working at the airport. Sandy was celebrating her divorce, and I was celebrating the win of a lifetime. But that's not the purpose of these logs, is it? We always thought they were stupid. Liz. Or rather, formerly known as Congresswoman Liz Nazinsky, the original leader of the Eliminator movement, told us they were for the future, the history for generations to read, like letters from the Civil War. No social media, no pictures, just word of mouth to convey the story. What we did, where we went, if anyone lost their lives, we were supposed to write about them. We were busy. We never stopped, one city or town to the next, like a traveling lounge band. Who had time, and to memorialize the lost member? Our team, the Flaming Saffrons, had a rotating spot. The core group stayed the same. The last spot was what we called the Red Shirt, because they always died. We never really got to know that sixth spot. The person we lost wasn't someone we'd be able to spew forth a wonderful obituary over, until Casper. Our core team has been broken. Casper saved my life, and in doing so. Lost his. Casper was awesome. He was funny, outspoken, young, enthusiastic, and related everything to a zombie book, movie, TV show, or game. He was my friend. He's not gone. Yes, he turned, but I know something is still there. He is still in there. My last moment with Casper before we left for this leg of the journey had me second guessing about all the stiffs we put down. Maybe he's the reason I wanted to start writing in this thing, him and the fact we have begun a new leg, a new phase of being eliminators. But our job still will be the same: rid the world of the risen dead and return it to the living, one by one, until they are all gone. In the beginning, I was naive; I thought it would be easy and done with fast. I was wrong. We have been eliminators for nine months, and I remember the first day as if it were yesterday. No, I remember every day vividly. How can I not? End of log for me. Any more, and I'll get motion sickness from writing this while moving or sad over Casper. I don't do sad very well. I think to get me through, I'll just think back to the good days. Chapter one, training day, nine months earlier, May fourteenth, day twenty-seven, Robinson Township, Pennsylvania. What was Riggs doing? He really didn't have an ambition to be an eliminator. To him, it was a branch of the military listed under the guise of a different name. Riggs was already in the military. He didn't need to sign up. They had arrived and taken over the Pittsburgh International Airport twenty-two days earlier. He was content there, living with the other thirty people who escaped the Bahamas on Barry Bick's private plane. They were alive and safe. In fact. Riggs made it his mission to start setting up for long-term survival. The airport was far removed from the city and protected by a fence. Yet there he was at the training center, all because Barry, who was already pushing seventy, wanted to sign up. Of course, Rachel and Casper were raising their hands and may well have been saying, "Pick me, pick me!" when Congresswoman Liz came to recruit. It was as if Rachel and Casper had been training for it. After all, every day for three weeks they had left the airport, honing their skills against the dead, hating everything but the infected. 
whereas Riggs just wanted to move on, survive, hope the infected died off for good. Liz came to the airport and was such a politician. Pittsburgh, home of Romero zombies, was surviving better than any other city. On the outskirts of the city, it was different. The training center for eliminators was located in Robinson, Pennsylvania, at the Army National Guard Center. Oddly, Riggs had been there ten years earlier. The plan was to train everyone intensely for a week and then send them out. That was the gist of what Riggs knew. He didn't know how many people were in the auditorium. There were a few people behind Riggs as he stepped up to the registration table where two people took names. Rachel and Casper were before him and Barry. He swore Rachel and Casper took longer than anyone else. When they were asked if they had any weapons, both of them just started pulling weapons from their belts, their legs, under their pants. Riggs hadn't even noticed what they carried. They didn't have to turn them in. They did, however, have to put them in a backpack as best they could. The handle of her short sword poked out of Rachel's bag. Name? the woman asked. Um, Riggs. Is that your first or last name? I'm sorry, Jeremiah Riggs. And you're with the two people before you? she asked. And him. He pointed to Barry. Almost a full team. How many are on a team? Riggs asked. Six. You'll be assigned the other two. Riggs prepared to tell her about Sandy, how she would be going with them. After all, she was a doctor, but Riggs didn't know where exactly they were going to be eliminating. For all he knew, it was around the city, and they'd just go home for the night. Any weapons? No. Really? Did you see those two before me? After getting his welcome folder, he walked into the auditorium, and he and Barry sat next to Rachel and Casper. They picked the first row, and that didn't surprise him at all. The auditorium had about 40 people in there, all ages, shapes, and sizes. Casper leaned over Barry to speak to Riggs. Pretty exciting, isn't it? Riggs replied, yeah, less than enthusiastically. See, Rach, I knew he'd eventually do his part. What exactly does that mean? Riggs asked. You said that a couple days ago, Rach. I was doing my part. I was getting the airport ready for long-term survival. I know, Rachel said. I just think someone fit and healthy like you should be out eliminating these things with us. You can't save the world, said Riggs. We can try. Her attention was drawn away from Riggs when a colonel stepped onto the stage. He wore camouflage, but Riggs knew his rank right away. Thank you all for coming. My name's Colonel James. I and three others are working with Congresswoman Liz on this initiative and feel we have the makings of something that will eventually move beyond the tri-state area, he said. If you can, save any questions for later. Riggs knew it. He shifted his eyes to the left, and sure enough, Rachel was lowering her hand. Welcome to the Eliminators, the colonel said. Basically, our plan is a four-step survival process with three types of teams. Sweep, Eliminators, Cleanup, and the fourth step is relocating survivors. We plan on focusing on small towns and containable urban areas. Right now, we're gathering survivors in larger locations. This is a temporary move. The sweep teams are already out there. They consist of military and other volunteers. They enter a town. It is a massive sweep, removal of survivors, and execution of the infected on a large scale by whatever means necessary. Then it is on you, the eliminators. One team will be sent into one location to pick off the remaining infected and mark locations that are viable. Once you have finished, the cleanup team comes in and preps the area for residential living. Riggs kept looking at Rachel and Casper, along with Barry, to see if they were actually listening. Not only did they linger on every word, they were mesmerized. The colonel continued, Training will be quick, hard, and tough. I encourage you to give your team a name. Build camaraderie. You'll need it out there. We will supply the tools you need to do your job. Right now, we have four eliminator teams out there, and hopefully, we can make seven teams out of this. We encourage you to recruit as we are looking for people to enlist. I know that's not much, but everything you need to know is in the packet you received at the door. Before we move on, divide you up, and move into the assessment and training areas, I ask that anyone who has reconsidered leave now. Don't waste my time. Riggs looked behind him to see if anyone left. When he turned back around, he noticed Rachel, Casper, and Barry looking at him, as if waiting for him to get up. What? he whispered. Great, the colonel said. Sergeant Edwards, Sergeant Mason, Captain Perry, and I will each take ten of you. 
As he said that, two men and one woman stepped onto stage. They will answer any questions you have. I assure you, each of these individuals are very well experienced in fighting the dead and will be very helpful. The colonel proceeded to count off and point, directing each group with the instructor. Riggs and the others were the first ones assigned and the first to leave the auditorium. Chapter 2. The Pen They were led across a parking lot to a huge metal building that looked like an enclosed hangar. Each group of ten was led toward a different door. The closer Riggs drew to the building, the more he heard it, the sound of moans and squeals. He stopped walking and stared at the gray structure. "'What is it?' Rachel asked him. "'They're in there. I hear them. What if this is a trap?' "'Dude!' Casper said with worried excitement. "'What if they're turning us to make more to train people?' "'Stop!' Rachel said. "'Why would they do that?' But Riggs knew she wasn't taking any chances. She slid her backpack from her shoulder and reached inside. The instructor noticed this. "'Ma'am, what are you doing?' "'There are stiffs in there,' Rachel said. "'By the sound of them, they're runners. They're fast ones.' He tilted his head and looked at her curiously. "'Yeah, you're right. But you're also safe. You'll get a chance to use those weapons during assessment.' Rachel replaced the pack on her shoulder. The instructor stopped at a metal door. I haven't given my name. I'm Sergeant Edwards. You can call me Sarge or Sledge. Most people call me Sledge. Casper swung a point to Riggs. I think he's a Sarge, too. You serve? Sledge asked. Sixteen years, Army Reserves, Riggs answered. That's why he's not a captain or general, Casper said. You can't get big promotions when you're only part-time. Great, Sledge said, obviously dismissing Casper. I'm expecting great things from you, Sarge. Casper laughed, then quickly stopped when Riggs shot him a glance. Sledge grabbed the door handle. It's not going to smell pretty. He pulled and slid it open. Rachel and Casper were the only ones, aside from Sledge, who didn't really react. Even Barry flinched. Riggs, like the others, gagged and coughed, outwardly grunting sounds of disgust. But he got it together when he realized how embarrassed the others looked. He was supposed to be part of this tough team— he didn't want to portray he was put off by a sickening smell. And it smelled. Death. Rotten eggs and some sort of wet dog odor filled the air. The room reminded him of some sort of apocalyptic movie fight to the death arena on a smaller scale. They were led inside and put safely behind a chain-link fence. On the other side of the fence was a large open area, blood-stained and dirty. Across from that was another fence— it was like a rodeo for zombies. Eight pens, each with a dead inside, the gate waiting to be opened to release them. Riggs could see behind them was a holding area where more of them waited. The second the dead saw the group, they went nuts, clawing and clamoring. Sledge clapped his hands together once. Right, here's where I'm going to assess your skills with these things. There are no right or wrong techniques. No one is expecting you to be experts or great killers. These dead are your training dead. They're muzzled to protect from bites and hands covered to protect from scratches. Even though they pose little threat... Yes? He pointed to Casper. You have a question and state your name? Casper, he said. My question is, how do you get their mouths covered without getting bit? We got them when they were slow. It was easier, Sledge said. Okay, first assessment. Who here, one at a time, has read a zombie book or seen a zombie TV show or movie? Everyone raised their hands, including Riggs. Good, good. Anyone care to tell me what you know now that is totally different from the fictional accounts? Sledge asked. Casper raised his hands. The flies. Dude, they never show how many flies are on them. Casper looked around, acknowledging the agreements he got. I mean, seriously, they blanket them. That's good. Anyone else? Sledge asked. Doors, Rachel answered. In the movies, they never open doors. They open doors, run upstairs, downstairs. I don't know what the movies were thinking. A man from the back of the room spoke up. They don't really eat you. They tear you apart. Casper looked back at him. Not true, dude. A lot of them eat. Their bellies get all big. You never seen it? Yeah, sometimes the belly splits. Or, Rachel added, really gross is when gravity takes over and it just kind of sludges out between their legs like bad soft-serve ice cream. 
A few people groaned. Sledge stepped to him. How do you... How do you two know this? Riggs answered. They're out there. A lot. Every day. Learning them. Cool. Sledge stepped back. Okay, raise your hand if you have never killed one. Hating to do so, Riggs raised his hand. It was him and one other woman in the back of the room. Barry shook his head. That's not true. You killed one. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did, Rachel said. The Bugsy Burger worker, Stiff. You killed him on the escalator. Riggs chuckled. I kicked him, Rach. He flew backwards and cracked his skull. That hardly counts as a kill. A kill is a kill, Rachel said. Yeah. Riggs nodded sarcastically. The idea behind this, Sledge grabbed the fence, is we put you in the pen, open a gate. You can choose how many you want to try. Weapon of choice. And I see how you handle them. If you get in trouble, I'm here and so are my soldiers over there. He pointed to the two soldiers behind another fence. So let's not wait. Who wants to go first? Of course, Casper and Rachel raised their hands, but Sledge picked another person, a pretty fit man in his thirties. What's your name, son? Charles. Out of the blue and to Riggs, totally ridiculous timing, Casper started softly singing the theme song to an old 1980s sitcom. Charles in charge of our days and nights. How do you even know that? asked Riggs. Casper shrugged. Sorry. Go on, Charles. I apologize. Sledge opened up the pen gate. Weapon of choice? Charles set down his backpack and pulled out his weapon. Crowbar. How many have you taken out? I don't know. I didn't count. A couple dozen? Riggs watched as Sledge nodded, impressed, and kept thinking the guy was just showing off. There's ten in the pen, Sledge said. How many you want? I'll take two. Riggs thought he was thinking it when he said, show off, but clearly it was audible because Barry nudged him and gave that fatherly scolding look. Sorry, Riggs whispered. Charles took his place center of the pen, holding his crowbar ready. Riggs' eyes shifted to Rachel, who bit her nails out of nervousness for a man she didn't know. Open it up, two, Sledge ordered. The gate opened, and the first of the dead raced toward Charles, and the other slightly distracted by the soldier that released him. The second the dead reached Charles, he swung the crowbar low, hitting the stiff behind the legs, causing it to drop. Yes! Rachel grunted out, then caught herself and looked at Casper. He did the leg thing. Before the stiff could react, Charles swung, hitting it under the chin, before holding the bar with two hands and driving it into its head. He withdrew it in time to hit the other oncoming stiff in the side of the face, tumbling it back. He didn't relent. He hit it again, then jammed the rod into the side of his head. As if it were a sporting event, he was met with applause. Good job, Sledge told him. The two soldiers removed the downed stiffs. Sledge walked to Rachel and Casper. Something tells me you two are a team. We are, Rachel replied. We go out every day together. At first we weren't really very good. Ha! Casper said. I wasn't. You've never hesitated. That's because I hate them. You guys want to do the challenge together to show me how this team works? Sledge asked. Absolutely, Rachel replied. Weapon of choice? Sledge asked. Rachel took off her pack, opened it, and pulled out two. A honing rod, she said. And this short sword we picked up at the Dungeons and Dragons memorabilia store. Gladius, Sledge said. That's called a gladius. Casper held his up. Cool! Both Rachel and Casper stepped in the pen. How many of you two taken out? Sledge asked. Total? Rachel asked. Like, together? I mean, the first few days we weren't very good. Weak, Casper corrected. It took us a week to get motivated. How many individually? Rachel bobbed her head, moving her mouth. 207? I did 224, Casper said. But I only did more because you got that killer blister on your hand. So much better with duct tape. Rachel held up her taped hand. Riggs quickly looked at Barry. Are they lying? Barry shrugged. I don't know. You know them as well as I do. They go out every day. You too. Sledge swung his finger around in a circle. Took out over 400, he said with some disbelief. Yeah, Rachel said, but she wasn't arrogant about it. I really thought when I did the math it would be a lot easier to get rid of them all. You know, if we each killed so many, but they kept coming, it's not that easy. 
No, it's not, Sledge said and shut the gate. Take your places. Casper walked toward the center. Are you going to ask us how many we want? No. Sledge then whistled short and fast. Open the gate. Let them out. All ten. Riggs' immediate reaction was anger and shock. What? He threw himself at the fence. Stop! You can't do that! The pen opened and all ten rushed out. Casper made some sort of comment on how it reminded him of some bowling alley. Riggs couldn't make out exactly what he said, because he was still talking when the ten descended on the pair. His instinct had him rushing to the gate to help them. It seemed like far too many. Even Barry rushed that way, but there was no arguing, no fighting to get in there. Before he could even convince Sledge to open the gate, it was done. Swinging, chopping, slicing, poking, laughing? Riggs stepped back. How the hell did they get so good so fast? If in three weeks they were like that, then they truly defined what eliminators were. Their applause was nowhere near as enthusiastic as the round Charles received. Maybe others were jealous, or maybe just shocked. But there truly was no arrogance in their act. Casper did it because he must have looked at it as some sort of master live video game to beat, and Rachel killed out of hate. Pure hate. That was... That was awesome, Riggs told them as they emerged. Thanks, Rachel replied. We had a similar situation at the AMF lanes. Okay, Sledge said. Good job. Who's next? Sarge? Riggs stepped back, hands raised. Not right now. I'll pass. Sledge accepted that and chose someone else. Eventually, Riggs would have to step up for his evaluation, and after watching Casper and Rachel, he truly dreaded it. Chapter 3. At Ease Ironically, it was an airport shuttle that took them back to the airport. While about a third of the road was passable, in the three days since Liz first visited them at the airport, they had cleared a path through the vehicles that jammed the highway from Robinson to the airport. Of course they did. Liz wanted control over two of those terminals. Can you house them? Liz asked Riggs regarding ten potential eliminators who needed a place to stay. Rachel wanted to give her opinion. They already had 30 people there, and yes, the airport terminal was big enough to hold them. Rachel didn't know them. They weren't vetted, tested, or interviewed. They merely signed up, and that was it. But Riggs, he was fast to say yes, which irritated and already annoyed Rachel. She sat near the back, staring out the window on the short trip, looking at the cars just plowed to the side like snow meandering dead with no direction, watching as the shuttle passed. They were all going to be eliminators. Why didn't they stop the shuttle and take them out? That was the problem. That was why the dead kept coming and multiplying, because no one seized every opportunity. She exhaled heavily, causing steam on the window, which she wiped off rather quickly. Okay, Riggs said as he plopped in the seat next to her. What gives? Rachel only looked at him briefly, then returned to staring out the window. You're mad about the new people. Not happy. You weren't happy when Liz and her people took over two-thirds of the airport. You know, whether we like it or not, they have taken over completely. It's still a safe home for us in our domain. Hmm. Rach? What? She snapped. Whoa, stop. No, you stop. Keep them out of me and Casper's area, okay? We don't know them. We don't know if they're demented or sick. Rachel said. I think we can safely assume the virus has run its course. Never assume that. Ever. You're mad. And you were mad before Liz even asked us to take on people. You know what? Rachel turned her body to face him. Yeah, I am. I'm irritated. You act like you're all Mr. Zombie Liberal. <laughs> what? Riggs asked with a laugh. Casper poked his head over the seats from behind. Dudes, I heard Zombie Liberal. Can I get in on this? No barked Riggs. Fine. Casper sat back down. Hey, Rachel snapped at him. Don't yell at him. What is a zombie liberal? Riggs asked. Maybe it's more passive, Rachel replied. People who don't think you should put down the dead, just let them die off. Okay. Then you go and act all Rambo today at the evaluation. Ah, I get it, Riggs nodded. You're jealous. No, I'm not jealous. Miffed. We asked you to go out with us, maybe get you over your fear of them. 
I'm not scared of them, said Riggs. You hesitated on Greg the pilot. You didn't shoot him. Maybe, Casper said from his seat. He's still afraid of them, but he wasn't because they weren't dangerous today. Maybe, Rachel said. I'd like to see him out there with the ones that can bite and scratch. And it would be the same thing, Riggs retorted. I don't need to go out every day to do that. It's basic hand-to-hand -hand combat, but with an edge because they're fucking mindless. Jeremiah, Barry spoke in a low, scolding tone. Language, Riggs grunted. I've had training. I'm an expert marksman, not some housewife from Indiana who probably went out to the shooting range twice a week because she had downtime between changing diapers. You sexist, egotistical son of a bitch. Riggs looked across the aisle to Barry. What? Not warning her about language? Barry ignored him. Okay, that was wrong, Riggs said to her. I didn't realize this was a competition, Rach. It's not. Then why are you acting like it is? Because Casper and I have no formal training. We did what we did, and then you went out, one accidental kill under your belt, Mr. Hesitate to Shoot, and you take eight out with ease. How does that make me and Casper look? Or how does it make poor Barry look? He only got one. This is silly. How does it make you and Casper look? How about how does it make our team look? It makes our team look unstoppable. Rachel stared at him, biting her bottom lip. What? Riggs asked. No comment? No, you're... You're right. Wait, what? I'm right? You're right. I'm being childish. I'm sorry. Just like that? Riggs asked. You're done? This is over just like that? Yes. I don't stay mad. I don't hold grudges. Why do you think I was married for 18 years? Wow. Riggs sat back. When he did, the shuttle slowed down. He peered around Rachel. The fence had opened up behind their terminal, and the shuttle drove across the tarmac. Door-to-door -door service, Riggs said. The shuttle pulled a few feet from the staircase, and Sledge, who was driving, opened the door. Get you right here tomorrow morning. Zero seven hundred hours. Since they were in the back, they waited. There were only ten people. Riggs let Barry and Rachel go before him, and Rachel walked down the aisle, her pack over her shoulder. When she stepped down, she nodded to Sledge. Good job today, Sledge said. Thanks. Rachel turned around to face the shuttle. Casper stepped off, then Riggs, but he didn't disembark. He looked back, hesitating. Sledge asked, Everything okay? That other woman on the bus... Evie, Sledge said. Yeah, she's acting weird. How so? Scared, maybe, I don't know. Riggs turned around, took a step in. Hey, Evie, you coming? No response. Then Riggs turned back around. She's coming. He stepped off. You leading everyone in? Rachel asked. Yeah, I'll just... Evie appeared two steps before the bottom, and she stopped. Her face was sweaty and pale, and she leaned some her hand gripping the railing. Rachel whispered to Riggs. She may have gotten carsick. I know Sledge was a little heavy on the turns and brakes. Riggs moved to her and held out his hand. You need help? She gripped his fingers and stepped down the final step to the tarmac, and when she did, she arched back, her head going backwards right before she flung it forward and bloody vomit poured from her mouth. Stay back, Sledge ordered. She's infected! Her upper body shook and convulsed. Arms flailed as her stomach sucked in, just before every heave outward of bloody projectile vomiting. Rachel stepped back, pulling onto the back of Riggs's shirt. Evie shook and dropped to the ground, coughing and choking. A single shot from Sledge, and Evie stopped. It happened so fast. Rachel felt Riggs step up from her grip and move forward. Stay away, Riggs. You can't help her. Another step away from her, and Riggs turned around. Stay... Stay back, Rach. The expression on his face was fear. Total fear. And Rachel saw the reason for it when she saw he was covered with Evie's bloody vomit. Everyone get back! Sledge yelled with an edge of panic. Stay back from him! He lifted his gun and aimed it at Riggs. No! Rachel jumped in front of Riggs. No! Ma'am, he's covered, Sledge said. Step aside! No! Rachel barked. Rach, Riggs spoke. Step aside. No. No, I will not step aside, Rachel argued passionately. This man put his life on the line for my son. 
This man tried to save my family. If this man is infected, I will put him down myself. If he is infected, and not a moment before. Riggs just stared at her. Sledge handed her the pistol, gave her one hard glance, and then called the others to follow. I'm staying, Barry said. Me too, said Casper. Riggs shook his head. Please don't. Go inside. Please. Please. It'll be all right, Rachel said. He's fine. Trust me, he's fine. Barry placed a hand on her shoulder and squeezed before he and Casper joined the others. Once they were alone, Riggs lowered his head. What are you doing, Rach? Waiting. Until then, believe. We don't know. It only takes a minute. We know that. It may be different. Raise the weapon. Riggs, please, Rachel said. If you're infected, you're going to be too busy throwing up to be harmful. Then stand back. I don't want you to get infected. What, and I die? Oh, who cares, Rachel said. I don't. Besides, you aren't sick. I know it. I feel it. I told you, never assume the sickness was gone. You're right, Riggs said. And thank you. You're welcome. And they stood there, out on the tarmac, staring at each other in silence. Riggs waiting for the moment he'd get sick, and Rachel knowing that moment would never happen. Chapter 4 Friends in the Dark It was the first time since arriving at the airport that Riggs could recall hearing gunfire. He wasn't blaming it on the new residents or the soldiers that took over Terminal A. The gunfire was in the distance, and part of Riggs had to agree with Rachel when she complained that they should have just stopped and took out the ones on the side of the road. Eventually, they'd get to the airport. They didn't tire or sleep. They kept moving. Riggs was keeping to himself, occasionally finding a window to look out. He didn't need to stay away from people. He just felt that was what people wanted. Sledge had called for a medical team that showed up in hazmat suits and tested him both him and Rachel. There they stayed. A rapid readout told him and Rachel it was negative, but the antibody test would take another day. Sandy was part of the group, a doctor, and while she didn't have much experience with viruses, she was certain Riggs had immunity. With how fast she heard the virus transmitted, there was no way he wasn't immune with all the infected blood on him. That's what she conveyed to him, giving him reassurance that he was fine. He thought about how little he and the others who fled the Bahamas actually knew about the virus. Before they left, Riggs had just started paying attention to it. It had erupted by the time they landed. No one at the resort had even known a thing. To Riggs, it was fast. But was it really? Had officials known about it even longer? He guessed the point was moot considering most of the world now teetered on the apocalypse. Riggs spent a restless evening talking to those he knew from the Bahama plane ride. He tried to get to know Charles, the guy who would be on their eliminator team, but Charles was like, Mr., no offense, but I need to wait until I know 100% you aren't going to start vomiting blood all of a sudden. Riggs said, fair enough, though he knew he wasn't infected. How did he know he didn't even have some sort of dormant infection like Evie? If, of course, there was such a thing as a dormant infection... Riggs carried a roll wrapped in plastic and stew in a takeout bowl, all courtesy of the bakery and restaurant in the food court. Sandy used their supplies to do the cooking. She rotated restaurants daily, and she asked Riggs to take food to Rachel. He hadn't talked to her since their blood test, so with food in hand, he searched her out. He went to her wing of the terminal to seek her out. At first, he thought maybe she was sleeping. It was quiet and dark. Then he noticed the slight glow coming from her little area. She lived in a small security office, and when Riggs peeked in, he saw her sitting on the couch, in the dark, staring at her phone. He knocked on the open door. She looked up and set down the phone. Seems to be a running theme tonight, Riggs said. Rachel cleared her throat. <clears throat> what is... Looking at a phone. Are a lot of people doing that? Yeah. Barry is, too. Yeah, I just... I needed to see my family, Rachel said. I miss them. I understand. I know you do. Rachel reached to the floor and grabbed her bottle, pouring some in the glass. Want some? I have an extra glass. Um, sure. He set the roll and soup on her coffee table. For you. 
Sandy said you didn't eat. Thank you. I was busy. Rachel poured him a drink. We have an early day tomorrow. Yeah, I know. She patted the spot next to her and then handed him a glass. She lifted, then sipped hers. You know, Pittsburgh has cell service. You're kidding me. Rachel shook her head. I've been calling everyone in my contacts. Any luck? No. Maybe you should try. My phone's lost somewhere in the Bahamas. I'm sorry. I mean that genuinely. Phones hold memories. Yes, they do. You okay? Rachel asked. Yes. I wanted to thank you for what you did today. I believe you would have done the same for me, Rachel said. I would have. When Evie threw up blood on you, all I kept thinking about was my son. How no one could get near him. How they just took him and how alone he had to feel. I wasn't going to let that happen with you. Even if it meant your own life. I got news for you, Rachel nudged him. I don't fear death. Hmm. Riggs nodded, sipping his drink. I see that. It's still early, you know, for me, for Barry. It's only been three weeks since we lost everyone. You do what you do to get through, Riggs said. And I'm sorry I made you mad today. You really are good at taking them out. For a housewife from Indiana, Rachel teased. Sorry. No, it's fine. You're right, I, uh, went to the range twice a week. I belong to a gun club because Cliff, my husband, was so damn liberal. I did it to irk him. Now, now when I go after the stiffs, I think of my husband and my daughter and what they did to him. Maybe one day the anger will leave, the hatred. By then, taking them out will be a habit for you. Riggs brought his drink to his mouth and noticed the Eliminator welcome pack on the table. Have you read that? He pointed to it. Every word. Seriously? Yep. Rachel nodded. Liz worked really hard on a plan. She worked really hard to keep the city alive, bringing people to safety, starting Eliminator teams before they were a thing. But it's going to fall, you know. What is? Riggs asked. Pittsburgh. It'll fall. They're expecting it. I heard Liz talking about her next location and maybe even having a mobile command. Why do you think they're expecting it? Because of all the runners and lurkers we saw on the side of the road. They aren't taking time to take the ones out around the city. They'll just keep them out. Eventually, they'll break through. They'll get everyone out and sweep Pittsburgh. According to that, we'll never really eliminate them all in a city. They target small towns, small communities that they can secure once clean. Wow. You really did read it, didn't you? Riggs chuckled. I'll leave you and Casper to be my information source, since between the two of you, you guys have been right the whole time. Rachel leaned forward, set down her drink, lifted the bowl, and untaped the spoon from the lid. Thank you for bringing this. Gotta keep up your strength. Let me ask you something. Rachel removed the lid from her stew. How do you think we'll be as eliminators? Me, you, Casper, Barry, and the new guy? Honestly, nothing less. I think we all have nothing to lose and are driven in some weird way. We, Rach, are going to be awesome. We're a natural team, Riggs said. We will define what it means to be eliminators. Chapter 5. See Clearly. May 22nd, Day 35. Robinson Township, Pennsylvania. There was a certain buzz and rush about the facility that Barry didn't understand. It was almost as if they were being rushed, at least for him and Sandy. Seven teams were rolling out, all of which were getting supplies, ammunition, and instructions. Perhaps it was just the excitement of the day, or maybe Barry was just slower than everyone else. He hated leaving the airport. It felt like home, even with all the strangers strolling about as if they owned the place. But it was time to go. Time to do what they signed up to do. Riggs and Charles went to grab the ammunition and weapons. Rachel and Casper retrieved the food and other supplies, while Barry went with Sandy to the medical division to gather her supplies and help her put them on the flat dolly. The young man pointed to a stack of boxes, then rattled off the contents of the boxes faster than Barry had heard a human being speak. He was grateful the man handed Sandy a list. Back of the vehicle is the medical office. It's small, so make sure you only load what you need and place the other boxes in the undercarriage storage. You should be good for a while, but you can always come back. Will I have time to stock before we leave? She asked. You should. 
Assignments are being given out. We have a lot of areas to hit. One last meeting with teams before you're dismissed. And oh, he snapped his fingers. A pound of medical-grade marijuana. He handed her a sealed bag. Barry lifted it. Why do we need medical-grade marijuana? It was requested. By whom? The man looked at his sheet. Casper, for his glaucoma. What? Barry barked out with half a laugh. Casper's 25. He doesn't have glaucoma. Sir, who am I to question? Barry waved his finger to Sandy. You control that. Absolutely. And that's it, the stockman said. Good luck to you out there. Barry wasn't sure where out there would be. He actually didn't even know where their vehicle would be. He grabbed hold of the dolly and headed with Sandy back to the central area of the compound. This is not going to be enough, Rachel said, looking at the dolly of food as she and Casper waited for the others to join them. It really isn't. Maybe they're expecting us to get more on the road. Yeah, but didn't they say the sweep teams go through first and take everything? I'm glad we hit the liquor store yesterday. And we got some practice on real stiffs, said Rachel. Riggs should have come with us. I keep telling that dude that. He doesn't listen. He thinks they're all going to be out there with muzzles and garden gloves. Rachel shook her head. He's one of us, and we need to watch his back. True. It's cool, though, isn't it, that Sandy's on the team? Rachel said. I was so happy they let her come as long as she passed the deflect the infection test. I think she passed because they didn't have a medic to give us. Doesn't matter. I'm glad to have her, and... She leaned into Casper. It had to make you laugh when Barry scored higher than Riggs on the mental awareness test. Dude, the look on Riggs... Casper cleared his throat and upped his chin. What? Rachel asked, then noticed Riggs and Charles pulling the dolly of weapons and other items. Look, Casper said, it's Riggs and... He started to sing. Charles in charge of our day. Stop, Charles said calmly. Just stop. So here's the deal. Riggs held up a set of keys. Our eliminator vehicle is out back. We can take this stuff out there, but they said to hold off until after we pick up our assignment folders and instructions. He gave a nod as a point to indicate Barry and Sandy were returning. I just told them we'll take our stuff out to the vehicle, but won't be able to really organize until after the final instructions. Which I think will be fast, Barry said. Something's happening here. I feel it. Me too, said Riggs. Did you get everything? Sandy answered. Yes, and I will be controlling your medical marijuana. She raised an eyebrow to Casper. Dude, for real? Medical grade. Wait, Riggs held up his hand. Why do you need marijuana? He doesn't, said Barry. I do, argued Casper. No one, said Charles, needs marijuana. Not true, Casper said. I do. It's for his glaucoma, Rachel added. Oh, stop, Riggs laughed. You have glaucoma? I do. No way. If he says he has glaucoma, Rachel said, why are you arguing with him? Because he's a fucking pothead. Jeremiah, language. Ladies are present. He's very misogynistic, said Rachel, so he doesn't notice those things. What the hell? Riggs asked. Jeremiah? No, you could scold me over the word hell? Have you heard her mouth? Riggs pointed to Rachel. Rachel gasped. And we have totally steered off the weed topic, Sandy said. You're a doctor, Riggs stated. Does he have glaucoma? Oh my God, Rachel scoffed. You think she could just look at him and see? She's a baby doctor, so unless it comes out of his vagina, she can't diagnose on sight. Riggs partially closed his eyes for a second and then turned his head to Barry. And you say nothing about her mouth? She said vagina. It's a body part, Barry replied. No, Sandy said. No, Casper asked. A vagina is not a body part? That's not what I technically, Rachel said. If you think about it, it is a body part. Stop, Sandy said loudly. A vagina is a body part. I said no because I don't think Casper has glaucoma. He's far too young. See, Charles said. I can't, dude, Casper said. I have glaucoma. Casper, Riggs snapped. You don't have glaucoma. Okay, maybe not, but that's because I smoke marijuana. It makes it go away. Fine, Riggs gave in. You have glaucoma. Smoke the weed. Casper snickered. 
<laughs> the weed, Riggs grunted. We need to get our stuff to the vehicle so we can get to this briefing. Here. He reached out to the flat dolly and started handing out large bundles wrapped in cellophane. These are your uniforms. Casper looked down to the blue and white patch with the letter E. The logo's cool. It is, said Riggs. I don't get one, Sandy asked. You're the doctor. You don't have to. Oh, good. We have to wear them, Barry asked. For now, Riggs explained, so we can be identified on sight. Rachel held her package. She just stared at it. Riggs noticed. You don't want to wear a uniform? I have no problem wearing a uniform. Then what is it? Riggs asked. Green is not my color. I see. Riggs grabbed the dolly handle. Tough. He pulled his dolly and walked away. Sandy and Barry followed. After they were gone, Rachel turned to Casper. What did I say? Casper shrugged. Some of those military guys are like that. You think he bought the glaucoma thing? No, not at all. Damn it! Good thing he's not our leader. It'd be a complete power trip, like later seasons Rick from the zombie TV show. Oh, so true. But if he's not our leader, Rachel asked, who is? Chapter 6 Lost Cause Liz Nazinski always looked camera ready, her hair done, makeup perfect, but not too much. She dressed like the congresswoman she was instead of a woman in the apocalypse. Business as usual, even if it wasn't. Jeremiah Riggs? Liz lifted a thick manila folder from the table as she stood before their team. I'm going to let you handle these and inform your team since I assigned you the leader of your team. What? Rachel asked out of the blue. He's the leader? Is there a problem with my choice? No, Barry answered. No, there is not. Liz smiled politely. I was asking Rachel, Mr. Bick. It's fine, Rachel said. I'm a little surprised. I thought Barry would be assigned leader because of his... his... She cleared her throat. Mature status and managerial skills. Unfortunately, Mr. Bick doesn't have the skill level we need against the dead. Sergeant Edward was instrumental in the decision, although he favored Casper, which would be a good choice, but medical informed me he has glaucoma. Riggs smirked. I've been informed of that as well. He lifted the folder. I will review this and inform them what needs to be done. Perhaps you can do that while they load up the vehicle. We need you on the road. Liz looked down at the table. My notes say your team hasn't chosen a name yet. I thought we had one, Riggs said. E-Team D1U4. Everyone is picking crafty names. We'll figure something out, said Riggs. Good. You're my last team and I need you to head out. The president wants to meet with me and make this a nationwide effort, Liz said. So don't be surprised if you end up a thousand miles away one day. That prospect seemed far off, especially since there were only a total of nine teams and three states to cover. The program would have to spread fast and far for that to happen. The Eliminator RV, which looked more like a bus, was just outside the doors, undercarriage flaps open. The vehicle was decked out. It wasn't meant to be a live-in vehicle, a place to spend the night if need be. For the most part, when they arrived in a town, they were to select a place. Inside, the RV was designed by a local survival expert, and they had everything they needed. There was a separate storage just for gas cans. They couldn't load them on top because the steel fencing gates retracted to the roof and rolled down if needed for protection, caging in the entire RV. There was a lot to take in, too much to read during the short time while loading the RV. Riggs left the weaponry up to Charles. He, of course, would inspect. No matter how big it seemed inside, there were still six of them riding in the RV, and space inside was an issue. Riggs instructed them to have enough weapons on board, but not too many. He found a space inside to place some extra weapons, then left the envelope on the kitchen table and went outside to help finish loading. Not that, he heard Sandy say to Casper. That case has to go inside. That's the Eliminator survivor case. Riggs's interest was piqued. What's that? They explained it's in case one of us gets bit or scratched. Amputation kit? An antiviral serum they said works if we amputate within an hour of the bite or scratch. And... A weapon to prevent us from turning if it gets to that point. Wow, said Riggs. 
Wow was right. They thought of almost everything, Casper commented. Almost everything? Riggs asked. Okay, I'll bite. What great apocalypse one did they not think of? For starters, they didn't... Casper turned quickly at the sound of gunfire. What the hell? Riggs stepped to the side to look around the RV, and he saw soldiers racing toward the end of the property, firing on the fast-moving herd of dead that swept their way. Shit! Charles, Barry, and Rachel came from the RV. What's going on? Rachel asked. Stiffs, answered Riggs. Everyone arm up. Sandy, in the RV. Now, Casper, grab her stuff. What about grab it? As soon as he said that, Charles handed him a rifle and magazine. Riggs prepped his weapon as his team armed up. Riggs! Sledge shouted. What are you doing? Heading out! No! Get your team out of here! There are too many! You need... We need the Eliminators out where they can do their jobs! We have sweep teams here! We can handle this! Go! Sledge ordered. Now! As he charged toward the fight. Is he serious? Charles asked. I guess so. You heard the man, Riggs said. Everyone in! He reached down, grabbing the last box as Barry shut the hatches. Drive! Riggs tossed Barry the keys. And go where? Hit the highway. The sound of gunfire increased, along with mortars. Riggs looked back. There were so many of the dead. Too many. The army would have to take extreme measures to take control, using much more than just guns. We have to go. Now. We're not fighting them? Rachel asked. No, Rach, we're leaving. They want us to go. She shook her head in disgust and slammed her hand on the doorway as she stepped back in. And they wonder why there's an apocalypse problem. He didn't quite understand her comment. The six of them wouldn't make a difference. Everything was a battle for Rachel, and he was learning she never wanted to miss a chance to fight. Riggs was sure, eventually, she would get her fill. Chapter 7. From a Distance. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Morrison family called Lawrenceville, Pennsylvania home. They had a row house there, two children, a 10-month-old and a 3-year-old, both girls. Steph and James loved their jobs in the food industry and adored their artsy neighborhood. When news of the outbreak happened, it was far away, barely in the news, and both of them refused to give in to any virus hype. They dropped the two kids off at Steph's aunt and went to work as usual. Neither thought anything of it until James served a classic New York-style Reuben sandwich to a couple at table six, and no sooner did James set it down than the man began to violently vomit. Bloody vomit flowed from his mouth like a fire hydrant. While James jumped back, startled, the female dining companion tried to help the man, and, in a minute, she too was thrashing and throwing up. My God, man, help them, his manager shouted. James didn't. In fact, he backed up even farther, watching his manager not only try to help, but fall victim as well. James took off his apron and ran. He called his wife on the way to the store and told her to get the kids and get home. He was headed to get supplies and would be home. He didn't know if he was infected because he had gotten exposed, so he planned to stay in the entranceway of their home. He conveyed all that while moving at a fast pace, the sirens of emergency workers blaring. Their store wasn't packed. In fact, it was normal. James grabbed a buggy, rushing and grabbing what he could. They weren't rich, and the $200 order took all the money he had in his checking. He'd worry about it later. The entire time, James kept thinking, the wheels of his mind spinning. He grabbed a can of disinfectant spray, spraying the groceries before leaving them on the back porch. The front of his home had two doors. Their home was over a hundred years old. The first door led to the stairs out front, and there was an entryway about four by four right before another door. That was where James sat. This is ridiculous, Steph told him. Come on in, go into a bedroom. No, no, Steph, you didn't see it. She would. Like him, she immediately got on the phone. The outbreak that was continents and a sea away was literally at their doorstep. James, who spent so much time avoiding information about the outbreak, suddenly was clicking on every link, every bit of information he could. The more he read, the more scared he became. The only good news he found was that if he hadn't shown signs within five minutes, more than likely he was fine. 
The virus was that fast, that deadly. All the experts agreed that anything that spread that fast would burn out. They were wrong, and that was before people started to rise. In their neighborhood, things were bad. Within three days, there was no news from anywhere else in the country. The mayor of Pittsburgh was dead, and Congresswoman Nazinski was the city spokesperson, rallying the people to stick together and beat it. It was then James saw the first risen. The Dada man from his three-year-old daughter at the window prompted James to look out. A man stood there on the sidewalk. James could only see him from behind. He wore a suit jacket and he paced side to side, looking left to right. What was he doing so close to his home? Stay here, he told his daughter, Lola, then walked to the front door. He poked his head out the exterior one, aiming his voice to the man. Excuse me, can I help you with something? The man spun around. Dried blood formed around his mouth and on his chest. His eyes were dark, face gray, and without hesitation, the man raged toward James. He slammed the door and locked it, but the man kept pounding against it. It sounded as if he plowed his body into the door over and over. It went on for hours, attracting others like him. The children were scared, but the back of the house was safe. The car was out there. If they needed to, they could run for it. James spent the night packing what he could in one bag, placing it by the back door. By morning, the raging people outside his home were gone, and the Pittsburgh Emergency Alert System was announcing there was safety in numbers, and authorities could not keep people safe if they spread out. They were urging people to come to one of the survival centers set up in various areas, North Hills, Eastern Pittsburgh, and downtown. Downtown was closest, and after loading the car, James and Steph put the kids in their car seats and made their way to the center. The journey was easy. Not many cars were on the road, and those that were appeared to have been moved aside. The bridges, overpasses, and any other entrances into the city were blocked off. James and his family were checked for signs of infection and given a room with cots. It was safe. There were men and women with guns constantly on patrol. They felt safe until James knew that safety wasn't going to last. Each day, more and more of the dead gathered at the barricade. Soon enough, they would come down, James believed, and then they did. On what seemed a moment's notice, James had to pack up the family and follow the escape convoy going north toward Erie. There was too much uncertainty. Steph grew nervous as they pulled out of the city. The cars moved slowly, and as they embarked on the freeway, more and more clusters of cars blocked the road, causing the caravan to weave in and out to get through. She was grateful her children were so young, and they couldn't see the horrors outside the window. The abandoned cars were nothing but a memorial to mayhem and murder. Open car doors, busted windows, blood everywhere, dead bodies everywhere, most of them torn to shreds beyond recognition. They weren't on the freeway for more than two miles when the lead driver seemed to feel that the highway ahead was too dangerous. There was no guarantee they'd get through, and the lead car led them off. Not long after they exited, the entire convoy of cars came to a standstill. "'What's happening?' Steph asked. "'I don't know.' Glancing at the side-view mirror, Steph saw the man and woman in the white van behind them. They stepped out and walked forward. Steph wound down her window. "'Excuse me, do you know what's going on?' The woman stopped. "'No, but we're finding out. Thank you.' Steph wound up her window. She could feel her daughter kicking the seat, and the baby started to get fussy. "'Maybe they stopped to figure out the best way to go,' James said. "'Maybe.' Steph glanced out the windshield. The white van man and woman were running. "'Go, go, go!' The man waved out his hand as he raced by their car. "'Shit!' James put the car in gear. James? Steph asked with worry. The baby cried, and James jerked the wheel and hit the gas. Steph clutched the handle above the passenger's door as James pulled out of the line of traffic and drove to the side of the road. Turning slightly in her seat, Steph looked behind them. The van followed, doing the same thing. A few cars up, James hit the brakes when another car in the line cut him off, swerving outward madly and then going forward. Go, James, go! Steph told him. She turned her head to look out when one of those things slammed into the window, causing Lola to scream. James jolted the car forward, following the vehicle in front. The previous cars in the convoy weren't so lucky. They were swarmed with the dead. Steph brought her hand to her mouth, but couldn't help but look. 
her heart not only beating faster, but feeling as if it were going to rip from her chest as she watched people pulled from the cars and others tackled as they tried to run. They were free and clear, traveling fast, the visions of the chaos and dead getting farther and farther from sight in the side-view mirror. That was where Steph's focus was, watching to make sure they put distance between them. For miles, she watched that mirror, feeling better, safer, and more relieved every second they drove. Until James shouted, Shit! Steph felt the force of the slamming brakes and looked up in enough time to see the tail end of the car in front of them. The car had stopped moving, and even though James swerved, the side of their vehicle slammed into the back end of the car. The kids cried, and Steph hurriedly looked back to make sure they were fine. Steph, you okay? James asked. Yes, yes. Why did they stop? They hit something, I think. A tap on James's window caused them to jolt. The van man was there. You guys all right? James nodded. Yeah, we are. Thank you. Good. Why don't you guys just join us in the van? Thank you. That might not be a bad... James's speech slowed down. Idea. Steph looked. The driver's door of the car in front was open and the driver staggered out. She knew immediately by looking at him, he was one of them. He was covered in blood and looked around in confusion. When he spotted them, he moved rigidly and slowly, unlike the ones that chased them. Let's go! Hurry! Van Man said and raced away. Grab the baby, Steph said. I'll grab Lola. James jumped out, immediately opening the rear door behind him. Lola was screaming, Mama and Dada! Steph had a little bit of trouble. It was her door that smashed into the car before them, but even in her rush, she managed to open the door. She was barely out of the car when she heard the grunts and groans, causing her to pause. Steph, come on! James yelled. He had the screaming baby in his arms and shut the back door. Reaching for Lola's door, Steph saw the van man and his wife were surrounded. She wanted to yell for James to get in the car, to drive, but he was already on his way. And those things saw him and the baby. They started to chase him, and he just took off running with the baby in his arms. Drive away, drive away, Steph thought. As she made the decision to do so, she saw the dead coming. She could hear Lola screaming, and Steph reached for the back door. By the time she did, at least four of them were upon her. She couldn't get Lola, and the only thing she could think to do was draw them away from her child. Even the ones that tore apart the van man and his wife moved toward her car, giving up their quest for flesh for another, Steph and her daughter. Here! She waved out her arms, jumping and yelling to get their attention. Here! Chase me! They turned away from the car slightly. She had them. She led them away, and three of the four came for her. Backing up toward the van, Steph thought of what she could use for a weapon. Anything. Just bash them. In the city survival camp, they told them how to defend themselves. Scared and frightened for her family, she took another step, ready to run, spun, and slammed into one of them. It snarled at her, and she pushed it away. It didn't do much. Trying to sidestep and go around, another appeared. They came for her. She couldn't run back. She couldn't run forward. This was it, she thought, the moment of her death. She wouldn't go down without a fight. One more second, one more step toward her. Steph prepared to be grabbed. Instead, suddenly, through the face of one of the dead, emerged a long metal object and a blade sliced through the head of the other. Both of them dropped simultaneously, exposing a woman and younger man, both wearing green uniforms. Shaking, her eyes widened as Steph looked at the pair. You all right? the woman asked. Steph nodded fast. The woman backed up, opened the back van door, then came for Steph. Here. She took Steph's arm. Get inside. My family! My daughter's in the car! We're on it. Get inside! Steph hesitantly did, and they shut the door. Coming around the van, Casper watched Barry spear down with the forked end of a hammer into the skull of the recently risen van man. Big B! Hit the woman, too! Casper said. She still has a lot left of her, and she'll get up! Got it! Barry replied. Meet you at the car! Casper, with Rachel right with him, raced to the car where at least six were pounding on the windows. They aren't thinking or they'd open the door. We have to get them before they figure it out. 
Casper could hear the child's scream of fear even through the moans of the stiffs. He didn't hesitate when he arrived. He stabbed through one that was climbing on the car. In a run, Gladius in hand, Rachel raced by the horde on the passenger side of the car, bringing the blade to the leg and slicing behind their legs. One by one, like dominoes, their knees buckled and they dropped down. Casper followed through with head kills using the honing rod. Rachel ran to the other side of the car. She saw it through the corner of her eye, the slow-moving one approaching. Barry, get the one late to the party! She saw briefly as Barry moved by her, and Rachel took out the final one as he reached for the door handle. Immediately, she opened the door. The little girl was hysterical. Oh, sweetie, it's okay. You're okay. Rachel crawled in and undid the car seat. Come here. It's all right. I'll take you to Mommy. She reached and grabbed the child, cradling her in her arms. Top speed, Riggs and Charles chased the group of stiffs that pursued the man and the baby across the field. The last thing he wanted to do was fire a weapon and draw even more in. But the relentless stiffs were gaining ground, and all it would take is one trip, one fall, like in any bad horror film, and that man and the baby were goners. Casper! Riggs called into the radio as he ran. Help us out if you can. Roger that. Riggs knew he just had to push, push a little more to get to the dead. Calling out to get their attention didn't work. They were focused on that crying baby. He just needed to get closer, and Riggs noticed Charles had stopped. What are you doing? Keep going, Charles ordered as he reached behind him for his bow. He was quickly upon it, loading it, drawing back. Riggs watched the first arrow as it burrowed into the head of one of them, then the other. Dude, Casper called over the radio. Way to play the Katniss card. By the time Riggs cut the distance, close enough to attack, Charles had taken down five of the eight. He lifted the hammer from his belt and tossed it like an axe. It spun, hitting the man in the back and sending him down. Riggs lunged his way, then plunged the sword into his head. Turning, he saw the last remaining one had stopped. The man and the child must have fallen. Drawing his gladius, Riggs raced over, and with both hands on the sword, he swung out like a baseball player behind the stiff. The body of the stiff dropped to the ground, exposing the father, protectively cradling the baby. Hearing the snarl of the still active head of the stiff, Riggs raised his sword, but before he could impale it, Casper did. Nice, Casper said. You guys were cool. Out of breath, Riggs extended a hand to the father. Are you two all right? Are you bit, scratched? He shook his head, catching his own breath. No, we're fine. The radio crackled and Rachel spoke. All clear, Riggs. Mother and child secure and fine. Same here, Riggs responded. The man stood with the baby. Thank you. Thank you so much. Who the hell are you guys? Dude, Casper replied. We're the Eliminators. I'm sorry. He shifted his eyes from Casper to Riggs, then Charles. The what? Chapter 8. Breach. Westview, Pennsylvania. It was obvious to Rachel, and probably everyone else in the vehicle, the Eliminators were in some sort of trouble with command. Riggs spoke on the field phone, and after informing command of the four survivors, the remainder of Riggs's conversation were a series of, yeah, and I understand, responses. He spoke for a while in the driver's area of the RV. After the rescue, they moved on to a safer spot only a few miles from where they rescued the family. The toddler had calmed down, but the baby was miserable. Rachel wondered if it was teething. Sandy took time to examine each person in the family and was with the mother, Steph, longer than the others. Barry had made sure they had food and were emotionally all right as they waited in the RV. Casper and Charles were cleaning weapons and putting them away. Finally, Riggs hung up and returned to the group in the main area of the RV. All done? Barry asked. We ready to roll? Uh, yeah, Riggs said. Yes. Where are we taking them? asked Barry. To Franklin. They'll send a retrieve team for them. Rachel folded her arms. Why are we in trouble? We're not, said Riggs. You were doing a lot of simple responses, almost as if you were being scolded. Oh, I was, Riggs replied. No need to repeat what was said. What's done is done. We move on. 
They didn't understand how we got so far off track, going southeast when we should have gone north. Obviously, Rachel said, we were the only team headed north or they'd know that all the roads to the highway going north were blocked. I explained that to them. And that was all they were angry about? No, Riggs replied. They felt we didn't need to stop to help, that it put the mission and team in danger. Rachel released a ha and shook her head. We are here to be target people, special forces of the apocalypse. So basically we can take out the dead to clear a town, but not to save people? Let them go? Riggs shrugged and lifted his hands. We're not worrying about it. What happens if we run across someone in trouble again? We help them, said Riggs. We just... We just don't tell command that it was a rescue. We tell them we found survivors, which isn't lying. Rachel nodded. I can go with that. Still pisses me off. They act like we're being paid. James, the father, who was holding his three-year-old at the table, looked up. You're not? In a sense, we are, Riggs said. Food, weapons, a vehicle. Still, said James, that's not pay. I mean, what about money or gold? Rachel shook her head. Um, we're like in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, and I don't think things are coming back. Rach, Riggs said, don't say that. Say what? What you just said. About us not coming back? Rachel asked. No, the other thing. What you called it. The zombie apocalypse? Riggs cringed. Oh my God, talk about denial. I'm not in denial, I'm just... Riggs grunted. You've been hanging around Casper too much. Let's just go. James asked. We're going to Franklin? Nice little town. Oh, cool, you know the way. Yes, Rachel replied. I guess they already swept through there and we just go in and pick off the remaining... She looked at Riggs. Zombies. Barry, Riggs said. Can you drive? Sure. Barry walked to the front. Riggs walked to the open side door. Gentlemen, he called to Casper and Charles. We're rolling, let's go. He turned to Rachel. As soon as they're in, hunker down. How did you find us? James asked. We aren't from this area, Rachel said. No GPS and we just got lost. It was by accident. All of the roads were closed and we were just trying to find I-79. Thank God you found us. James leaned down and kissed his daughter. It was unbelievable what you guys did. It's what we do. None of us have anyone left to fight for, Rachel told him. So we do what needs to be done. I'm sorry about that. Rachel nodded sadly, then perked up a bit when Casper and Charles walked in. All done? she asked. Yep, me and Mr. Katniss got it loaded and secured, Casper replied. Why? Charles faced him. Do you insist on calling me that? Because you rocked that bow and arrow. Does she have a song too? Charles asked. Casper laughed. No, but I can sing the Charles in Charge song. No, just no. Charles shook his head. He pumped a few times on the hand sanitizer and then held for a second as the RV started to move. Are we doing lunch here or waiting for Franklin? If you're hungry, eat, Rachel told him. By all means, don't wait for us. We eat at weird times. How so? Charles asked. Late at night. It just works out that way, Rachel shrugged. I'm in the mood for ramen. Charles opened up the cupboard. James, can I make you and your children something? Maybe my daughter. I'm good. Rachel felt the RV slow down. Riggs, what's going on? Why are we stopping? Is there trouble? Not for us, he replied. What do you mean? Casper questioned. Curious, Rachel, along with Casper, walked to the front as the RV stopped. When she arrived, Riggs had opened the door. I have to see this, Barry said and stepped out. Rachel followed. The front doors didn't have steps and it was a slight drop. She waited for Casper, but as soon as he emerged, she saw that Riggs and Barry had walked to the driver's side of the RV. Just as she joined them, a jet flew over. What the hell? She shielded her eyes and looked up. When she lowered her head, she saw what drew Riggs and Barry's attention. The city of Pittsburgh, skyline in the distance. Thick plumes of smoke billowed into the sky, and as the jet flew over, it fired a missile, causing an explosion. Jesus! Rachel gasped, then turned her head to a click sound. Casper lowered his phone. Are you... are you taking a picture? Rachel asked. Yeah, it's historic. That Liz lady told us to document everything. Casper, Riggs said. I'm pretty sure she didn't mean pictures. 
Barry tilted his head. I don't see why not. You don't get more documented than that. Thank you, big boss man, Casper said. They stood only for a few more moments watching until they heard yelling from the RV. It was James, his voice loud and emotional. No, 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 no! James, Rachel cried. Stop! I did this! The side door to the RV opened and James flew out. He raced to the side of the road, hands on his knees, half bent over. What's going on? Riggs asked. I did this. It's my fault. I couldn't protect my own. Rachel immediately flew inside the RV. Steph held the baby and stood there with Sandy. What happened? Rachel asked. She looked at a concerned Sandy and a crying Steph. Sandy pursed her lips before answering. I didn't see it at first. Not until I was examining Steph. The baby... The baby's been scratched. I cleaned it, Sandy explained as they sat in the main area of the moving RV. I gave her a dose of antiviral according to her weight. We don't know, Charles said. Not for sure that a scratch carries the virus. His hands were pressed tight to the sides of his face as his elbows rested on the table. James was distraught. We have seen a scratch turn people. What about amputating? Charles asked. James, Steph, and Sandy seemed shocked at the question. What? Sandy asked. It's the hand, Charles said. You have an hour to amputate. It's not been an hour. That scratch is small. Steph stuttered through emotional words. We, we don't know for sure it was an infected that scratched her. You want to take that chance? Charles asked. James sighed out. It was the infected, Steph. She was in my grip. They were reaching for us. I felt her hands. Then take it off, Charles said. Sandy, I'm not kidding. You have the tools. Cut off the hand. Hell, I'd cut it off from the elbow. What is wrong with you? Steph asked. You want to just cut my child's arm off? What's the alternative? Rachel asked. If it's a scratch from the dead, the antiviral will not work alone. We don't know that, said Sandy. Maybe on a child it reacts differently. Seriously, Charles blasted. What the hell? It's just a hand. Just a hand? Steph asked with disbelief. Just a hand, Charles stated. If I would have known what a bite would do when my daughter was bit, hell, I would have chopped off her leg myself instead of watching the fever ravage her, then turn her. It may be too late already, but why take that chance? Amputate the hand. Do it. Try like hell to save your child. I have to agree, said Rachel. I'm not a doctor. Sandy is. It's your call. I can only tell you what I would have done. I'll do whatever you say, Sandy told them. James! Steph looked to her husband. Slowly, James ran his hands down his face. Can you do it, doctor? I have been given the tools, Sandy replied. I have everything that is needed. I have never performed an amputation, but I have assisted on three. All infants. James nodded to his wife. Steph turned to Sandy. Let's do it. They had to stop again. Sandy didn't want to do the amputation in a moving vehicle. They parked smack in the middle of Interstate 79 on a barren section. While she performed the surgery, with Charles volunteering to assist, Riggs took a roof position on top of the RV to keep watch. Casper knew Riggs debated on calling command again and opted against it. It was only an hour or so and they'd be able to get moving. Sandy was confident. The child was healthy and children were resilient. Barry stood at the front of the RV, his back against the front grille, rifle in his hands, staring out to the highway ahead. They really were less than an hour out from their destination. You good? Casper asked. Need anything? No. No, I'm fine, Barry answered. How are the parents? And the mom's inside, waiting. The bigger tot is napping, and the dad... Not so good. Yeah, well, I can't blame him. I would be kicking myself as well. Hell, I do kick myself. I wasn't fast enough to help Anne. I couldn't help my son. I can't... I can't pretend to know what you guys... All of you guys are feeling and going through, Casper said. All I can say is... He paused. Barry waited. Casper said nothing. Casper, finish. All you can say is... What? I totally lost my train of thought, Casper said. Barry grunted. Go check on the others. And no yelling. Be quiet. 
We don't want any disturbances for Sandy. I'm quiet as a mouse. Let me know if you need anything. Casper wanted to go back in the RV, but he didn't want to open the doors or shut them. Like Barry had said, they had to be quiet. Sandy needed to focus. Outside of the RV, Rachel stood by the side door. She wasn't keeping watch like Barry or Riggs. She was watching James. James sat on the concrete of the highway, legs bent up, arms resting on them as he held a burning cigarette. He seemed to stare at the smoke. Hearing anything? Casper asked her. Huh? You're standing by the door. I thought it was to listen. No, I'm just standing here. Part of me feels like I should talk to him. She nodded a point at James. About everything that's happening. You gonna let him know it's gonna be okay? I can't do that. No one knows if things will be okay. We can only hope, and... Rachel took a step forward. Maybe that's what he needs to know. What, that we can only hope? Yes. It's kind of lame. Rachel shook her head with a sharp exhale and walked over to James. Hey. Hey. You... You have another? Rachel pointed to his cigarette. He lifted a pack and a lighter from the ground next to him and handed them to her. After lighting the cigarette, she handed him back the items and sat down on the ground. How are you? Kicking myself. I know that. If something happens to her, you can't think that way, Rachel told him. Trust me, you can't. I'm not so self-absorbed that I don't recognize all of you have been right where I am, but I just... Do any of you blame yourselves? James, we all blame ourselves. What you're feeling is natural, and I can't say whether it goes away or not. I just... I'm still dealing. I just found a way to work through it. By killing the things that... that... killed my family, yes. I had her, James said. I had her in my arms as best as I could. I swore I covered her. Why didn't they just get me? I don't have an answer. Rachel took a hit of the cigarette. My son died of the virus. Barry's son died trying to help my son. Like you, I had my daughter, too. Sammy was twelve. I had her in my arms, embracing her, protecting her when those things reached in and grabbed her legs and pulled her down and out of my arms. I can still see her face when they got her. My husband. I want to say he tried to save her, but I truly believe with everything I am that Cliff just didn't want her to die alone. So he sacrificed himself. God, that's horrible. Yeah. So, if this was your baby, would you have done the same thing? James asked. Absolutely. And if it doesn't work? I pray it does, but if it doesn't, what do I do? I mean, what would you have done if your daughter turned? Or did she? I don't know. She was with Cliff. But if I had a baby as young as yours and she had the infection... I would make her as comfortable as possible until she passed, and then when she turned, I would do nothing until I was ready to let go. That's just me. James glanced up at her, then his eyes shifted. Rachel turned around. Sandy stepped from the RV. He stood up first, then Rachel followed. Well? James asked. I think... I think she handled the operation well, Sandy replied. She's resting. Her vitals are good. I have another dose of the antiviral along with antibiotics for infection, so it's just a matter of waiting. We have company, Riggs called from the roof. Rachel heard the engines and then looked. Pulling up behind the RV was a military Humvee. Out of it stepped two soldiers, both men in similar uniforms to the Eliminators, only their patch had an R. Rachel figured for retrieval team. You guys are Eliminators, the soldier said. Are you the team headed to Franklin? We are. Rachel answered. We're looking for Sergeant Riggs. Riggs climbed down the exterior RV ladder. I'm Riggs. You maybe have saved us a trip to Franklin. Are your survivors here? They are, answered Riggs. This is our doctor, he indicated to Sandy. She just performed surgery on the baby. How bad is the child? The soldier asked. She's stable. She was scratched and we amputated. If you can wait another hour, she can be moved. Can I ask how far you're taking her? Sandy questioned. A hundred miles east of Youngstown. We have a good medical unit there. Then I'll set up everything for transport. Thank you, doctor. Well, the soldier exhaled, we'll hang out with you guys and wait. No rush. The two temporary newcomers made themselves at home. 
They were nowhere near as agitated as Rachel expected them to be, especially after the chastising Riggs received on the field phone. They stayed a little over an hour, and Sandy made sure everything was in order to transport the baby. When the child was placed in the back of the Humvee with her mother, the baby was awake and smiled. Rachel loved that. They said goodbye to the family they barely got to know. She supposed that would happen a lot. She wished them well and truly believed everything would work out with the baby. She would go on to lead a healthy life in a screwed-up world. Sadly, Rachel and the other Eliminators would probably never know what became of the family or the baby. They could only hope for the best. Chapter 9. Smiling Faces Franklin, Pennsylvania Driving through the residential section of town, they saw the markings of the sweep team. Three horizontal red lines were left on buildings. The back of the letter E would be finished by the eliminators when they checked the building. The markings were to signify it was suspected that there were dead in there. While Riggs had never seen a sweep team in action, he was told how they operated, making as much noise as possible, drawing out as many as they could. Bullet holes marked many of the homes. Doors were open and windows busted. The streets were painted with smeared blood, and a stench filled the town so bad it seeped into the RV. Their instructions were to drive to Liberty Street and to a Knights of Columbus hall located just after the residential area and before the strip of restaurants. That was the designated information center. The parking lot was large, and Riggs stepped out first, looking and not seeing any dead. Charles followed him. The door to the club was closed, and Riggs opened it. He whistled once, waited, then banged on the archway to draw any out. None came. Hey, Charles said and pointed to the interior of the door. Is that it? A clipboard hung there, and Riggs lifted it. Stepping into the sun to see what it said, he lifted a few pages. Yep, every street, number of dead they took down, number of survivors. There were survivors? Oh, yeah. Population 6,472 survivors, 3,900 dead removed, 1,600 unaccounted for. Think they're in this town? I doubt it. Some, probably. A lot of people may have left. That's a lot unaccounted for. They told us about this, Riggs said. We walked the town. It will take up to three weeks. The original Eliminator team never really took out more than a couple hundred, even in towns where thousands were unaccounted for. You know how you want to do this? Charles asked. Under the paper on the clipboard, Riggs pulled out a folded map. They have it marked in sectors. First order of business is to find a safe place to set up camp, a house in fair condition. We may find it in this area. Riggs pointed to the map. It's just at the end of the strip of businesses. You and I can take that. Park the RV in the middle of Liberty. Have Casper, Rachel, and Barry sweep those stores. Will Sandy be all right? She'll be fine if the RV is in view of them. Riggs took the clipboard and started walking back to the RV. Might as well get started. Charles nodded. It's quiet. Almost too quiet. Eerie, you know. Tell me about it, but... Riggs sighed. We're here now. That silence will end shortly. The song American Pie blasted from the exterior speakers on the RV, and Casper, Barry, and Rachel just waited, taking a three-point position on the street. If there were any infected in the stores, they would come out. At least, that was what they were taught in training. Sure enough, two wandered out, one out of the pizza place and the other from between two buildings. Both did the same thing. They looked toward the music, and when they saw the three of them, they ran top speed their way. He said it for you, Barry, Casper said. Barry held a baseball bat. He wound it up and prepared to swing. He was Babe Ruth of the zombie apocalypse and clocked that stiff hard, causing blood to spray out and splatter on his face shield. The other ran right by Rachel, who was standing point and directly to Casper. What? she said. Am I invisible? Casper nailed it, one shot with the honing rod. The stiff weakened, but he didn't fall down. It hadn't impaled him deep enough. Bracing the rod, Casper pulled while using his foot to push the dead away. It fell to the ground, and Casper quickly finished the job. Sandy's voice came over the speaker with the music. Should I stop the song? Nah, Barry said. I like it. Let it play. Oh, God help us, Sandy complained. You good? Rachel asked Casper. Yeah, 
I am. Barry, you have this while we go inside? Casper asked. Yes, but listen if I call. Casper did a half-assed salute and headed into the first business. Perhaps they could have started at the beginning of the block, but Rachel expressed how she wanted to go in there. He didn't blame her. He was curious about how the sweep teams handled the shops and businesses. They approached Dee's hub, a little bar and grill. The windows were shattered. Bullets had riddled the exterior, clipping the bricks, and the door was propped open. The sweep team's red lines had a number on top, indicating 22 dead were retrieved from that bar. Casper banged on the doorway. Hello? Nothing. It's clear, Rachel said as she stepped inside and immediately covered her mouth. They had taken the bodies, but there were body parts, innards rotted on the floor. The flies buzzed about trying to get something out of them. Huge puddles of dried blood were everywhere. The bar, the floors, stools. All it took was one, Rachel said. One person probably infected everyone in this bar. That's what it looks like. I'll check the back. Rachel nodded and walked behind the bar. Hey, there are several unopened bottles here. Any spiced rum? Casper called out as he walked to the back. Sandy likes that. Yeah, I'll grab it. She examined the bottles, lifting them to the bar. Don't let it go to waste, she said softly, then raised her voice. Sweep team didn't take everything. She grabbed a bottle of vodka, then quickly lifted her head when she heard the thump. Did you get one? Yeah, the cook. He was in the freezer. Looks like he got bit. Unbelievable. Why didn't he just leave? They don't turn right away. She uncapped a bottle, then lifted two glasses, blowing into them, clearing any dust. Kitchen's clear, Casper returned. I checked all closets. Basement? Shit. Casper stepped away, paused, returned for his drink, downed it, and walked away. Thank you, Rachel yelled. She stated many times to the group and at training she wasn't going into any basements. Every scary movie she had ever seen involved a basement of some sort. She didn't down her drink. She lifted it, bringing it to her mouth, and walked from behind the bar. Rachel was never a bar person. She and Cliff would go out to dinner and have cocktails. Even when she was younger, she didn't go to bars. Just looking around made her sad. Old photos graced the walls, and Rachel walked around looking at them. It was a family establishment. At one point, it looked like an Italian restaurant. The pictures on the walls showed checkered tablecloths and an elderly couple smiling and holding a bowl of pasta. It was truly sad. All the hopes and dreams of those in the pictures, even those of the current owner, were dashed and crushed in an instant. All life was. Life would never be the same. All Rachel and the other Eliminators could do was try their hardest to make it safe again. Done, Casper returned. Ready to move on? Yeah, let's grab the bottles on the bar. Rachel backed up and stopped. She reached for the photo of the elderly couple with the pasta and lifted it from the wall. What's that about? I don't know. I like it. It was someone's family, and they hung this on the wall to be remembered. So let's remember them. Wow, that's deep. You aren't usually like that. Don't get used to it. They walked to the bar. Rachel finished her drink, leaving the glass there as she grabbed a couple of the bottles. Casper grabbed the rest, and they walked to the door. Cool, the song stopped. Oh, thank God. He set the bottles down on the ground and reached for the spray paint can he had in a holster on his belt. As he lifted it, the song started again. Dudes, why? He whined. Let's move on. Mark it clear. Casper would do that. He'd mark the building checked and cleared, and he would do it by transforming the sweep team mark into the letter E. Chapter 10. Hesitation. The house would work great. It wasn't destroyed, shot up, or bloodstained. It was checked by the sweep team with no bodies taken. Riggs and Charles double-checked the property. A home on a corner lot, not many windows. It would suffice as a safe place to camp. Riggs radioed the RV, informing them to bring the vehicle and items into the house. He marked the home with an E. Then he and Charles moved to the next street. How many times do you think they'll play this song? Charles asked of the music that carried to them. I think they don't even notice it now. I lived in an area much like this, Charles said. Yeah, me too. Little suburb neighborhood. What did you do before all this? Riggs asked. A painter. A painter? Like 
Artist or house? Charles chuckled. House. Why, does that surprise you? Yeah, your skill level is awesome. Charles shrugged. I don't know about that. I kind of just learned it to survive and beat the hell out of these things with my anger. Like Rachel, Riggs said. When it happened, I mean to us, my family, we were trying to get to a refugee center in Reading. We were on the highway, stuck in traffic, a lot like James and his family. It was late. There were a lot of people. We were camping out on the road, and they just happened upon us. I'm sorry. Me too. I thought I had my family protected. Got my wife and three kids in the car, but the damn things opened doors. Which surprises me they didn't get Lola today, but... Takes them a bit before they realize they can open them. My son didn't have his door locked. They grabbed him and just... Charles sighed out. Two of them grabbed him. He was thirteen. Dragged him, tearing him apart in seconds. I tried, you know, but they were in the car so fast. Too fast. I was pulling on them, hitting them. My wife, bravest fucking woman I know, climbed in the back to protect our kids. I can still hear her calling for me. I was able to get my youngest daughter out. It was too late for my wife and other son. I ran with my girl. Ran. Help came, but she was bit. The rest, well, she got sick and they stopped her from turning. Man. Riggs shook his head. Again, I'm so sorry you had to see that. We all have seen shit. How long into the sickness was this? A week. So it really did happen that fast? Riggs asked. Oh, yeah. Weren't you reading up on it? No, I heard something about it overseas and didn't think much about it. By the time I paid attention, it was here, and I was in Nassau. You made it back. That's awesome. That's how we ended up in Pittsburgh. All of us are from all over. What was it like? What? When the sickness hit. Oh my god, it was chaos. That's the best way I can describe it. Pure chaos. You stayed with people you knew, and even then it didn't mean they wouldn't get sick. How about you? Me? Well... In this, I lost my best friend, Barry's son. He was like my brother. But my wife, kids, they died before all this. Carbon monoxide poisoning. It crushed me losing them, but now I'm glad they went peacefully. I can see why. Charles stopped walking. Okay, Elk Street, post office or the house? Let's do the house. Post office mark shows 13. We'll go in as a team. This is a duplex, Charles said. Two markings. One body, between both six survivors. Not bad. Let's check out the right side first. They walked up the two steps to the shared porch. One of those big wheel style bikes sat there. Like many other places, the door was open. Riggs couldn't stop looking at the bike. Children had lived there. At least they wouldn't see the bodies, and that was a good thing. They called out several times and waited. No dead came running, and it was safe to go in. The home was clean and free of blood. It was tidy, the pillows placed in position on the couch, knick-knacks on a mantle, and he saw a tablecloth on the dining room table. Maybe it was the other side with the body, Charles stated, walking slightly ahead of Riggs through the living room. We still have to go upstairs. I wonder if they left the home with the sweep team. There's no pictures. That's a good sign. That really does mean survivors. In the corner of the living room by the window was a toy box, Connected to the television was a video game unit. A family definitely lived here. This is strange. Did you ever see this? Charles asked. Riggs pulled his attention away from the toys, turned, and looked. Charles stood in the archway between the dining room and living room. What is it? He walked toward Charles. A smoke detector with a huge strobe light. Hmm? Riggs started to shake his head and stopped. His eyes widened. Shit! Someone in this house was deaf. What? Charles looked at Riggs. No sooner did Riggs say that, he saw the child. The child, about eight, clearly was infected and had risen. The child didn't move. He stood in the dining room, staring. Charles, watch out. Not only did Riggs raise his pistol, he reached for his crowbar, but hesitated. Could he really bludgeon a child, dead or not? For the sake of the child and his parents... It was up to Riggs, no matter how difficult, to end the child's suffering. He aimed. No, wait. Don't shoot him. What do we do, capture it? Both men stared at the child. He's not coming for us. Maybe... 
Maybe kids are different. I've never seen one turn. Me either. Slowly and cautiously, Charles withdrew his own pistol. What if... What if we try to get him and end it for him? Not so violently. It's a kid. I know. The child only looked, head tilted. Then he spun and ran off into the kitchen. Wow. Did that just happen? Charles asked, lowering his weapon. It must hit kids differently. The fast thumping told Riggs instantly it wasn't the case, but it registered to him too late. It was a fast-moving blur he caught through the corner of his eye. Riggs spun, aimed his weapon, and in that split second, that ever-so-slight moment of hesitation when he realized it was another child, it was too late. The infected kid whooshed by him through the living room and leapt for Charles. He immediately went for Charles's shin, clutching onto him. Charles's head went back and his face scrunched up, and he released an open-mouthed, silent scream of pain. Riggs reached for his crowbar at the same time Charles reached for his. Riggs swore that moment was the first time he had ever blacked out. It wasn't long. Perhaps the sight was too disturbing to see or remember. Thirty seconds, maybe, were gone. When Riggs emerged from his blackout, the infected child was put down. Two crowbars lay on the floor, and Charles bled profusely from the calf of his left leg. He hurried over to the table, pulling the tablecloth as he lifted his radio. E-team, come in. Man down. Need assistance. Where are you? Barry asked. Directly one block behind the safe house. Riggs used his knife to cut the tablecloth, then rip it. On Elk, next to post office. We'll be there in ten seconds. I see the post office. We should have done the post office first. Charles tried to make light. Riggs wrapped his leg with the cloth to stop the bleeding, then looked at his watch to check the time of injury. I'm sorry. For what? I hesitated. We both did. I'm the leader of this team. I should not have hesitated. His head cocked at the sound of the vehicle. They're here. Riggs braced under Charles' arm and helped him to stand. We need to get you to the RV. Charles didn't walk. It was a kid, Riggs. A kid. It doesn't matter. Yeah, he was infected. He was a kid. You're right. Riggs led him toward the door. I still hesitated. Yeah, well... Only a heartless idiot wouldn't hesitate to take down a kid. Outside, Casper's loud voice carried to them. Holy shit, Rach! I didn't even see him coming! He almost got Barry! You got him, though, Rachel said. Yeah, little fucker's fast! Riggs cringed as he opened the door. What were you saying about heartless idiots? Charles shook his head, and limping, he and Riggs walked out. He was glad that the team arrived fast. Time was of the essence when it came to helping Charles, and at that moment, saving him was most important. Chapter 11 First Day Sandy moved fast. A radio call for a man down could only mean one thing. Someone was bit. When she saw the makeshift bandage on Charles's leg, she immediately grabbed a syringe of the antiviral medication. She had to get it into his bloodstream fast, then make even faster preparations for the amputation. She raced to them the second they emerged onto the porch. How much pain? she asked Charles. I haven't had worse, he said. She spun around. Casper, Rachel, two blocks over we saw one of those urgent cares. I need you to run down there. Make sure it's clear and get ready for us. Got it, Casper replied. Riggs, help me get him inside. We'll drive down there. I'll also need you to contact command for a medical team, but first... Sandy lifted the syringe. I don't want to waste any time. Stop, Charles told her. Please. What? Everyone, just stop. Casper, Rachel, don't go anywhere. Charles looked at Riggs. Can you help me into the RV? Yeah, yeah. Riggs faced Sandy. Another minute won't matter, will it? Every minute counts. It's okay. Charles said. Riggs? Sure. Sandy was baffled. Riggs assisted Charles to the RV and inside. Then Sandy followed. Charles was seated on the bench seat when Sandy entered. Barry, Casper, and Rachel had stepped in before her. A part of her knew what was going on. Dude, Casper said. We have to get to the clinic. We can't chance this thing getting ahead of you. Charles shook his head. Um, Rachel... Can I have some of your stash? 
The whiskey, please. Rachel looked at Sandy with slight trepidation. Um, sure. No, Sandy said. You have surgery. No, I'm not. Rachel, please. Sure. Rachel, no. Sandy held up her hand and Rachel stopped. What do you mean you're not? I don't want the amputation, but I do want that drink. I'll get it, Rachel said. No, you won't. Sandy halted her again. What do you mean you don't want the amputation? I don't, but I really want that drink. He lifted his eyes to Rachel. Please. How about I bring the bottle? Rachel asked. How about you don't? Sandy said. Yes, Charles said. No, argued Sandy. Rach, Riggs said. Get it. Jeremiah? Barry asked. Why are you going against Sandy? She's the doctor. Because I know what's happening here, said Riggs. Okay, stop. Rachel held up her hand. No more back and forth. I'm getting the bottle. She walked away to the small hallway that led to the back. Charles, Sandy spoke gently. If I do not amputate, you will die. Charles smiled gently, then glanced up to Rachel, who returned with the bottle. She poured him some in a glass and handed it to him. Sandy, that's the point. Charles downed the drink and handed it back to Rachel. Another, please. I don't understand. Sandy shook her head. You can live with an amputation. This bite. Charles winked, then took the refreshed glass. Is a gift. I haven't wanted to live since the day I lost my family. He downed the drink. Refill? Absolutely, Rachel poured. We raided the bar. Thank you, Charles said. I wanted to die. I just didn't have the courage to take my own life. That's why I went after these things. It's not bravery. It was my death wish, and bingo. Thank God it's here. You guys... He sipped instead of downing all at once. You guys are a hell of a team. You're going to do so good with this. Listen. Sandy grabbed his hand. I have to try everything. I can't, as a doctor, let you die. I understand, Charles said. But as a human being, you should. Do you know how sick you will get? How fevered and painful this will be? Ask Barry. His son suffered. Well, I'm kind of hoping the doctor and you will help me out with that, Charles said. I can take the gun. I will take the gun if need be, but that's so messy for you guys. I... I... Sandy stood. I don't know. Confused, she looked at each of her team members. Barry? I know as a doctor he said. It's your duty and obligation to heal. Sometimes healing is a little more than just the flesh. Dude is wise, Casper said. Riggs? Riggs looked at Charles. Is this what you really want? Is it what you wanted? Charles asked rhetorically. I get the not having the courage to take your life, Riggs said. I was there. I was self-destructive other ways. He quickly turned to Rachel when he heard her, hmm... What, Rach, what is it? Sorry, just thinking about your nympho stories you told me. Now is really not the time, argued Riggs. Yes, Charles said. It is the time. This bantering is what makes you guys... you. You probably will be the best eliminator team out there. Sorry I'll miss it. But I will miss it one way or another. Sandy. Sandy exhaled. I need a moment... Apparently, me taking the time to think about it doesn't really matter now. She excused herself from the room and went back to her medical area. More than anything, she wanted to save Charles. She had the means to save him, whether it was freeing him from the virus or freeing him from a world he no longer wanted to live in. They didn't know. They just didn't know. There wasn't enough information passed on to them to know if Charles would rise after he passed away. After all, it wasn't the virus or bite that did him in. It was a nice cocktail of medication that Sandy mixed. They took him to the safe house and tucked him comfortably in a bed. The window was open, allowing a cool breeze inside. He said his goodbyes, took requests for the other side, then closed his eyes and left the world peacefully. Rachel and Casper stayed in the room with him. They stayed long after he died, well after dinner, and far beyond the time Sandy went to sleep. The open window helped with the slight ammonia smell that started to fill the room. 
The house was quiet. They hadn't seen or heard any dead. How long, if at all, would it take? Did the virus make its way into Charles enough to revive him? Go, Casper said. I'll stay. I'll wait. Rach, you've been in this room for eight hours. I'll stay. Come and relieve me in a few. Yeah, I need a break. What if I go for an hour and come back? I'm fine, Casper told her. Go. Okay, yell if you need me. Rachel took one step away. Rach? She stopped and looked back. Charles had opened his eyes. Fuck, Rachel said. I was hoping for his sake that wasn't going to happen. I got this. Casper placed one hand on Charles's chest to hold him down. I'm sorry, buddy. He reached for his honing rod. There was a fire pit in the backyard of the safe house. Down a slightly grassy grade, the pit was settled into the ground and the flames were minimal. Rachel saw only the orange glow. Riggs sat by the fire on one of the three benches near the pit. She carried a bottle and glasses while making her way to him. They had the good stuff in there. She stepped over the bench to sit down. I know. She cast her gaze to his feet where a bottle set. I see you found it. I did. I thought you might need one. She set her own bottle down. Riggs blew slightly through his parted lips. I do. I did. I will. Barry will take watch. Then I'll have Casper. I can take watch. Thanks. How is he? Riggs asked. He's... he's gone. Again. He came back? Rachel nodded. So we know. Casper was quick. He was back in a minute. I did this, you know. How? Rachel asked. I hesitated. The kid didn't bite him at first. I hesitated. It was a kid. So you say and Charles said. He lifted his bottle. But Casper didn't hesitate. Casper never had a child. Different mindset. And this is not your fault. Not at all. And if you need to look at it some way, look at it as something Charles wanted. Did he really? Riggs asked. Because he fought them awfully hard for someone who wanted to die. Yeah, it's like drunk driving. You can do it without a problem, but one day it will catch up to you. Wow. So are you saying it'll catch up to us? I don't know. I do know this. Every time something goes wrong, we can't kick ourselves. We're going to have days like this. Rach, this was day one, Riggs said. Day one of being official eliminators. We lost one of our own. It was a sucky day one. Charles would disagree. We saved an entire family, ish. What does that mean? We don't know about the baby. We can hope. We don't know. Riggs stared down to his drink. Charles was right about something, Rachel said. We are going to be a good team. We will do what we need to do. No matter how long it takes, we'll get this world back. She lifted her bottle. He lifted his, clinking it against hers. Rachel saw it in his face. It was a hard day for all of them, but more so for Riggs. He carried an extra burden, a burden she believed one day would lift from him. They all would have those days, fighting dead that would be emotionally hard to put down, losing people who should have survived. It couldn't be helped. They put themselves out there as eliminators. It was who they were, what they did, and what they had to face for a long time coming. They would try their best, and God willing, they would never lose another team member. Chapter 12 Looking Back Nine Months Later March 8th, Day 325 They had been on the road only fifteen minutes. The song Chihuahua Love repeated only twice, and then Barry moved on to the next track. Listening to the defunct 90s band made Rachel think of Casper even more. She understood why Barry did that. A song that usually made the team laugh and sing along now made everyone depressed. They were taking off for out west, to be unofficial eliminators. Against the wishes of Liz, the government pulled the plug on the western portion of the initiative, focusing only east of the Mississippi. Work needed to be done. There were still towns to clear, survivors to help, and they had rescued a little girl named Penny from a warehouse operation. 
Penny was not immune, like most survivors that lived out west. Everyone talked about keeping the little girl with them. Rachel hadn't said it yet, but she didn't want to get attached to a child. She hoped to find her a family. That's what Liz said to do. There was a camp on the Kentucky-Tennessee border. Casper even said her name was a sign of bad things to come, making reference to the television show and an antagonist that kept his zombie daughter like a pet. Her name was Penny. Casper. Rachel sat on the bench seat with the table, her hand on her coffee cup, head against the windows, eyes closed. She was exhausted and hadn't slept well for two weeks. Every time she closed her eyes, she saw the heroic move that cost Casper his life. Diving from that platform, impaled by a spear. It didn't kill him. In fact, by some miracle it missed anything vital, but the spear was covered with infected blood. Casper laughed as he lay in the hospital bed. Dude, I'm serious. I saw Jack's face. I swear. He paused laughing and cringed. You okay? Rachel asked. Your injury hurt? No, my head. It's pounding all of a sudden. Hold on, I'll get the doctor. Rachel lay her hand on his arm. When she did, she felt how hot he was. Casper, you're burning up. And there... The doctor's voice entered the room. There is a reason for it. Son, he walked closer to the bed. You're infected. Rachel's heart sank right there and then. Casper had kept his spirits up, fighting it tooth and nail, swearing he would be different, and signing the forms to turn his zombified body over to science. For the two-week period before they headed back on the road, she went and visited him. He was gentle, never went for her or Riggs, never tried to bite them. Before they left, Rachel made one more visit. Her excuse was to bring a game console over for Casper, but the truth was she needed to see him once more. It took everything she had to go back on the road. Without Casper, being an Eliminator wouldn't mean the same thing. Dr. Stevens allowed for Rachel and Riggs to go into the lab room without him. After all, Casper was restrained. The restraints rattled and Casper perked up when Rachel and Riggs stepped into the room before heading out. Say hi, Rachel told Riggs. Hi, buddy. Hey, Casp. Look what I brought you. Rachel showed him the game console. Dr. Stevens said he's going to hook it up for you. Casper just stared. Rachel set it down. We're leaving, Casper. It's not going to be the same without you, so I'm going to miss you and your jokes. Riggs just isn't going to cut it. You know, he's dull. Thanks, Riggs mumbled. Anyhow, Casper, I'll be back and I'll check in on you. Maybe even find a way to call. Riggs placed his hand on her back. Time to leave. Rachel nodded. We have to go. They're waiting. I'll tell you all about it when I come back. I miss you, Casper, and I love you. I'd give you a big hug, but, you know, I just can't. Enjoy the game. Casper tilted his head. Rachel sighed out. He's looking at me like he knows, like he's trying to make me feel guilty. No. Riggs told her and turned her. Let's go. Casper's gone, Rach. He's not in there. He doesn't know, okay? Rachel took a step. It was soft, low, and deep, a groan that sounded like, Ray. Rachel and Riggs both stopped and looked back at Casper the same way at the same time. Then they looked at each other. No. Riggs shook his head. No, Rachel said with a laugh. Weird, we both thought that. Another step. Chill. They both froze. Casper repeated. Rachel cringed. Don't, 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 don't. Chill! Fuck! Dr. Stevens flew into the room. Did he... did he just speak? Almost scared to reply, Rachel nodded. This is... this is unbelievable! Dr. Stevens smiled. It's not possible, Rachel said. I hoped. I didn't think it would be, Stevens said. But here we are. I didn't want to say anything. We have been giving him this injection that keeps the brain, for lack of a better word, sparking. We gave it to him before he passed and daily since. It also keeps the heart pumping at eight beats a minute, respiration at six to prevent decomposition, hence why he looks so good. 
Rachel. Oh my God, Rachel said. He knows. We don't know how much he knows or retains. It could be some automatic response from memory retention, Stephen said. We need to work with him more, test more obviously. What we're doing takes time to progress. Rachel finally looked at him again. Oh, Casper, I hope you're in there. No, Rach, Riggs said. No, don't buy this. You heard him talk, Rachel argued. I did, I did, but it doesn't mean Casper is in there. Rach, he died. Technically, Stephen sang the word. He didn't. Not quite. Stop. Just stop. Don't do this to her. Don't. He's like a parrot. He heard me say her name, Riggs said. He's not in there, Rach. Casper is not in there. Watch. Riggs stepped to Casper. Casp, if you understand me, if you know what I'm saying, say something Casper-like that I would never say. Dude. Rachel's hand shot to her mouth. Her eyes widened, and she looked at Riggs. I... I... Riggs stuttered. Stand corrected. They hightailed it out of the hospital, power walking back to the RV. After making a promise to Stevens, they'd say nothing to anyone. Not yet. No matter what, Rachel kept replaying that moment in her mind. Rachel. The look in his eyes. Maybe it was her imagination. Rachel saw soul in them. Rachel. Rach. Riggs' voice called to her. She sprung up. Sorry. Were you sleeping already? Riggs asked. Your Starbucks is still warm. No, I'm awake. I was thinking. What's up? You have a minute? Rachel sat all the way up, looking out the window. Why did we stop? That's what I want to talk to you about. He gave her a twitch of his head, and Rachel took it as a sign to go outside with him. She grabbed her cup and followed outside. Does everyone else know why we stopped? No, Riggs replied. I wanted to talk to you first. Why? Well, you're like my co-captain. You never said that before. That's really nice of you. She sipped her beverage. I thought it was a given. Anyhow, depending on what you say, we might turn around and go back. To Center City? Yes. Rachel perked with excitement. Are we going back for Casper? What? No, why would we do that? Because he is... not a normal stiff. No, just no. Riggs shook his head. Sandy and Barry know I took a call from Liz. They don't know what for, and they really didn't ask. I'm not surprised. The president is dead. Excuse me? He's dead? When? Like, now? No. I think sometime between the authorization of supplies and instructions from Liz, until they called. Oh my god, that's horrible. Was he bit? Did he have the virus? No. It was like normal dead. Normal dead? Riggs waved out his hand. Anyhow, Liz, who was second in command, is now president. We just gave that woman more power? I thought you liked her, Riggs asked. I do, just saying. So she's president, and her first order of business is to reinstate the westward movement of the Eliminators? Bingo. That's awesome. Why are we going back? She wants to meet with us right away, get official orders, and since we're only 20 miles out, we can do that. If you want. Or we can go take Penny somewhere first. Liz knows Penny isn't immune. She won't let us bring her back in the city. She will if we agree to let Dr. Stevens have her. Ah. Liz backed up. Hence why you needed to talk to me. She bit her lip and took a moment to think. So we can't keep her if we're eliminators. Now at this moment, our choices are to take her to a survivor city and leave her with strangers, or let Dr. Stevens take care of her. Liz said that he wouldn't harm her. Oh, I believe that. The man is gentle with zombies. He's not going to harm a child, especially since he had four grandchildren of his own. How do you know this? We talked, said Rachel. Maybe he can help her. Besides, Casper is there. He won't let anything happen to her. Rach, Casper is... He's not... <sighs> Never mind. So we go back? Yes, I'll grab another Starbucks. She headed back to the RV. Maybe even see... No. Riggs shook his head. No more seeing Casper. Oh, hey, I wrote in the logbook. Really? Riggs nodded. That's impressive. We've only doodled in it for a year. Maybe that can be your job as co-captain. 
Um, that would be a no. Let's tell the others and go back. She downed the rest of her latte and boarded the RV. Chapter 13. Orders. Center City, West Virginia. There was a certain amount of guilt Riggs felt in dropping off Penny with Dr. Stevens. The scientist was thrilled, even fatherly with her, telling her she would stay with him and his wife and go to work with him. I'll adore her, Stevens said. I will not poke and prod her, I promise. Riggs felt better knowing Penny was all right, even if he denied her one request for the flaming saffron CD. He told Rachel that was a no. A part of him was sentimental about that. Let's ask Casper and see what he... No! Riggs cut off Rachel's request before she finished. She had to stop seeing Casper. He knew they had been close, best friends and inseparable. But the Casper she knew was gone. There was no bringing him back, not to the way he had been, and definitely not as an eliminator. Liz wanted everyone to come into her office, the remaining four of them. They left the RV where she instructed a team to stock it with the standard supplies, especially since it was allowed and she wasn't doing it on the side. Riggs didn't know how to describe Rachel's reaction when she walked in. She had a giddy nature about her, smiling ear to ear. "'Congratulations, Madam President!' Rachel shook her head and then embraced her. "'I know, right?' Liz said. "'His apocalypse cabinet told me and I was... stunned.' She placed her hand on her chest." honored. So cool for you, but... Rachel cleared her throat, speaking somberly. So sad about the former president. Yes, Liz nodded sadly. Very. So, Rachel perked up. What's going on? We rushed back, and I appreciate it. Please, all of you have a seat. Liz waved out her hand before sitting behind a desk. As you know, my first order was to bring back the Eliminators. This country as a whole needs to be as one, Riggs asked. What about the immune you stuffed into camps? Riggs, Rachel said. Don't be rude. Me? Rude? Rach, you're the one that jumped down her throat about it. It wasn't my idea, Liz said. If you remember, I am in the process of putting Midwest and Western commands back in place and science and medical teams close to survivor camps, along with protection where I can get it together. We will try to get them to form a council at each camp, just in case of outbreak. As for now, I want to have my Eliminator teams that are in the vicinity make regular stops by the survivor cities. Aside from Penny, Rachel said, was there a reason to call us back? Yes, Liz replied. The Flaming Saffrons are one of my best teams. I have teams on this side of the country that I plan on sending back out there, but I need to retrack, get the sweep teams together again, clean up, you know all that. I also have to locate my other Eliminator teams that went... the... defectors. They need to know they can come in for supplies and make contact. We lost contact. Are you wanting us to help? Riggs asked. Liz nodded. I'll give you a list of places that were scheduled for E-teams. They've already been swept. We think the defectors may be working on that list. If you find them, send them back or tell them to contact us so we can reinstate them, stock them. So... We aren't cleaning towns? Riggs asked. You are. You aren't just on a search mission. If you come across a town that has been swept but hasn't been e-tagged, then do it. I would love to schedule towns for you, but again, we don't know which towns the defectors did or the ones they're headed to. Basically, Barry said, we go out as normal, look for the missing eliminators, and clean towns in between. Our supplies are usually only good for two towns, and sweep teams take anything useful. You said you're moving commands back out there? True, Liz answered. It will take weeks. It was easier to pack up and run than set up. Hopefully by the time you need to restock, you won't have to come all the way back here. We will be reestablished. However, they won't be your first order of business, Barry asked. Our first order of business? I realize you four are a team, but a team is six people. It's not safe to have any less and you know it. So you have new members here for us, Rachel asked. Possibly. We hope, but not here. Liz stood and started to pace. You guys are going on a search and retrieve. As we started the pullout from the west, we lost two teams, one at the beginning of the pullout and one when we got here. We aren't sure exactly what happened to them. Contact was spotty. One team was last heard of outside of Morrison, Tennessee, and we just heard from the lone surviving Eliminator. He's still in Morrison, and I need you guys to get him. 
He's more than willing to join the Flaming Saffrons. Where will we find him? Riggs asked. I have that info for you, Liz said. And the other team? Riggs asked. This is where it gets tricky, Liz waved a finger. Have you guys ever heard of the Eliminator Team Gold Cavalry? Barry whistled. They're the top dogs. I heard they clean towns in days, not weeks. The best, Liz said. Golden boys. Unfortunately, we lost any contact with them outside of Jonesboro, Arkansas. Through the corner of his eye, Riggs looked at Rachel. Rach, are you smiling about that? Thinking about how much Casper would enjoy hearing that, Rachel replied. They aren't so golden now, are they? Are they all dead, Liz? Rach, what the hell? Riggs snapped. Jeremiah, Barry warned. I know, language. We don't know, Liz answered. We know one is not. We picked up a signal and have finally been communicating with their navigator and communications specialist. Rachel crinkled her brow. Navigator? Riggs, do we have a navigator? Riggs pointed. That would be Barry. He drives. Rachel nodded. Oh, anyhow... Liz continued. He's given us his location for pickup. He's outside of Memphis. He made it that far. Not much else said other than identifying himself. That's weird, said Rachel. Why isn't he telling you anything? Because not many people know Morse code, and that's how he's communicating with us. So he's keeping it simple, Liz explained. His name is Aldrich Yates. I'll give you the location for him, but obviously, if you don't know Morse code, you'll have to just hope he's there. Yates. Yates. Barry said. Senator Yates of New York? His son, Liz answered. When the senator got word of my initiative, his son put together the elite team. Rachel mumbled. They aren't so elite anymore. Rach. What, Riggs? Come on, you know we always heard about them, Rachel said. I mean, how great they can be. Seriously, the Eliminators Force have only been around a year. You're being petty and maybe even jealous, Riggs told her. Look at the bright side. We're getting two new members, one an elite eliminator. As if we aren't good enough? Rachel asked. No, Riggs snapped. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying having a well-trained man on our team is a good thing. Man? Rachel asked. You're so sexist. I give up. Riggs tossed out his hands. Liz smiled. I love the banter. Just one more thing. Both of these men have been out there alone for a while. They may just want to come here. Riggs nodded. I understand. I doubt it. I mean, it gets in your blood being an Eliminator. I can't see them wanting to do anything else. Let's hope you're right, Liz said. Now, I know you were all packed up and ready to go, but Morrison is about a seven-hour journey. I suggest staying back one more day and heading out at first light. You can get both men tomorrow. It'll give you time to make contact and coordinate a pickup. Sounds good. Riggs reached out and shook her hand. Thank you, Madam President. You're welcome, and thank you. Liz shifted her eyes. Sandy, you've been quiet, not saying anything. Is everything all right? Oh, yes, sorry. I was thinking. These two men have been out there, what, weeks? You're just hearing from them, Sandy said. What in the world have they been doing with themselves all this time? Flaming Saffron's Log, March 9th, Day 326, Entry Jeremiah Riggs. After an understandable delay, we are headed back on the road. Our initial trip to leave yesterday started as an unauthorized eliminator's mission. It quickly turned official when Liz Nizinski became the new president. In a way, that's a good thing. The president's death is jarring, but Liz carries a leadership needed in this world. She leads with her head and heart. She thinks of her loss and wants to prevent it for others. She wants the world to be safe again and created the eliminator's. The typical town-to-town -town cleansing we do will be on pause while we perform a search and retrieve. Two eliminators from two different teams will be joining us. Both had lost their teams and basically have been alone and abandoned in the world. I welcome them and look forward to meeting them both. While no one ever can or will replace Casper, perhaps we can create a strong team that will play a huge part in rebuilding and bringing back this world we all know and love. A world without the risen dead. Chapter 14. Oddities. March 9th, Day 326. Morrison, Tennessee. Miles before they even arrived in Morrison, they saw the smoke. 
a thin trail of gray smoke steadily carrying to the sky, peeking through the mountains as a smoke signal. Barry spotted it first, suggesting it was some sort of calling card from the new guy they were to pick up. Rachel hated the thought of getting new team members. Before, it was easy. After Charles, no one was ever permanent. They knew the new guy would last one or two towns at most, and then something would happen. She would miss the days of speculating with Casper, scenarios based on apocalypse movies, but now Casper wasn't with them, and no one else really shared their passion over movies and books about the end of the world. Shortly after they spotted the smoke, and four miles outside of Morrison, they saw an Eliminator RV. Barry pulled over. Like theirs, the RV was more of a bus-shaped vehicle, slightly bigger and probably a few years newer. The black and tan vehicle had tinted windows. Above each window and door was what looked like a rolled-up blind, when in place it was the metal grates that would protect each window in case of attack. The vehicle at first glance looked unscathed, until they stopped their own. The side of the RV not seen from the road was completely charred with slashed tires. Barry ran his hand over the side. Bullet holes. The dead didn't do this. Maybe they did it to themselves, Riggs said. Got into a battle with stiffs. Unlikely, Barry replied. Who would do this? Rachel asked. I mean, everyone knows the Eliminators are helping, right? We're like a commercial. We take care of the dead so you don't have to. Survivors, Riggs replied. Those not immune. Those left over on this side with no means to protect themselves. Anyone and everyone knows we carry a lot of ammo. This was a nice vehicle, Rachel said. It's a shame. Why did they get such a nice one and we didn't? I think because we were one of the first teams and we got what we got, said Riggs. You saw the other early teams. Hell, Bosworth's team had a camper, and they never needed more than that. I'm glad we didn't have that camper. It was crappy. Ours is much nicer than a camper, Rachel said. Ours isn't... Ours isn't that bad, Riggs said. It is. The fridge works, the stove doesn't. We have to keep checking the water, Rachel commented. And we can't use the toilet. We can use the toilet. No, it doesn't work right, and the last time Casper used it, Rachel said. You bitched because you had to empty it. If I remember, Barry added, Casper only used it because he was sick. He ate those bad apples. They weren't bad, Riggs added. They were fine. He wasn't sick, he just ate twelve. And can we not talk about this, just find the guy? Do you really think, like, marauders got them? Rachel asked. You don't? Rachel shook her head. No. We're a couple miles from Morrison, right? If there was a band of people destroying things, why would the only surviving Eliminator stay in a town so close, let alone send up a smoke signal? She has a point, said Barry. Maybe they were really overrun. Well, there's one way to find out, Riggs said. Ask the surviving Eliminator, and if the smoke signal is him, he's not that far off. The town of Morrison wasn't. It didn't take long for them to arrive. There was no fanfare or signs when they pulled in. Morrison wasn't a quintessential-looking small town, with picturesque buildings like they had seen in many places. It was a road with houses, repair garages, several churches, and a few one-stop shop and gas places. The big sign saying they had arrived was a Dollar General just on the outskirts of the tiny town, with a pre-virus population of 700. At first, it struck Rachel as clean, almost too clean, for there to have been any battle or violent after-effects of the outbreak. She didn't see the typical blood smears on the road from sweep teams cleaning bodies and dragging them. No abandoned cars just left everywhere. All of them were neatly parked on the road, almost as if someone deliberately cleaned up the town. None of the doors were open to the homes or businesses, as they usually were, but the letter E was clearly painted on all of them, and big. M-O-O-N. That spells moon, Rachel said softly. What the hell are you talking about? Riggs asked. Jeremiah language. One of these days, Riggs said to Barry, you'll let that word go. Rach, he asked. What are you talking about? Do you see a word? No, I was just thinking of the stand. This town reminds me of a scene. Not so much the buildings, but how cleaned up it is. In the book, the one character cleaned up the town, but he was... special, and he kept spelling the word moon. Okay. You don't get it, Rachel said. Casper would have. So you don't see a word out there that you're spelling? No, she blasted. But I do. 
said Barry. E-A-R-T-H. That spells Earth. The RV slowed down and then stopped. Has everyone gone mad? Riggs asked. No, Jeremiah, Barry said. Look out the window. You can see the letter E on each building, right? Well, Sandy wondered what this guy had been doing. Take a look. He pointed. Looks to me like he took the buildings marked with E and tried to think of words. Yeah, but the town is marked as never being done by eliminators, Riggs said. All these places are marked. Let's find out. Barry opened his door. Let's see if we can find this guy. Hopefully it won't be too hard since he never gave an address. He is giving smoke signals, Riggs said. Rachel, along with Sandy, stepped out the side door just after Riggs and Barry. She walked around to meet up with them at the front of the RV. Listen, Rachel said. Sandy smiled. Music? What is up with that song? Riggs questioned. Who knows? Rachel shrugged. It was there when we were assigned the RV. Maybe it was in everyone's RV, Barry suggested. A theme song for eliminators. And it has what to do with eliminating the dead, Riggs asked. Think about it, Riggs, Rachel replied. Think about the words. It has a lot to do with what we do. She walked ahead. No, Rach, it doesn't. While Barry secured the RV, Riggs caught up to Rachel, and they led the others following the sound of the song, American Pie, as it carried through the small town. The trail leading to the new guy was a triple-layered one. The smoke, the music, and eventually the loud singing. Not that he sang the whole song of American Pie, only certain parts, more so because he could hit the notes better. He had part of the Eliminator uniform on, the coverall version of the uniform like Barry wore, only he had it zipped half down, the top of it dangling at his hips, the sleeves tied around his waist. He wore a Hawaiian shirt with the sleeves cut out. A man of average height and build, he stood before a conveyor he'd built, watching stiffs roll into the incinerator. And the three men I admire most, he sang. Riggs cleared his throat. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Barry tried this time, clearing his throat even louder. He continued singing. They took the last train for the coast. The day, the music. Hello? Rachel called out softly. He spun with a scream. Die! Good God Almighty! He immediately shut down the belt, halting the bodies that moved. We didn't mean to scare you, Riggs said. Command sent us. Flame and saffrons, he said with a country boy drawl to his voice. A bottle of hand sanitizer sat on a chair. He took off his gloves, pumped a few times so it ran on his palms, rubbed, then flapped out his hands. Wasn't expecting you until later. I was cleaning up. He extended his hand. Fred. Riggs. He shook Fred's hand. This is Rachel, Barry, and Sandy, he introduced. Fred shook hands with them all. Do you guys mind if I just let them run through? He pointed to the bodies. This is the last of them. No, please go ahead, Riggs said. Did you and your team clean up the town before the incident with your RV? Incident? Fred asked. You mean when I lost my team? No, I cleaned up this town. I didn't know if I was going to be stuck here or not. Plus, what was I going to do? From my estimate and notes, there were only about 60 remaining. Got them all. Good job, Riggs said. We can talk about what happened after you, well, finish. Almost done. Fred started the belt again. Only take another seven minutes. He nodded almost nervously. If you listen, you can hear a slat squeal. I'm sorry. Riggs tilted his head. They squeal? Like lobsters in a pot. I think it's like the remaining air coming out of whatever holes there are in their body. Wait. Fred widened his eyes. Hear it? Listen. Oh, my God! Rachel exclaimed upon hearing the sound that reminded her of air slowly escaping a balloon. That's freaky! Yeah, you should have seen me the first time I heard it, Fred said. I ran. I thought, good Lord, their souls are still trapped in there. Maybe they are, Barry said. I mean, you don't know. Riggs shook his head with a ridiculing chuckle. Please. Fred held up his hand. Hold on there, Shug. Big guy might have a point. Plus, respect for his opinion. Shug? Riggs asked. Shug? Yeah, Fred answered. Riggs. It's Riggs. 
What? Rachel laughed. I like this guy. Thanks, he said. It'll be nice having you. Rachel winced at another squeal. Welcome to the Flaming Saffrons. Yep, Chihuahua love all the way. Fred smiled, then returned his attention to his body-burning task. Chapter 15 Barracuda Other than the weapons he was able to salvage from his team, Fred didn't have much. A duffel bag, a canteen strapped over his shoulder, and a guitar. They placed his bag in the undercarriage of the bus, and he took his guitar inside. Well, wow, it's... He looked around the interior. Um, different than ours. How so? Rachel asked with folded arms. Rach, Riggs said. No, I want to know. Is it nicer? Fred only shifted his eyes. See? See? Rachel pointed to Riggs. We got the shaft on the Eliminator vehicle. I've seen worse, Fred said. Once. Barry walked through them on his way to the front. We're going to get rolling. Fred, you play guitar? No, nah, no, nah, it's a Gibson Hummingbird. I found it two months ago. Now, don't just beat all you ever stepped in. Worth a fortune. Well, was worth a fortune before the world went to pot. Just been hoping I would meet someone who could play. He lifted his canteen, opened it, and took a drink. We have water if you'd like a bottle, said Sandy. Nah, this... This is rum. Fred took a seat. Thank you, though. Sure, Sandy nodded. So, physically, how are you? I'm a doctor. Oh, I'm dandy, thanks. Okay, Riggs said brightly. Let's roll. Rachel was impatient. They had been on the road for hours, and every time she opened her mouth to ask Fred about what happened, Riggs cut her off, telling her not to ask. Let Fred tell in his own due course. It could be traumatic. Fred was an eliminator. How traumatized could he be, she thought. Besides, she wanted to know what happened. Were they attacked by some sort of vicious gang of marauders, like Riggs believed, or some new breed of stiff, as Rachel leaned towards? All it ended up taking was for Sandy to ask, How long have you been listening to that American Pie song? And Fred began his story. It was on the CD they gave us when we first started, Fred said. Had a bunch of hits from last century on there. Someone made it. They said we should play it to draw them out. We have a similar CD, Sandy commented. We do the same thing. Funny how none of us ever learned the words to American Pie, even though we played it like a thousand times. Us either, Rachel said. I memorized the first couple verses and that's it. Oh, the chorus. Chorus, Fred replied. My big goal was to find someone to play it on that guitar I found. How did you know it was an expensive guitar? Rachel asked. My nephew played. It was a running joke. Every year I'd ask him what he wanted for his birthday, and he said, I'll take me one of those limited edition anniversary Gibson Humminbird acoustic guitars. Heck, I looked up that guitar so many times. Only 14 of those limited edition bad boys in the world. I knew as soon as I spotted it, I found the jackpot. On the back it has a tiny gold plate with a nine on it, so it's the ninth one. Thought of my nephew. Boy, he'd be thrilled. Funny story, we were in Cleveland back when they were still using eliminators in bigger towns. Right outside this club, I saw this rock and roll zombo carrying it, and he was carrying it almost as if he knew it was special. He probably did, Rachel said. One of our previous eliminators, Casper, he... Rachel, Riggs interrupted. You don't want to bog him down with Casper tales right now, do you? That was, like, rude, Rachel said, shaking her head. Of course, Riggs has this thing about women talking. Stop, I do not, Fred chuckled. <laughs> We'd banter like this, too. We had one woman with us for a while, started with us. She moved on, then Brad joined us. But our team, we were together pretty much the whole time. That's why it sucks this happened. He looked at them. Command didn't tell you? Actually, Rachel said, Command didn't know the details. Yeah, they did. I told them when I finally found the radio in that one house. We were attacked, Fred said. Out of the blue, we pulled over so Brad could take a piss. He'd piss in the RV, but no one pissed in there because then you'd have to find a place to dump it, you know. Rachel nodded. Anyhow, we pulled over and they'd come out of nowhere. Well, not nowhere. The woods. It had to be 50 of them. And they were on us before we could think. Riggs asked. Marauders? No. The dead. They moved fast. We couldn't lower the gates in time. We fought. We fired. Heck, we set off grenades. But in the end, we had to retreat. And Brad? 
Rachel asked. He was bit pretty bad. In fact, I was the only one that didn't get a bite or scratch, Fred said. They passed over the course of a couple days. I didn't burn them. I couldn't. I thought you saw my little graveyard for them. Rachel shook her head. No, we didn't. I'm sorry. It's been rough. Taking them out has helped keep me sane, said Fred. What about you guys? You're down two members. Well, Rachel explained. From the beginning, there's been me, Riggs, Barry, Sandy, and Casper. The sixth spot always seemed open and to rotate. Like the red shirt spot. Always one in every story. Yes, Fred, yes! You get the reference! Rachel exclaimed. Of course I do. There's an unspoken apocalypse fiction table of contents. Big events, big missions, love stories. I mean, even every team has their point of reference to apocalypse movies. Military guy? He pointed to Riggs. Tough chick with sad story is you. Sometimes she's also the quiet angry gal. Voice of reason? Has to be your doc. And you don't have to beat me over the head with a rubber donut to know Barry is the moral authority. Only took me to hear him correct Riggs once about language. That leaves the hot bad boy and the easy-going fun guy. Which are you, Fred? Rachel asked. Well, stars and garters, that has to be the most complimentary thing someone asked of me. As much as I'd like to be the hot bad boy, even more so, I'm the fun guy. That was Casper. So that means, Fred said, the other new guy has to be the hot bad boy. Riggs laughed. Is that funny? Rachel asked. Yeah, Rach. His name is Aldrich Yates. You mean like the Senator Yates? asked Fred. Riggs nodded. That's his dad. Fred winced. If he looks like his dad, he's not going to be the hot bad boy. His dad's a little guy, bald, glasses, kind of scrawny. Okay, he's their navigator, Rachel said. So that makes sense. They have a navigator? Thank you, Riggs held out his hand. I thought that was weird. He's a senator's son, Sandy spoke up. He's going to have the cushy job. In my mind, I kind of picture him preppy, blonde hair, thin, studious. Rachel shrugged and shook her head. The moment I heard the name, I thought middle-aged, gray, like... Oh, what was his name? Anderson Cooper. Yeah, that's it. Sandy tightened her lip and nodded. That actually makes sense. Barry announced from his driver's seat. We're about to find out. I think that's him up ahead. They all rushed up front as Barry slowed down. He sat on the side of the road, staring down at something in his hands, as if he were texting, but that wasn't possible. Next to him was a red wagon packed with black bags. His uniform's blue? Riggs questioned. Royal blue, said Rachel. What difference does it make? Riggs asked. Just explaining it can't be just blue, it's royal blue. When he saw them approach, Aldrich stood up. He looked slightly taller than average, with a strong build and broad chest. His dark hair looked perfectly men's magazine styled, as if he actually took time to do it. He tilted his head, looked at the RV, and slightly cocked his right eyebrow. He lifted the handle to the wagon of supplies and started walking toward the RV. Oh my, said Sandy. Oh my is right, Rachel said. Oh my what, Riggs asked. I think, Fred said, they're saying he's hot. Thank you, Fred, Rachel commented. We are. Whatever, Rach, Riggs said. You do this all the time. The last spot to fill is always the hot one. I didn't say that about Sandy, Rachel defended. Casper did, said Barry. He did, Rachel nodded. Then Riggs sexually harassed her. You sexually harassed a team member? Fred asked. No, Riggs blasted. He didn't, Rachel said. Sandy claimed it, but it's not true. He was just honest about his post-grief sexual nympho exploits. Okay, enough. Riggs opened the door. Let's go meet Aldrich. When they stepped outside, Aldrich already had the hatch open to the storage. Aldrich, I'm Riggs, Riggs approached. I see you found a place to put your stuff. I'll take what I need to have on the... He lifted his eyes. Whatever this is. The rest I'll store here. This is the team. Barry, Rachel, Doctor, yes. He cut off Riggs and tossed in his belongings. That's a lot of stuff, Riggs said. It's what I saved and collected. I need it all. I'll be done in a second and we can go. Tell me you have outlets on your old vehicle, he said. Told you, Rachel said. It's old. We have power. Good. Aldrich shut the hatch. So, Aldrich, Fred stepped forward. I know this is overwhelming, being out here alone. Probably really overwhelming for you. Not really, he answered abruptly. 
Annoying, tedious, not overwhelming. All right. Fred clapped his hands together once. I'm also the new guy here. Should we call you Al? No, you should not. Not Al, not ever. He walked to the side door. Riggs exhaled, a sign of his frustration with the abrasiveness of the newcomer. Look, you're probably in a bad mood. It seems like it. The weather isn't kind. Just know we're glad to have you on the team. Aldrich stopped mid-step into the RV. Oh, I'm not here to be on your team. There's some sort of confusion. You're here to help me find the EPEV? The... the what? Riggs asked. The EPEV, or EPEV, Elite Prototype Eliminator Vehicle. A vehicle? Barry asked. For a second there, I thought you were saying to help you find your team. We find the vehicle, we find my team, Aldrich said. After that, you can be on your merry way and be eliminators in your own little... whatever this thing is. He stepped inside. Barry whistled. This is going to be interesting. Riggs faced Rachel. Still think he's hot? Oh, yeah. She walked to the RV. But that's not all I think he is. Chapter 16. The Blip. Thirty miles northwest of Memphis. Okay, okay, which direction do you want me to take? Barry asked, calming his frustration. West, Aldridge Yates answered. Just west. That has to be the direction. From the moment he boarded, he sat at the little kitchenette table. He had what looked like a mini laptop. It was plugged in. Connected to that was a device that looked like a phone but the screens on both devices were black. He kept staring at them, waiting for something to happen. Rachel decided to try. Tension was high on the RV, obviously from the stranger who hadn't said anything since setting up his dead electronics. He was pompous and snooty. He didn't fit in at all, not even an inkling. In fact, Rachel had a hard time even imagining him getting dirty, let alone taking out the dead. Fifteen minutes into his arrival, everyone wrote him off as just a passenger that wouldn't be around long. Barry drove. Sandy went to her medical room. Riggs joined Barry after pretty much saying fuck it about the new guy. And Fred kind of sat nearby the stranger, staring as if he knew that would unnerve him. So, Rachel said, pulling up a chair and sitting by him. Even though you won't be with us long, what do we call you? Obviously not Al. Obviously. Will it be, hey you, or Rich, or Aldi? Yates, he replied. Yates is fine. Cool. What, what is all this? She waved her hand around his electronics. This is my tracing system. He touched the smaller device. Portable, then pointed to the computer. Main. Tracer? Rachel asked. Tracing what? The EPEV. Really? There's a tracking system on it? It's a bit more than that, Yates answered. The portable tracks it. The computer is higher level. That's complicated. I see. They're both dead. I know that, Yates said. They won't be when they have enough power to power them up and run. I see. Rachel tapped her fingers together. So you're looking for the vehicle. See, I was under the impression that you were the sole survivor of your team because something happened. Maybe because you didn't really communicate much through Morse code. Can you understand Morse code? Yates asked. No. Neither can most people. They get the basics. I gave the basics. But you are the sole survivor, Rachel asked. I hope not, Yates replied. That's why I'm waiting for these to power up. If I find the EPEV, I can find my team. So your team is with the vehicle? When they were taken, yes. We were ambushed. Oh! Oh! Rachel faced the front of the RV. Riggs! We have a marauder story! I don't care, Riggs replied. Rachel shrugged. What happened, Yates? We were in Texas when we got word to head east. We stopped in this town in Arkansas. Sweep team had been there. Eliminators thought it was safe. Outskirts of the town and even inside, I saw movement. I knew it wasn't dead. They didn't buy it. I pulled the short straw and had to unload the night's supplies. I took the first load into the house when I heard the EPEV leaving. It was gone. Ambushed. Dragged some of the stuff I had on the sidewalk a good half mile. That included the laptop. What did you do? Rachel asked. My portable tracker said they were headed east. I found a car at a sales lot, loaded up, and headed after them. My tracker died outside of Memphis. I was close, I guess. The laptop with the system was crushed. I saved the hard drive and rebuilt the system from something I got from a Best Buy. However, it didn't have much juice. 
By the time I got the hard drive on and the program up, I barely had time to do what I needed to do before it shut down. I'm confused, said Rachel. You have Barry going west. Yates nodded. I do, because I saw they changed course and headed back west. I just couldn't pinpoint where they were exactly before the system shut down. Fred raised his hand. So they can be anywhere, not just west. Oh, they're west. They'll be easy to find, Yates replied. Yeah, but, Fred continued, you power that up, they may be out of range. They won't be out of range. They got what, a week's head start on you? Fred asked. It's been ten days since I had power, Yates replied. Then they can be anywhere, Fred repeated. They can be in California. They didn't make it that far, Yates said. I know. I shut it down. Rachel looked at him confused. You shut it down? What do you mean? Powered down. Shut down. Even the best mechanic won't get it up and running. Like those car navigation help centers, they shut down a car if it's stolen. That just sucks. Rachel said. Command gives Fred a cool-ass vehicle, and you guys get one that has anti-theft. Please, Yates said arrogantly. Command didn't give us anything. EPEV was mine long before this whole thing started. What do you mean? Rachel asked. I mean it's mine. I designed it. Originally, it was an EPIV, Elite Prototype Intelligence Vehicle. Fourteen million dollars. When I was at MIT, my design was commissioned for an undercover surveillance vehicle to be used to find terrorists. It didn't get to launch because of everything. So when my father told me about the Eliminator Initiative, I had the vehicle at my disposal. And you put together the Golden Cavalry? Rachel asked. You? Or did you bring the EPEF to the party? Oh, I found the best team I could get, said Yates. Wow. Rachel sat back. So, let me get this straight. You have this $14 million intelligence vehicle and a Golden Boy team. You're on your way back east to end the Eliminators tour, like the rest of us. You stop for the night, and just as you're unloading, the vehicle is ambushed, and they take your team hostage. Yes. Any gunfire? No. And the ambushers take your EPEV east, same direction you were headed, and kept going that way, oddly enough, until the portable died. Yes. Eight hours, that's all the portable lasts, Yates said. Computer to shut the shit down is also destroyed accidentally? Yes. Hmm. What? What exactly are you getting at? Yates asked, standing up. I need a drink. I'm getting at the possibility that... Yates, did it ever occur to you that maybe your team wasn't ambushed, but rather they just left your ass behind? Oh my god, please... He placed his hand on his chest. You're saying my team left me? I am. Explain how I saw movement. If they weren't stiffs, maybe they were... Help? Rachel guessed. Others they wanted to join up with? Nonsense. Yates flung out his hand. Why would they leave me behind? Why would they go through all that? Because maybe... And don't take this the wrong way. Maybe they didn't like you because you can be an asshole. I can accept that I'm an asshole, but I can't accept that they would leave me behind. His eyes moved and locked somewhere else. Is that... Is that a 125th anniversary limited edition Gibson Hummingbird acoustic guitar? He asked. Just sitting there propped against a bench? It is, Rachel answered. Why is it sitting out of a case? Why is it just sitting there? I, uh... Rachel shrugged. Don't know. How did you know what it was? I had one. I loaned it to my friend who was playing an important gig in Cleveland. I had an anniversary number nine of the limited edition. Rachel just looked at Fred. Whose is this? Yates asked. And how did you acquire it? Rachel pointed to Fred. His nephew always wanted one. Can I? Yates reached for it. Both Rachel and Fred replied, No! Okay. Yates withdrew his hand at the same time a beep rang out. Al, I think your computer's on, Fred said. Yates rushed over, sliding into the bench seat. His fingers tapped on the computer as it powered up. The startup sequence seemed to take forever, but once it was booted, Yates entered into the program he needed. Let me sync these. He lifted the connected portable device. Within seconds after opening the program, a steady beeping rang out with a pulse red circle. Yes! Got them! Found them! Not moving. Vehicle's still in shutdown mode. Do you think your team is with the vehicle? Rachel asked. 
I don't know, but I'll be able to locate them once we get to the vehicle in... A few more clicks of the keys, and Yates sat back. Seminole, Oklahoma. Rachel wasn't sure how finding the vehicle was going to help him find his team, especially if they weren't near the shut-down super RV. Maybe Yates had been alone too long. Maybe he was delusional. She supposed, in a few hours, when they got to the RV one way or another, she'd find out. The drive to find the missing EPEV would bring them well into the night, so they had to stop for the night. They did so just before the sun went down, and a hundred miles from Seminole. While the others prepped the RV to hunker down for the night, Yates remained at that table, staring at the computer as if it would change. "'What exactly am I looking at?' Barry asked, looking at the tiny screen on the phone-like device. "'It's just a blip, solid red dot.' "'Yes,' Yates replied. "'It means it isn't moving and it's disabled. "'Your RV?' Barry asked. "'Okay, stop. "'To call it an RV is to say it's not much more than this.' "'Yates held his palm out, pointing to his whereabouts. "'This is much more.' "'Riggs mumbled as he walked by. Fourteen million dollars more.' "'Yes, fourteen million dollars,' Yates snipped. "'More than you'd ever see in your lifetime.' "'Who cares now?' Riggs asked. "'About fourteen million? Yates shrugged. Maybe no one, but if you saw the vehicle, you'd care. It's the ultimate eliminator vehicle. So, just curious. Riggs folded his arms. Is it the vehicle that makes you an eliminator, or do you actually get your hands dirty and eliminate the dead? Oh, Rachel said. Like, is it the man that makes the clothes, or the clothes that make the man sort of thing? Riggs snapped his fingers and pointed at Rachel. Yep, exactly. Well... Al, I'll have you know I am good at what I do, believe it or not, and probably one of the best on my team. Yes, the vehicle helps, but it helps my team. I put a lot of work and years into it before all this happened. And is that why you became an eliminator? Riggs asked. I don't need to justify why I joined or started a team. I could have gone to France. Riggs chuckled. France? That's an odd remark. Not really. Not when France was the last place standing. No infections, no dead. They sealed their borders. Not sure if it's still like that. It was eight months ago. France. Riggs nodded and smiled. Actually, thanks. That helps. That helps a lot. That actually is the word I was looking for. Yates shook his head slightly with a confused look. What? Yeah, Rachel said. What does that mean? Nothing, Riggs said. Yates sang out the word. Okay. Question, said Barry. This handheld device tracks your vehicle. Yes. What does the computer do? It tracks the vehicle. If they both do the same thing, why use both? Yates pointed to the computer. This disables the vehicle, monitors the equipment and temperature. So far, everything is still intact. But it doesn't tell you about your team, Barry asked. Yates shook his head. Not at all. Whoever took them either still has them, killed them, or they escaped. I'll know when we get to my vehicle. Barry crinkled his brow. I'm confused. You said you don't think they're there, but once we get there, you'll know where they are? I'll have an idea where they are. It's hard to explain. I'll show you when we get there. Then what? Barry asked. I power up the vehicle and go look for them. Alone? Barry asked. Yes. No need to bother you. I'm sure you have a schedule to keep, some town to get to, Yates said. We will, too, once we're back together. They may be home. Everyone looked at Rachel when she snorted a laugh. Rach? Riggs asked. What's so funny? Rachel shook her head. She's laughing because, Yates said, somebody in this room, not to mention names, thinks my team wasn't ambushed, but rather left me. Barry cleared his throat. Son, you don't need to mention names. It could have been any of us saying that. So, all of you think my team left me? Just left me? They said, oh, Yates is a dick. Let's leave him and let him find his own way back. No one replied. Fine. Fine. You know what? I need some air. He spun around and stormed out. Sandy jumped a little at the slamming of the door, then giggled at her own reaction. She stood by the grill watching the burgers, one they used only when staying in the RV overnight. The unit pulled out from the back. You scared me, 
she said to Yates. Dinner's almost done. One or two burgers. I'm not hungry this evening. I'll have a granola bar later. Sandy shrugged. Suit yourself. They're good. She looked over, watching him pace. Something wrong? Your team hates me, doctor. Speaking of which, why do they have the team doctor cooking on the grill? I like it. Besides, I'm the best cook. I don't mind. It's like cooking for my family. Hmm. What did they do to make you think they don't like you? Sandy asked. Totally disrespecting my team, diminishing the severity of what happened to them or what could happen, the danger they're in, implying, mind you, that my team left me behind on purpose. Oh. Sandy looked over at him. You know, take this from a doctor's point of view or an elder. You could... You could try being a little nicer. Now, why would I do that? Oh, goodness, I don't know. What a horrible suggestion on my part. Forgive me. Forgiven. Sandy did a double take after hearing his response. She returned to her burgers and tried to not show a reaction, to appear neutral. Even if she had to fake her pleasantries, Sandy would be polite. Thankfully, it would be short-lived. She took comfort in knowing that Seminole, Oklahoma wasn't that far away, and neither she nor her team would have to deal with the temporary newcomer for long after that. Chapter 17 Not Bad March 10th, Day 325, Seminole, Oklahoma Couldn't have asked for a better spot. Riggs stood with Rachel on top of the RV. He peered through a set of binoculars. They definitely stopped here on purpose. They had parked their own RV at a distance, spotting it in the field, often away from where other RVs were parked in the RV campsite. Yep. He handed her the binoculars. They were here for a couple days. Without a doubt were stopped and settled when Frat Boy shut it down. Table outside, the RV extension pulled out. Looks like a fire pit, not sure. What do you think? I can't see it clearly. I think it's a fire pit. What makes that vehicle worth $14 million? She asked of the slightly long but silver tube-looking vehicle. Oh, he's exaggerating, Riggs said. He's full of himself. <laughs> Tell me about it. I wonder if he really even can take down a stiff. Did you see any weapons? Maybe in his bags, Rachel said. Why put them there? I mean, all of us always have something on us. Probably because he doesn't know how to use them, Riggs said. You know damn well his team left him. Probably got tired of carrying his ass along with putting up with this pompous rich boy bullshit. You really think he designed a $14 million intelligent vehicle? I don't even think he went to MIT, Riggs said. But all that, along with the big deal vehicle and his super skills, will be exposed here shortly. How many do we have out there? I count... 26? She handed the binoculars back to Riggs. About that. There might be some in the other RVs, perhaps a few lingering in the woods. The bulk are around the EPEV. Why? Looks like they're rationing someone's remains. Can't be sure, but there are stiff bodies everywhere. Riggs turned left and right. Someone cleaned up this camp. Probably the Golden Cavalry, less their Golden Boy. They had to know he could shut it down on them, Riggs said, like a kid taking his toy and going home. He couldn't let them have it. It is a $14 million... Camper? Riggs laughed. Okay, enough of picking on him. Our time is done with him. Let's clear the area and send him on his way. He paused. You think... You think they're acting different? I mean, it looks like they're sleeping. He again handed the binoculars to Rachel. Rachel looked again, even though she didn't need to. Riggs was right. They did look like they were sleeping. Only one or two meandered around while the rest didn't move. They leaned on each other against the RV. You know, in Walking Dead, one of the episodes early on, the main character arrived in the city and a whole slew of zombies were sleeping on a bus. But they weren't sleeping... I think when there's nothing to follow or no scent to find, they kind of go into dormant mode. Then again, she returned the binoculars. We could also be looking at them different since Casper. I'm pretty sure, Rach, they aren't getting brain-stimulating injections like Casper. All right, let's get the others and formulate a plan. Close to 30, Riggs explained, moving his finger around in a circle on the computer screen map most of which are just kind of lingering around the EPEV. Might be a few stragglers in the trees or around camp. It looks like they were put down, Rachel said. Someone cleared the camp. 
Yates shook his head with a slightly upward roll of his eyes. This area was eliminated. Did you look for an E? Didn't see any, Riggs said. But we have close to 30 out there. We need to clear them, get Al to his multi-million dollar trailer, so we can head to Stroud, which is our eliminator stop. Yates looked up at Riggs. You guys are part of the renegade movement? No, no. Riggs shook his head. President bit it. Liz is leading. She started the eliminators again. That's... that's fantastic, said Yates. So you mean, if I find my team, we don't have to go home? Nope. Hopefully in the next couple weeks, Command will be back in St. Louis. If... You did more than Morse code, you probably would know that. Anyhow, thoughts? Riggs asked. Fred suggested. Draw them out. Pull close enough to get them away from the prize mobile. Keep this RV safe along with our dock, and we take them out that way. If we can draw them away, four of us, heck, it's six apiece. Easy as getting drunk on a Thursday. Yates lifted his hand to Fred. While I don't know what getting drunk on a Thursday has to do with anything, there's five of us if we leave out the doctor. Okay, Fred said. Riggs, draw them out? Yep, my thoughts exactly, Riggs replied. Draw them out. They stood in a line before the RV, Barry center, taking point, while Rachel and Fred were to his left, Riggs and Yates were to his right. Rachel watched Fred down what looked like a quarter bottle of vodka, straight down, no breaks. You all right? she asked. I think now's a good time to mention I'm scared to death of these things. How are you an eliminator? Because once I start killing them, I go into this panic blackout. That's not a bad thing. She examined what he held in his hand. Is that a barbecue fork? It is. Fred held up the 18-inch two-prong fork. My weapon of choice. That and a crowbar. So you know I can't use a gun. Mine are a honing rod. She held it up. And Gladius. Riggs uses a Gladius, but likes a garden pick as his second. Barry is strictly an aluminum baseball bat. He played Major League Ball for six years before he blew out his knee. She leaned back to look at Yates. Is that two swords he has? Yeah, a little bigger than yours. He pulled them from his bag. Now let's see if he can use them. All right, guys, Riggs stated. Guns only if needed. You know the routine. Meet them halfway. Draw them from the mega van. And for the word, France. France? Rachel asked. I'll tell you later, Riggs said. So for old time's sake, he raised his voice. Sandy, we're ready. The song American Pie had just started, but the sound of Riggs's voice was what really drew the dead from the silver epev. They rose from their dormant state, and since most were runners, they raced toward the team. Trying to keep them from hoarding or mobbing, Rachel moved further away, trying to catch the attention of a few. Just as she raised her weapons to engage, she heard Fred scream. It wasn't a fearful scream, more so a raspy attempted war cry as he charged forth. Most of them were under two weeks dead, which meant they were harder to take down. Their skulls didn't cave in with as much ease, and Rachel felt out of practice. After the first two, she was tired. Two weeks without eliminating, and she felt she was out of practice. She had to rely on the cripple method, weakening them by using her staff, taking a shot to the legs, and then using her gladius instead of the honing rod because the blades sliced through easier. She grew angry with herself, and even putting her anger into it didn't help. She kept thinking of Casper and how he wouldn't let her live it down. Through the corner of her eye, she was able to see Fred. He had no real method to his madness. He was just pronging away, stabbing wherever in a maddening manner. She waited to see the golden boy, but couldn't. Rachel supposed Riggs probably took care of them, and Yates only played the part. It wasn't a hard elimination. It went rather fast. Grunts and thuds filled the air, mixing with the song from the command-made CD. But three of them stayed by the EPEV, like they were protecting it, staying back and looking as if to say, You want this? Come and take it. Strange, Riggs said as the song finished. They aren't budging. Hey! He yelled at them. Here! Over here! He waved his arms and whistled. They didn't move. Rach! Riggs called her. Let's go take care of... No! Yates cut them off. I got this. It's my vehicle. I'll get this. Riggs waved out his arm. Be my guest. Rachel inched over to Riggs, whispering, You think this is a good idea? We'll jump in if it looks bad, said Riggs. Fred joined the conversation. We finally will see what he has. 
Yates held his swords in a strange way, tucking them under his arms and close to his body. He ran top speed toward the three stiffs that didn't budge. Rachel cringed. The stiffs showed no fear. They didn't pursue Yates at all. A few feet before them, Yates, still moving at a fast pace, dropped down, turned his body slightly sideways, and in an impressive baseball slide, slid through two of them, ending up behind the trio. It happened so fast. One second, Yates looked like he was sliding into home. The next, he was unseen behind them. A split second later, a sword emerged through the head of the one, then another. Both dropped simultaneously. When the third turned, Yates decapitated it. The head popped up some, but the moment it hit the ground, he impaled it. Okay, Yates yelled and gave a thumbs up. We're good. He turned and raced to the side door of his mystical RV. Riggs and Rachel just stood there, perhaps a little stunned. Fred whistled. Well, cut off my legs and call me Shorty. That boy actually does know what he's doing. The same way and the same time, Riggs and Rachel swung their heads to look at Fred. What? Fred asked. Never heard that one? Holy cow, was Barry's reaction when he stepped inside the dark epev. Rachel would have said that herself, but Barry covered it with his one exclamation. Without power, it was dark. Only a little light came through the windows and the open door. Even then, she could see how impressive and beautiful it was. No wonder he called ours crap, Rachel said. Indeed, it was longer and a little wider. The space was well utilized. The driver's seat and passenger seat were much more part of the vehicle than her own RV. The driving area didn't take up much space. Behind the two seats was the kitchen, granite countertops, stainless steel mini appliances, and cheery oak cabinets. The flooring was more pergo, like the old carpet in the flaming saffron RV. All the couches and benches were off-white leather. There was so much living space, and that was even before the hallway that led into the back. Rachel was curious as to what was back there. Sandy was the last to enter. She paused as she stepped inside. Oh my, this is nice. She handed the small laptop to Yates. All powered up. Thank you, doctor. He took it and set it on the coffee table. Give me a second. After a few clicks of the keyboard, the interior lights all came on. And we have power. He stood and walked quickly up front, peeking at the driver's area. Keys are there. Barry, could you start and see where we are with fuel? Absolutely. Riggs approached Yates. You think whoever took this or your team took your fuel supply? Probably half, not all. When it's in anti-theft mode, Yates said, second storage won't open. Tank is pretty much empty, Barry announced. That's what I thought, said Yates. I'll get to that in a minute, but first... I need to find my team. He walked quickly down the hall into the back of the RV. The team just stood there. Rachel shifted her eyes from Riggs to the hall. Are they back there? All five? I wouldn't think so. After a beat, both Rachel and Riggs went back there. The back end of the RV, which was usually reserved for a bedroom or doctor's space, looked like some sort of surveillance room. A countertop desk ran the width of the room, with what looked like several thin closets. There were three computers built into the wall, along with four small monitors above them. Yates sat in a leather chair before the computers as they booted up. Yates? Rachel questioned. You said you were finding your team? I am. Here. He pointed to the one computer. This should tell me where they are. Tracking? Like the RV? Rachel asked. Each of us... Yates lifted his left arm, exposing a blue plastic bracelet. Wear a tracking device. In a minute, I'll know where they are. Rachel knew her and Riggs were on the same wavelength. She knew it. A simple look at Riggs, connection of eyes, told her they were thinking the same thing. Hear me out, Riggs said. There's really a good chance your team kind of left you. I know you believe that. All right, but if they did leave you, do you think they would still be wearing the tracking devices? Riggs asked. Yes, answered Yates. Not for me, but for command. It's a safety thing. Wouldn't you want to wear them in this world, knowing if you get lost or in trouble, you can be found? Riggs cringed, an expression Yates didn't see. Um, yes and no. If I didn't want to be found. Riggs stopped talking when the computer beeped five times. There. Yates leaned back. 
Got them. Heartbeat's good. They're still alive, so we can rule out that they're walking dead. All five? Rachel asked. All five. They're together, at least within a mile of each other outside of Amarillo. Yates sighed out and gave a hint of a smile. I found my team. Chapter 18. France. Admittedly, Riggs didn't want to get off the leather couch. It was probably the most comfortable piece of furniture he had ever sat on, and that included before the apocalypse. The EPEV was nice. The air conditioning was crisp, and it was surprisingly clean for a vehicle that had been stolen, even if it was by his own team. Rachel sat in one of the two swivel, high back chairs. She went back and forth, probably not listening to a word Yates said. Fred kept peeking in cabinets as Yates talked about the tracking of his team and how they had left shortly after he powered down the RV. They made only one stop and had been in Amarillo most of the time. There's a reason why they haven't headed back east, Yates said. I don't know what it is. I know they were upset about the Eliminator program being dismantled and they wanted to go rogue. Which you didn't want to do, Rachel said. Why did you just put words in my mouth, Yates said. We did go rogue. That's why we were in Jonesboro instead of headed back to Center City. But I will probably head out in the morning. I don't want to get there close to dark. It'll make the search much harder. And you really want to do this by yourself? Barry asked. What about going back east for reinforcements? No. Yates shook his head. I'll do this. Thank you. Well, Riggs stood up. Then that's that. Good luck to you. I hope you find your team. He walked to the door. Rachel stood. Good luck. Al, Fred said. It's been a pleasure. Yates let out a small huff of annoyance. I'm sure. Wait, Barry said, holding out his arm, stopping Riggs and the others from leaving. Just wait. Riggs groaned and stepped back. Son, Barry said to Yates, I know you want to do this. I know you want to find your team. Heck, team is family, and if any of mine was out there, and if any of my team was out there, I sure as shit would be looking too. But, but, have you thought about this? I have had nearly two weeks to think about this, Yates replied. It's dangerous, Barry said. If Riggs and the others are wrong, and you're right, if your team was taken, your going alone is dangerous. If we're right, and your team left you behind, you going alone to find them is... Well, that's dangerous, too. They didn't leave me, Yates said. I'm certain of it. The fact that they're wearing their tracking tells me they want to be found. Or, Riggs said, they hope you find them. They were nice leaving you behind. They may not be so nice this time. What are you saying I should do? Yates asked. Just give up on them? Yeah, you should, Riggs stated. You have enough gas. Go to Center City. Report their whereabouts and let command handle it. They'll have people out here soon. Or, Barry added, or we go with you. What? Riggs blasted. He doesn't want our help, Rachel snapped. I don't care, Barry said firmly. I don't. We cannot with a clear conscience leave this man to go alone, like him or not. If we can't convince him not to go, then we go with him. Riggs grumbled. Jeremiah Riggs, you stop that. You're a better man than that. Sir, Fred spoke up, we have towns to do, and we'll do them after we help him find his team. We go to Amarillo. Instead of Stroud, then Weatherford, we hit Weatherford, then Stroud on the way back, Barry said. If his team is in trouble, then we have to help. If his team is fine and wants to deal trouble to Al here, then our presence will help. You, you would do that? Yates asked. Yes, Barry replied firmly. I know your team doesn't want to do this. Doesn't matter what they want to do, Barry said. I'm pulling the elder card here. They'll do it and do it well. Riggs exhaled heavily. I can't believe you just volunteered us. Tough. Fine. Riggs tossed out his hand. Fine. I'll help. No lip on my part. Rach? Grumbling, she answered. Yes. Thank you, Yates said, and I guess it wouldn't hurt, and it would be a little fun if maybe I did Stroud and Weatherford with you guys on the way. I suppose that's the least I can do. Do you really want to take that much time? Barry asked. How much time could it take? It's two small towns, asked Yates. 
Weeks, Barry replied. Weeks? Yates laughed. It never took us more than a few days. Five tops. Oh, stop bragging, Rachel said. No one does a town in a few days, especially now. It's been a while since the sweep teams went through. Still, Yates said, no more than five days. Riggs shook his head. Impossible. No one's that good. No team is that good. You can't go house to house, business to business, one at a time, checking each in just a few days, unless you cut corners. Yates drew up a smug look. We were the best for a reason. And all those snide comments you've been making about the EPEV? Guess what? Yates said. You're about to find out why it's worth every penny of that fourteen million dollars. The pop, followed by the high-pitched whistling sound, caused Rachel, Riggs, and Barry to look up as they all sat quietly around the fire. Yates didn't react at all. Are they actually aiming at something? Rachel asked. Yates looked at the EPEV. Probably. For accuracy, it should be closer than a hundred yards. But they're learning, even if they miss. It's like, what, the seventh or eighth time? Not wasting much. Barry asked. Does it work in towns? You have to turn on a different surveillance system for buildings. I'll work with Sandy on that. She never leaves the RV anyhow. She might as well navigate. Rachel's eyes widened, and she dragged out the word. Oh, she nodded. Navigation wasn't maps. Nope. Yates shook his head. It's the person that lets you know what, where, and how many are in a building. So you never went into a building, Riggs asked. I did. I just found them first. The system they're playing with is for clearing the roads. Barry asked, Have you ever been overrun? We came close once, Yates replied. A huge horde. We just blew them up. Does that work? Barry questioned. No, it just makes them immobile. You still have to go out and hit the head. Another pop and another whistle. Barry gazed upward. Unreal. You designed this system? I did. I had to tweak it because obviously the dead don't leave heat signatures. I'll give everyone a quick lesson tomorrow. Don't put too much time in it, Riggs stated. It's only temporary, and most of us don't have the luxury of this technology. True. Did you... Rachel asked. Did you act this way with your team, the way you're acting now? Which way's that? questioned Yates. Like, still smug, but less an asshole because you know what you're talking about and don't feel you have to prove you're better than anyone else. Riggs stifled a laugh. I don't know how to take that. Yates said. But yes, why do you ask? Because if you were like this, maybe they didn't leave you behind. They didn't. You'll see. Not, not to doubt you, Barry said. But it's really hard to believe that someone came in and kidnapped five highly trained killers. That's what eliminators are, even if we only kill the dead. Maybe they were soft, Riggs said. Lost their touch with all the help they got from their fancy stuff meant for foreign soil. Speaking of foreign soil, Rachel said, what's up with France? You said you would tell us something about the word. Ah, Riggs waved out his hand. Nothing. Come on, you can't do that. You said you'd tell us. You seemed excited. Well, it's stupid. You'll make fun, Riggs said. Probably, Rachel agreed. Go on. Okay, when Al Yates, he corrected. Al said France. It hit me that was what I was missing. I was stuck. I was stuck on a line, and hearing him say France all made it fall into place. Stuck on a line? Yates asked. Poem? Journal? Song? Riggs snapped his finger. Song! I kind of wrote a parody of American Pie. What? Rachel blasted with a laugh. You did not. I did. Riggs, that is like a very creative thing. You aren't creative, Rachel said. I can be creative. Bear, Rachel looked at him. You've known him forever. Have you ever known him to be creative? Just in the way he justified his post-grief actions. The door to the EPEV opened, and excitedly, Fred and Sandy came out. Guys, Sandy said, trying to curb her enthusiasm. We took down three and a cow. The cow was an accident. In our defense, Fred added. They were going for the cow, and we put it out of its misery. Sandy crinkled her nose. Not real sure that we got headshots. The system doesn't tell us that. Yates gave a thumbs up. Whatever gets your practice in. Fred looked around. What? What's going on here? Oh, Rachel said. Riggs was telling us how he wrote a parody version of American Pie. 
Whoa! Slap my head and call me silly. I want to hear that, Fred said. Slap your head, Yates questioned. Call you silly? Never heard of it? I have a feeling I have never heard of any of those sayings that pop out of your mouth, Yates replied. Riggs, Sandy smiled. That sounds like fun. I always knew you were creative the way you reorganized my medical room. That's not creativity, Barry said. That's OCD. Yates abruptly stood up. Turning in? Barry asked. No. Yates walked over to the flaming saffron RV and opened the side door. Someone needs to use that $10,000 specialty guitar that's propped up like the bargain store beginner special. He went in and came back out with it. So beautiful. It's a shame you treat her like this. You play? Fred asked. I do. That's why I owned one. Yates plucked the strings, cringing as he tuned it up. It took a minute, but he ended his tuning routine with a strum of a chord as he sat back down. Okay, Riggs, let's hear it. Wait. Rachel held up her hand. You know American Pie? Um, what eliminator wouldn't? Well, roll me in cracker crumbs and deep fry me to a golden brown. Fred, she nudged him. This is the moment you waited for. You said you wanted to run into somebody that could play and knows the song. Sorry, it's him. Yates strummed once hard. Ha ha. Riggs, no. Riggs waved his hand about. Jeremiah, come on. Barry urged. We all need a laugh. If it's a parody, it'll do that. Okay, no making fun of my voice. Wouldn't dream of it, said Barry. Riggs cleared his throat. Yates struck the chord. Whenever you're ready, key of G. Whatever, Riggs shrugged. I don't know. Go ahead. Yates struck the first chord again. He waited, then struck it again. Riggs began to sing. Not that long ago... I can still remember when things began to fall apart. He was garnished with excited, proud cheers from everyone. He continued, I knew if I had the chance, I would take a trip to... Everyone sang out the word, France. Riggs smiled as he sang, And maybe beat the plague just for a while. Yates nodded. This is good. February made me quiver. Bloody vomit fever shivers. Nothing that we could fight. People dropping left and right. He kept going. You can't imagine my surprise when I saw the dead begin to rise. The world had met its big demise. The day the people died. Yates strummed fully, building up excitedly to the progression and firing into the chorus. But Riggs didn't sing. He drew silent, which caused Yates to stop. What? Sing. It's the chorus. I... That's all I got, Riggs said. Yates struck a sour chord. What? You didn't write any more? That's as far as I got. You said you wrote a parody of the song, not just a verse, Yates said. Why didn't you write at least a chorus? I was stumped. I drew a blank, Riggs shrugged. Oh, great. Just great. Yates stood up. This is going to drive me nuts. It'll stick and bother me like when you can't remember a person's name. He began to hand the guitar to Fred. I'm going to... He paused, and his eyes widened as he tilted his head. What's wrong? Fred asked. Let me see the back of that guitar. Why? I swore I saw the number nine. Fred looked. Nope. It's a six, see? He flashed it quickly. Oh, okay, I'm going to bed. He walked into his EPEV. Just, Rachel said, when I almost, only a little, didn't mind him. She reached down, grabbed her bottle, and extended it to Riggs. Good job. So, so what? You didn't write a chorus. You've given us all something to think about. Riggs took the bottle. Thanks. Right now we need to think about tomorrow. At sunrise, we're back on the job. It won't be the same without Casper. He raised the bottle to a friend and colleague lost. It truly wasn't going to be the same, but it would feel good to be back at it, trying to make the world a better and safer place. Chapter 19 Listen 
March 11th, day 326, Stroud, Oklahoma. All right, so Yates set a silver case on the coffee table in the EPEV as everyone gathered around. First, we're going in teams, so these are one per team. He handed out what looked like phones. And these are, Riggs asked, they're a mini version of what we have for distance. Sandy will be focusing on buildings. These are for street. Barry, you taking point here at the RVs? I am. Then you have one. Yates gave him one. They're self-explanatory, but radio me with questions. Remember, Sandy will be navigating, so she'll be everyone's set of eyes. He gave one to Rachel. I assume you're going with Fred? Yes, absolutely. That leaves you and Riggs. Sweet, Fred commented. He then opened the case. These are trackers. Batteries last about six months. They're waterproof. I want everyone to have one. He started passing them out. Sandy and Rachel, only because I have them and want them used. He handed Sandy her pink plastic bracelet. Looks like a Fitbit, Sandy said. Thank you. I take that as a compliment. I tried. Are these included in the $14 million price tag? Yes. Yates gave one to Rachel. I know pink is probably not your thing. You probably hate it, but I don't have any blue left. Okay. Why would I hate pink? Because, you know. No, what? You're a... Well, you know. I'm a, well, you know, what? A lesbian, Yates said. I know my lesbian friends don't like pink. I'm not a lesbian. Why... Why would you think that? You have that... He swirled his finger around. Captain Marvel short hair thing happening. Oh, my God! Rachel exclaimed. Sorry, Fred said. I kind of got that, too. And, Yates said, you don't wear makeup. It's the fucking apocalypse, Rachel argued. Who wears makeup? Yates pointed to Sandy. I like to feel good about myself. Riggs turned to Barry. And you're not correcting her about her language? Fuck you, Riggs, Rachel snapped. And I'm not mad about being called a lesbian. I'm mad because my new team members are stereotyping bigots. She snatched the bracelet. Why do we need to wear one? Fred asked. If there's a problem, we can find you. We can pinpoint you if we see trouble. It also helps us know if you're dead or alive. He shifted his eyes when he saw Rachel put it in her pocket. Well, not if you don't wear it. I have it on me. I'm not wearing it. Fine. At least we'll get a heat signal, Yates said. If you were navigating, you'd sing a different tune about others wearing them. Oh! Rachel snapped her fingers. Speaking of tunes, check this out, Riggs. Maybe you can use these lines. She half sang the words. The sweet team say it's clean, not from what we've seen, the dead surrounding you and me. Riggs nodded. That's good. I came up with a line, too, said Fred. How about, before we mark it red, we have to hit them in the head. Stop. Yates spoke up as he closed the case. And while you both were brainstorming lyrics to jump on Riggs's gravy train, did you happen to come up with a chorus? Rachel shook her head. No. It was tricky, Fred added. I tried. See? Riggs said. You just draw a blank. I'm killing you all. Yates lifted the case. It was out of my head. Now it's stuck again. Thank you. Come on, Sandy. Let's get you situated. He led the way to the navigation room. Riggs looked at his tracker. Do you think these things work that well? Barry nodded. They were the golden team. Best of the best for a reason. Yeah, but they're little computers. Everything is computers. They can't see, smell, or feel, so... Riggs turned it on. Fourteen million dollars or not, how much better can they really be over human instinct? Nothing, Sandy said over the radio. Nothing in the hardware store. Yates lifted his radio. Upstairs. I'm looking at three floors. Looks clear. Riggs shook his head. Ask if she's sure. I saw something. But you're not seeing in the building, said Yates. You're reading the outdoor scan. He looked over at the controller. I'm not seeing anything. It was just here. Sometimes I wonder if it picks up birds or something causing shadows. Yates lifted the radio. All right, Doc, we're moving on to the next building. Okay, give me a minute. I see something in Rachel's sector. Roger that, Yates said and extended his hand to Riggs. Let me see. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. It's pretty cut and dry. 
How is she able to see into buildings from a vehicle parked a block away and we can't see them using the hand devices? Riggs asked. Because I spent two hours this morning setting the scanners in the areas we're doing today. She's connected to those. Ah, I see. When we finish these areas today, I'll move them to another tomorrow. Al, come in, Sandy called. Why do you people insist on calling me Al? Yates lifted the radio. What's up? I'm seeing something weird in a house in Rachel's section. House 4. Is she there? No, she's in the house two doors down, even though I told her it was empty. I don't know if something is wrong here. What is it doing? Two of them. Just small and moving weird. Riggs looked at Yates. Kids? Could be. And they're dangerous. Yates brought the radio to his mouth again. What is the system identifying them as? Nothing. I think it's broke. I'm on my way. Yates handed Riggs the radio. She won't respond to me. Tell her not to go in any more houses until I take a look. He and Riggs began to walk back. Rach! Rach, come in! Riggs called out. Rach! I'm here. I'm fine. Rach? Good. Listen, don't go in any more houses. Nothing. Rach? No response. Fred? Fred, come in. We're fine, Fred replied. Rachel said stop radioing. We're trying to be quiet. Riggs lowered the radio and shook his head. Let's just find out what's going on, and then we'll go get them. Hopefully it's a glitch. You think? I mean, have you had weird signals before? Yeah. Last I saw the vehicle. I'm sure, Yates said. It's nothing. See? See, right there. Sandy pointed to the screen. The image looked like an airport scanner x-ray of a house, showing the frame of the house, the shape of furniture. Sandy pointed to an oval blue spot located in the upper bedroom. It changed shapes like a red blood cell moving through the veins. It was there, and then it wasn't. There! She pointed when the shape was down in the kitchen. It moved fast and disappeared. That doesn't look like a kid, said Riggs. No, you would see the human shape. That looks like an orb. Yates pulled the keyboard forward. Come on, come on, he beckoned. Where are you? There, Riggs said, and there. The shape appeared upstairs, then instantly down. Then it showed up across the home, and that was when Yates locked in on it. Got it. What is it? Riggs asked. It's coming up ten kilograms. Twenty-two pounds? Is it a bowling ball? Riggs guessed. Yates clicked hard on the keys when it popped up on the second floor. A bowling ball that not only defies all logic, but is smaller upstairs? It got smaller? Sandy asked. Could it be more than one? Riggs asked. Like, maybe it's not jumping around, but two or three of them too small to be caught on scanner. Fuck, Yates said. Fuck, I know what they are. He backed up. We have to go. Sandy, get a hold of them. Tell them not to go in that house. Two beeps rang out. Sandy looked up. Too late. They're there. Keep trying, Yates ordered. He raced out of the room, stopping at a tall, narrow closet in the hall. Hurriedly, he opened it and pulled out two automatic rifles, handing one to Riggs. We're shooting. What are they? Growlers, Yates answered and rushed out. And they are... dogs. Hear me out, Fred said as they stood on the porch of the number four house. Maybe it's not a good idea to turn off our radios. They keep calling us like they don't trust us using the equipment. What if it's something important and need to find us? Fred asked. She pointed to his bracelet. They can find us. Riggs said to wait. Riggs is just bored, Rachel said. They're skipping buildings and just marking an E on them. No wonder the Golden Cavalry got a town done in four days. They didn't check anything. I don't trust the system. We would have skipped two houses if we listened to Sandy when she said there were no stiffs in there. Well, there weren't. Still, you never know. She reached for the door. We check it out anyhow. They stepped inside. In the almost year he had been an eliminator, Riggs had never heard of or even seen a dog. He figured the dead feasted on them. Are you sure? he asked Yates. Positive. This is the first time they showed up on the system. They're too fast to pick up. They're just a pack of dogs? Rabid? No. They're dead. Infected. Bit by stiffs and turned. They're faster and more dangerous than even the kids. Shit. So you have been up against them. Only twice in a town. Usually they're out on the road. We learn fast just to shoot them. They aren't easy to take down. They leap really high and they're on you before you know it. 
No one in Division had ever mentioned them, Riggs said. I would think it would be an important safety tip. Division One may not have them. The weather is colder farther north. Who knows, but you're in Division Two. We have them, and they're hunters. You don't get them, they track you. That's just sick. Tell me about it. Yates stopped when they arrived at the end of the street. Fourth house, he pointed. They have to be in there. We should call out for them. Riggs took a breath. Rick! Yates shot his hand over Riggs's mouth. No, no noise. We don't want to call the growlers. Let's just go. Rachel ran her fingers over the waist-high table behind the sofa. Not even dusty. Look at this floor. How'd they get the hardware so shiny? Not wax. Wax builds up. But it was olive oil. Never heard of that. Works really well. This floor is beautiful. Doesn't even look like the sweep team came in. Okay, up or down? I'll take up. Fred immediately went to the stairs and, barbecue fork extended, made his way up. Man, this is such a nice little house. The apocalypse. And my house wasn't this clean. Rachel walked through the living room into the dining room. The layout was so similar to so many other houses she and Casper had gone into. For as clean as the house was, there was a sour smell to it. Somewhere in a room, there had to be a stiff. She pulled out her gladius. When she withdrew it, her eyes lifted to the ceiling when she heard not only a thump, but what sounded like running. Fred? Rach! He cried out. Get out of the... Slam. She heard a door shut. Fred? Are you all right? She could hear him yelling something. It was muffled. She turned, deciding to go check on him when she heard the footsteps on the stairs and a hurried thump, thump, thump. Fred! She stepped from the dining room. Did you fall down the... She wasn't sure what it was lying on the floor at the base of the stairs, but she knew she had never seen anything like it. It looked like a German shepherd, but half bald, half covered with matted fur. Its hind legs were clearly rotted. Flies buzzed around it. It rolled over quickly, snarling almost a demonic-sounding growl. Rachel knew she couldn't run forward, only back. She raised her gladius and drew her honing rod. The animal got on its feet. Its paw slid on the floor as he charged her way, faster than anything had ever come for her. She backed up, knowing she couldn't turn her back. Then the animal leapt in the air, lunging for her. It was inches from her face, so close she could smell how rotten it was, see the black tar substance dripping from its jaws. It was right there. No time to be scared or even raise her weapons fully when the single gunshot sent the beast flying sideways and then to the ground. Still holding her breath, Rachel saw Yates standing there. Move! Yates ordered. Before Rachel could say what, he fired again. He was so close, the firing of the weapon caused a loud and painful ringing in her ears. She turned to see another dog behind her. Rachel closed her eyes tightly, grabbing her ear. Fred! Where's Fred? She couldn't hear anything. She saw Yates look like he was yelling for Riggs. She didn't need to hear him to know where he was, because Riggs fired at another dead dog that came barreling down the stairs. Yates stormed away and to the stairs. As Riggs walked up to her, Rachel raised her eyes and saw Fred. She sighed in relief. Riggs placed his hands on Rachel's shoulders. His voice was buried beneath the ringing. You okay? he asked. Rachel nodded. Not wanting to admit it, Rachel was in a state of shock. She stared down to the carcasses of the animals. She thought she had seen it all. Apparently not. Chapter 20 Silence. He didn't move, but he was breathing. Yates sat stiff and upright on the leather chair in the navigation room. His elbows rested on the arms, and his forefingers formed a triangle, pressed to his nose, as he stared at the screens. Barry knocked on the open doorway. Are you all right? Yes, I am. Just watching. We made those survivor pizzas. They're ready. I'll be there in a minute. Are you seeing anything? I don't know. It's strange, Yates said. Blips here and there. I don't know if it's the rain or more growlers, just strange activity going on. Near us? No, that's a good thing. But I do think it's best we don't go outside tonight or light a fire. Just be safe and stay in the vehicles. You think there are more out there? I don't think we can take a chance. Maybe I'm being overcautious. They run in packs of six or more, which makes them dangerous. Like the dead in packs of six or more. Exactly. 
I'm just waiting until I go a few more minutes without seeing anything, and then I'll be more confident. Well, then we'll save you food. Keep me posted. Yates only nodded. Is he joining us? Riggs asked when Barry returned to the living area in the EPEV. He'll be in. He's just making sure it's all clear. This is unreal, Rachel said. Even the food they get is better. Survival pizza food. And it's not bad. Granted, this was his vehicle, but I think Command gave him what he wanted. She lifted a glass. They have real glasses. I think, Sandy said. This is all his. We had real glasses, Fred said. Our air conditioning didn't work like this. It's a nice night out there, Barry said. But this is a good place to hang out. Tell me again, Rachel said, why we couldn't secure a house. Riggs shook his head. Al didn't feel it was safe. Rachel laughed. Maybe he's afraid we'll leave him like his team. Oh, stop, Sandy said. He's concerned about the growlers. What a name, Fred commented. Those things, he whistled. I've heard about them, but never seen them. I can't believe you outran them, Rachel said. Locked myself right in the bathroom. Fred ate his pizza. Al was determined when he came back here, Sandy told them. Sat right at the controls and went through things with me again. All these things are messed up, Rachel said. I felt like I was in the movie I Am Legend with how vicious and fast they were. Yeah, Fred said. They did remind me of those. Even I saw that movie, Riggs added. I agree. I wonder what other animals turned, Rachel stated. Good news, Yates announced as he walked in. I see no more movement out there. Then it's safe, Riggs asked. I think so, but hold on to the trackers just in case. Keep one in your RV. I'd rather be in a house, Rachel said. There were some not even touched. Even the last house I was in was immaculate. Well, until the killer dogs were splattered. You think this is funny? Yates asked her. Your attitude hasn't changed. And should it? Yes, you should be concerned. Well, I'm not. Then you have issues, Yates said. You did not take today seriously when you refused to follow orders. You aren't the lead of my team, Rachel argued. But he is, Yates pointed to Riggs. And you ignored him. You shut off your radio when you knew damn well we could warn you. About stiffs. Maybe some of us don't want to rely on your pampered technology to do the fight because there's going to come a time when you aren't going to have it and you won't know what to do. Like you today? You froze. Your arrogance... Rachel stood up. My arrogance? Your arrogance put your life in danger. Oh, is this about you saving me? I thanked you once. I don't believe you did. Rachel spun. Riggs? Riggs lifted his hands in surrender. Leave me out of it. No, you were there. You heard me thank him. I think you did. She didn't, and you know it, Yates blasted. All bow to the all-knowing and tough chick, Rachel. Well, you proved today when you put everyone's life in danger that you aren't at all. I will not have it out with you here, outside, Rachel pointed. Rachel, Fred spoke up. I don't think you should physically fight him. Oh, I'm not physically fighting him, but we will have it out. Yates folded his arms. I'm not going out there. That's right. You're scared because you're ten feet away from your technology. Fine. Yates reached down, grabbed a slice of pizza from the table, and stormed out the door. Rachel followed. He was already eating his pizza when she approached. You want to tell me what this is about? Yates asked. Who the hell do you think you are to talk to me like that? Oh! He backed up with hands out in a fake dramatic fashion. I'm sorry no one has ever been honest with you. You call me arrogant? You're arrogant, yes. And you're a self-righteous, privileged piece of shit. You think you know it all, and it's no wonder your team just up and left you. You had no right to talk to me like that in front of my team, my friends. Well, maybe your team needs to talk to you instead of always letting you get your way. How can you make that declaration after one day? Rachel asked. You don't know what I've done, what I've been through, and none of that matters, Yates yelled. Not when you put everyone in danger because you don't follow orders. They should just send you home. How about they replace me with you? Rachel said sarcastically. They would get the better deal on that one. Inside the EPEV, Riggs, Barry, Sandy, and Fred sat quietly. They said nothing, not a word, as quiet as children listening to parents fighting in another room. The loud voices of Rachel and Yates carried to them. Some of the exchanges had merit. Some were just childish name-calling. It went on for a good ten minutes, 
Then it became quiet. Riggs looked at his watch, then waited for it to start again. He stood up. He paced for a few minutes. I think they're done. It's been a good five minutes or so. I think they stopped too, said Sandy. Give them a couple minutes, Barry said. They may be talking quietly now. Yeah. Riggs looked again at his watch. Maybe, Fred said with a snicker. Maybe all that fighting stirred something, and they realized they have this hidden passion for each other, and they're both like, knock me down and steal my teeth. What's happening here? Riggs slowly turned and looked at him. Never heard of that one? Fred asked. All I'm saying is maybe they turned that fighting into something else. They say there's a thin line between love and hate. Still, Riggs just stared. Fred shrugged. She did call him hot. That's it. Riggs flew for the door and went out. Rach! Neither of them were outside the door. He walked to the end of the EPEV. Rach? He called out. He turned to head to his own RV when Barry stepped out. Jeremiah, everything okay? Riggs didn't answer. He opened up the RV door and yelled inside. Rach! What's going on? Barry asked. Riggs walked backward, then in circles. He ran to the edge of the EPEV and looked, then back to the other RV, repeating his search. Jeremiah, stop! Barry reached out to him. What's going on? Where are they? I don't know, Riggs said. They're gone. It wasn't a necessary worry or panic on the part of Riggs. Rachel and Yates were truly nowhere to be seen. Chapter 21 Connections Riggs didn't hesitate, nor listen to anyone that tried to talk to him. He went into Yates's rifle storage and grabbed one. Mumbling something about night vision, he rushed back over to his own RV. Jeremiah, listen to me, Barry said. You're panicking. I'm not panicking. I'm very concerned. They could have gone for a walk. No, they didn't. Yates was way too worried about the growlers. Riggs closed the closet. Sandy came into the RV. Riggs, stop, okay? You aren't thinking. I am thinking. I have to find them. No, Riggs, you are not thinking clearly. Because I'm a little emotional? Riggs asked. Is that why? No. Sandy shook her head and spoke calmly. Because you're forgetting how easy it is to find them. Because you're forgetting how easy it is to find them. Because we get worried and concerned. Let's locate them. Inside the EPEV navigation room, Sandy worked like a pro. She turned on the monitor that Yates had used to check on his own men. With Riggs, Barry, and Fred behind her, they didn't have to wait long. As soon as the screen came on, it beeped seven times, indicating the tracking bracelets, five from the Golden Cavalry and the other two belonging to Rachel and Yates. Both sending heat signatures, Sandy said. They're alive. Where in town are they walking that fast? Fred asked. They're just zipping by. They aren't walking, Sandy replied. They're far out of town, moving west on Interstate 40 at a steady 80 miles an hour. She turned her chair and looked to Riggs. Someone has them. Riggs slammed his hand. Okay, buckle down. We pick a vehicle. I say this one. It has a lot more bells and whistles. And what? Barry asked. Go after them? Yes. No. Neither of these vehicles are designed to go that fast. They're miles ahead of us, and even if we left right now, we won't catch them, and we don't know what we're up against. We do, however, Sandy said, have an idea where they might be going. Where? Riggs asked. To the other bracelets, Sandy pointed. Looks like they're headed directly to Amarillo. It can't be a coincidence. We know where they're going, Barry said. We take this and use it to survey and see what we're up against. They already have five eliminators. Unless... Fred said. The five eliminators are behind this, and his team is looking for him. Kind of a big, elaborate scheme, don't you think? Fred shrugged. Who knows? They would have taken him and this vehicle, Barry said. So we go anyhow, Riggs said. Head that way. Yes, Barry nodded. But first, Sandy said, reaching to her left. She opened a small shoebox-sized cupboard, exposing a white phone. Call command. Does that work? Al said it did. It's a satellite phone. Number's in there, Sandy said. Call Liz. Riggs grabbed the phone. Center City, West Virginia. It had been a long day for Liz, meeting with coordinators to come up with a strategy to clean and clear towns again. 
Even if they were never used for population, the goal was to eliminate all the walking dead. She grew frustrated because she hadn't heard anything about a cure. About as successful as the remaining scientists could come was an antiviral that stopped the virus in the bloodstream after a bite or scratch, but only if the site of the injury was removed. There was a good portion of the population not immune and those who were carriers, and she wanted to focus on them. As fun as Dr. Stevens' make-a-zombie-useful research was, it wasn't as needed as a cure. Finally, back in her room, Liz kicked off her shoes, poured a nightcap, and sat on the sofa. She pulled her feet up and propped a pillow behind her head. She hadn't slept in a real bed since she lost her family. Exhaling, using a relaxation technique, the knock on her door at midnight told her something was wrong. "'Madam President!' the woman called out from the other side. "'Claire, come in,' Liz said. The door opened. "'I'm sorry to bother you. We got a call from Commander Riggs of the Flaming Saffrons.' Liz sat up all the way. "'Riggs never calls. We know, and he was calling from the EPEV satellite system. They retrieved it? Apparently so. We had no idea. What about the crew?' Claire shook her head. "'We don't know. All we know was Riggs said he needed to speak with you, Stat, and on the way here we lost him. We're trying to get him back now.' "'Good. Good. Something has to be wrong. He didn't mention anything at all? No. Just that he needed to talk to you. As soon as we make connection, I'll come and get you. I'm not taking a chance on losing that call again.' Liz downed her nightcap. "'They're the first team I sent back out. If they're calling, there's trouble.' She walked to the door. "'Wait.' If we make connection to the EPEV, it means it's back online. Did we fire that up, see where they are? Working on it now. Liz walked out her door with Claire behind her. Until we hear back, let's piece together as much information as we can. Can we go faster? Riggs asked. No, Barry said. I feel like I'm driving in a black hole. It's dark out here. Absolutely not. Sandy came from the back. They're still holding steady. Where are they now? Riggs asked Sandy. They're 56 miles ahead of us. They gain two miles every minute, Sandy replied. Are their signals still strong? Strange, Sandy said. I don't have a heartbeat for Rachel because she has hers in her pocket. However, Al's is remarkably steady and slow. Like he's relaxed? Yes. Damn it. Language, Barry yelled from the front. Why hasn't Center City called us back? Riggs asked. Maybe if we stop, Fred suggested. We can't stop. We can't have them gain any more ground. And when we catch them, Fred asked, we don't know how many people there are. They're moving so we can't scan for thermals. Maybe. If we stop, command can connect with us. We may be darting in and out of range. I don't know how satellite systems work. Riggs bit his bottom lip and turned his head. Bear, let's... Let's stop for a moment. Barry slowed down, pulling over a little until the EPEV stopped. Why are we stopping? I want to see if... The phone rang. Riggs looked at Fred, who smiled. Then he bolted for the phone on the table. This is Riggs, he answered. Riggs, this is Liz, she said. Thank God. Rachel and Aldrich Yates are gone. They were outside arguing. The next thing we know, they're silent and gone. Traveling west at 80 miles an hour. We connected to the EPEV system. It seems as if they're headed to the other five members of the Golden Cavalry. It looks that way to us as well. My plan is to get there, utilize the toys on the EPEV, locate them, and pull a rescue. Listen, Riggs, while we were trying to call you back, we used our time wisely. I reached out to division commanders. I wanted to know if they knew or heard anything. More so, I wanted to confirm rumors. Of? Riggs asked. Survivor City's gone rogue. You mean the ones not overrun with infection? Riggs asked with a hint of sarcasm. But is Amarillo a Survivor City? No, it's a secession territory. How can a town secede from a country that really isn't a country anymore? Riggs... We are, like it or not. We may not be the same, but we are trying to rebuild. We have troops out there, teams, leadership hubs like St. Louis, Oklahoma City, Seattle. They didn't secede. They gathered people from other survivor cities and took over there. Entering Amarillo would be like, how did General Lacey put it? Walking into your worst Mad Max nightmare. Personally, I think it's overstated, but we don't know and we can't take a chance. So we just let them take people? Besides the Golden Cavalry, has any other Eliminator been reported missing? Several. They were assumed MIA, Liz replied. Riggs paced. I can't... I can't just turn the other cheek. I'm not asking you to. I'm asking you not to go in there, 
Find an area outside of Amarillo. Wait. I have teams that will meet you. Reinforcements. They will leave at first light. Wait for them. What if... What if we try to reach out to whoever the leader is? Riggs asked. No negotiating, Riggs. We get our people out, then we take them out. Keep in touch if you hear anything. I will. Riggs hung up and looked at the faces, staring. What's going on? Barry asked. She wants us to get within an hour of Amarillo and wait for reinforcements. They... They want to get Rachel and whoever else they have and then take them out. Apparently, they went rogue, gathered people, and set up a homestead. And she wants to take them out? All of them? Barry asked. I guess. I mean, they're taking people against their will, so they aren't all that good. Maybe, Fred suggested. They're taking eliminators to have them help. If they set up their own town, they need protection. Riggs shook his head. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. Nothing makes sense. I do know this. We will utilize whatever crazy things this $14 million steel tube can do to get Rachel back. What about Yates? asked Barry. Um, I guess him, too. Riggs noticed Fred hurriedly getting up and going to the back. Where are you going? Give me a second, Fred replied. He returned with a binder. You want to utilize the tools on this thing? He sat down on the couch and placed the binder on the table. Let's find out what all this thing can do. He flipped it open. It comes with an instruction manual? Riggs asked. Barry placed his hand on Riggs's shoulder. I'm as upset about Rachel as you, but our girl can handle herself. She won't go down without a fight. I really believe she will be fine. We'll get her back. I hope you're right. I mean, it's insane. Why systematically kidnap people in a dead-ridden world? Riggs said. It doesn't make sense. What reason could they have? Mumbling, Fred spoke up. Food? Riggs hurriedly looked at him. Or not. He flipped another page in the book. Chapter 22 Flag March 12th, Day 327 Amarillo, Texas Jeremiah, this is crazy! Barry grabbed a hold of the bag he loaded. She said to wait one hour outside of town for reinforcements. We're only 20 miles. That's a lot closer. And they haven't moved, Bear, not for hours. We don't know if they're hurt or what. What if they take you, too? Then they take me, Riggs shrugged. Fred walked in the side door of the EPEV. Okay, I got it on the Saffron RV. You have to be close. I mean, right at wherever their roadblock is. They won't see it, but take the key so they can't move it. I highly doubt they'll even suspect anything high-tech. What about the communication thing you found? All right, so... Fred handed him what looked like an American flag pin. Once in town, you can talk. We'll hear you. But the only way we can respond acknowledgement is to buzz this pin. Buzz it? Riggs asked. From what I read, it's like one of those hand buzzer things we had as kids. Makes you think it's a shock, but it's actually a vibration. Give me a second with you in the back. I'll set it up. I don't like this, Jeremiah. I don't like this one bit, Barry said. We should wait for Liz. I'm one man driving a beat-up old RV. I'm going unarmed. I'm not a threat. You told me Liz was informed it's like the worst of a Mad Max world. Barry, I think that's an over-exaggeration. But... Riggs squeezed his arm. Even the Mad Max tribes had a hierarchy. They will, too. I have to find it. They didn't take them for the fun of it. They want something. I just need to find out what it is. He walked to the back with Fred. The thud against her foot caused Rachel to nearly topple forward as she awoke. She lifted her head not only to excruciating neck pain, but also the worst headache she could remember having. She was in the back of a vehicle, more than likely a van. It was dark, except for a little light that came through the back door windows. Her hands were tied in front of her, and when she focused, she saw Yates across from her. I thought you were dead, said Yates. I had to kick you. I wish you were dead at this moment. My head. We need water. It's the tranquilizer. They hit us with a dart. How do you know? she asked. I saw it hit your neck, then I blacked out. Who the hell would do this? Rachel asked. I mean, like, there isn't enough shit happening with the dead rising, and now somebody thinks, oh, let's add abduction to it. You know the way it works, Rachel. Yates spoke with a raspy whine. The bad guys, other than the apocalypse, even, there have to be antagonists. You're right. Elements again. Always elements, Yates said. Me and my team used to talk about them. The main team formula, the big event formula. 
Always the same thing. And we had a couple big events, so they hold true, Yates said. What about the elements on abduction storylines? Rachel asked. I think they follow the same formula for any movie or show, even if it is an apocalypse. Without a doubt. One or two people get taken, Yates said. Us. The hero or leader formulates a plan. He tries to initiate. It fails, and the rest of the group joins in and saves the day. I'm not sure we have a big enough group for that, Rachel commented. We don't even know what or how many we're dealing with. All I know is, to take people in the middle of the night, I'm betting there's a bunch of barbarians. The back doors to the van opened, blasting in blinding sunlight. Two men stood there. One tossed a bottle of water to Rachel and then to Yates. Drink. You need it. The bottle landed on the floor, and Rachel reached down for it. It wasn't an easy task to unscrew the bottle with bound hands, but Rachel did without hesitation and gulped the water until it hurt her chest. Let's go, the one man said, grabbing onto her and nearly dragging her out of the van. Rachel stumbled some, blinking her eyes rapidly to clear the watering and burning from the bright sun. This way, he said. Where are we going? Yates asked. Why does it matter? Be happy you're out of the van. Rachel heard it. Laughter. But it wasn't twisted or demented. It was joyful. Laughter that sounded playful. She looked to the right as they led her across the street. She saw two young boys running with a ball. A woman stood watching. She stopped the boys and lifted her eyes to Rachel. It didn't make sense. Yates's barbarian theory was out the window. There were children, women, and what looked like an outdoor market. Something was off. Something was wrong. She and Yates were being escorted like common criminals. Obviously, to their captors, they had committed some crime. She was anxious to find out what it was. Keep your heart rate steady, Riggs, Sandy told him over the radio. They're going to know you're up to something the second they see you. Sorry, Riggs said. I'm trying. I'm pulling up now. He slowed down as he approached a roadblock. It consisted of two trucks and armed men. We got you, replied Fred. Can you get a little closer? Riggs inched forward. How's that? Six men out front, Fred asked. Yep, all armed. We got them. You're good. Now listen, Fred said. We have you, but this is the last of the radio chatter. Keep talking. We'll buzz once if we're hearing and all is good. Twice if we need more info. Three times if you're in danger. Got it? Sounds complicated. You'll be fine. Just get them back. I'll try. Riggs set down the radio, shut off the RV, put the keys in his left front pocket. Not in his right. His tracker was there. He opened the door, raised his hands, and walked to the men standing at the roadblock just before town. They didn't move at first. They just watched him. Then, as he drew closer, every one of the men aimed their weapons. I'm not armed, said Riggs. I'm not armed. Look at this, one of the men said. We have an eliminator coming to our town. Oh, said another, I'm feeling safe. They all laughed. Can I lower my hands? Riggs asked. The man out front nodded. What do you need? I'm not here for trouble. I'm alone. I need to speak to your leader. The front man laughed, joking. Oh, take me to your leader, like some sort of alien. Hey, Riggs snapped. I'm not fucking around. I want to speak to someone in charge. I believe you have a member of my team, and I want her... On his last word, Riggs nearly shouted, and his body jolted in surprise, and his head twitched when he felt it. It wasn't a buzz. It was a double shock of electricity. Back! Back! Spitting the last word out due to his surprise. The hell is wrong with you? Main guy asked. You got that Tourette's? Something like that. Main front guy stared at Riggs for a second, then stepped back, grabbing a radio. He moved back another twenty feet out of ear range. Riggs tried to hear, but couldn't. Nice RV, one of them joked. What, you the bottom of the eliminator barrel? Main front guy returned. Len, check the RV or whatever that is. Make sure no one's in there. The man called Len hurried to the RV. I'm alone, Riggs said. We're just going to double check to make sure. After a minute, Len came from the RV and walked to the roadblock. Empty. No one in there. Main front guy nodded. All right. Head on in. You'll go about three blocks. You won't be able to miss the guys waiting for you. Just go on in? Riggs asked, confused. Yep. Welcome to Amarillo, land of the free. Riggs didn't trust it. 
In fact, he walked backwards nearly all the way to the RV, never really taking his eyes off the men at the roadblock. He got inside the RV and started it. I'm not lifting the radio again, Riggs said, but I will in a minute. I'm back in the RV. His response was another jolt. Damn it, Riggs cursed. He slowly pulled the RV forward and they removed the roadblock. Then Riggs drove through. A part of him still didn't trust what was happening. It seemed too easy. Once out of their eyesight, he lifted the radio. Did you guys hear the exchange? We did, Fred replied. Did you feel the buzz? Yeah, try not to do that too much. It hurts. Sorry about that, Fred said. But I needed to keep you in line. However, I am getting a clean look at the town. Not all, but most. I just drove through the roadblock, Riggs said. I'm in. Even better. Chapter 23 Trade-Off They had untied their hands once they were in the principal's office, and that's exactly what it was. They had been brought into a school, led down a hallway into the school office. There was something sad about the office. Pictures made by children still graced the walls. It made Rachel remember how many died from not only the virus, but the after-effects of those infected. Rachel and Yates sat in two chairs before a desk, nearly finished bottles of water in their hands. They knew there was an armed guard outside, and another stood just inside the door. This is taking me back, said Rachel. She finished the last of her water. What do you mean? Being in the principal's office, waiting for my dad to get me. Somehow it doesn't surprise me that you were a juvenile delinquent. And you were never in trouble? she asked. Never. How's your head? A little better. I need more water. Yates shook the empty bottle. Yeah, me too. Why do you think they took us? Oh, obviously they want something. This is in your division, Rachel said. Is this a survivor city? I think it's a little different than that. I heard rumors. He stopped talking when the door opened. The man who walked in didn't look like any principal Rachel had seen before. He looked more like the stereotypical truck driver. His hair was shaggy, having long outgrown a shortcut at one time. He wore glasses and had a beard which, while not long, was unruly. He dressed in a t-shirt and jeans and placed two bottles of water on the desk. You need that, he said. Rehydrate. I'm Jeff Stafford. You can call me Stafford. Listen, fucker, Rachel said. As much as I appreciate the hospitality and water, why in the hell did you drug us and take us anyways? Fasty? Um... I'll get to the why we took you in a second. We drugged you because one-on-one, -on -one, you eliminators can be quite the fighters. I've lost men. Resorting to tranquilizers was safer. And as for the reason of taking you, we take eliminators to, well, eliminate. Why don't you just ask? Rachel questioned. You think it's that easy? Pick up a phone and say, hey, send in the eliminators. We have a Zed problem on our hands. You think you guys will come running? Nah, doesn't happen that way. You guys all have your little agenda and schedule, all run by President Dixon. Dixon's dead, Rachel said. What? Yates looked at her. Dixon's dead? I swore we told you. No, you left that out. No, I think you weren't listening. Stop! Stafford's hand waved about. Another thing we learned. Mouths of the Eliminators run better than their skill set when we set you up with Zed Game. What are you talking about? asked Yates. He's dissing the Eliminators, Rachel said. Yet he has us and wants us to kill his Zed problem. Something like that, Stafford said calmly. Like I said, you guys fold. Maybe it's all the pampering you get. The luxury home on wheels. Rachel laughed. Obviously you haven't seen ours. He ignored her comment. Medicine when you need it. Weapons, food, water, you name it. You get it all while the rest of the country starves and suffers. First, Rachel said. The rest of the country isn't starving. A lot of people are in good places now. Maybe it just isn't happening fast enough for you. There are 19,504 registered towns or cities in this country. 126 eliminators, 300 sweep team members, and 62 on cleanup teams. We can only do so much so fast. You keep eliminating eliminators, you'll have more than a few dead at your door. You have a problem with it? Join the fucking cause and do things right. That's the problem. She looked at Yates. No one wants to do the dirty work. As impressed as I am with your stats, said Stafford, I have no intention of joining the cause. I will do what I need for the people here. He looked at Yates and exhaled. Aldrich Yates. 
I can't believe you're finally sitting here before me. Do you know how long I've waited for this? Excuse me, do I know you? Yates asked. No, but I know you. Yates shifted his eyes. I know you're wearing an Eliminator's tracking device, one of my team's. Yep, Stafford replied. Branson, Barrowman, Billman, Yates said. That's it, it was his. You need to know that team of yours did not give up any information when we took them. Oh! Yates turned to Rachel. I told you they did not leave me. I told you. I was right. You were right, Rachel said. But he just used the word was when talking about Billman. I did, Stafford said. He, unfortunately, like the others, didn't meet the challenge. It had a lot to do with reliance on the EPEB, I'm sure of it. Rachel nodded. Yep, they lose their edge. Exactly, Stafford replied. And we were pretty much resigned to the fact we weren't getting Aldridge here and didn't care because we took his EPEB and team. We stopped it for a few days to meet other new people, and he... He looked at Yates. Shut that shit down, which told us he wasn't giving up. I knew eventually he'd find it, get it running, and follow the track, so we watched. Didn't expect him to pick up friends. That was unexpected, and I'm working on that now. But we got him, and we'll get the EPEV, too. Why do you want me so bad? What in the world did I ever do to you? Yeah, we've been chasing your team around since Stoneman Bluff. Remember? Survivor City about 60 miles north of here? Stafford asked. You and your team took that fancy high-tech killing machine and wiped that entire place clean with headshots. Every single person in that Survivor City. Every person, including my wife and two daughters, who were waiting there for me to get this place up and running. That Survivor City turned, Yates argued. They were not immune. They were carriers. An outbreak went wild. I have seen that happen, said Rachel. All it takes is one and they all turn. And my auto system, Yates said only took down the dead. Anyone not showing infection, we pulled and shot everyone else, Stafford said. My wife hadn't turned. Neither had my girls. I saw their bodies. Then if they hadn't turned, they were sick. Did you see any signs of that? Yates asked. Doesn't matter. They were alive when they were shot. They were infected, and you put them down like sick animals. What would you have us do? Yates argued strongly. Let them suffer and turn? It wasn't your call. And where the hell were you? Yates asked. If you were so concerned about your family, they should have been by your side. Stafford took a deep nostril breath. Normally, I would deck you, but I have other plans. Like? There was a knock at the door, and Stafford paused the conversation. The door opened a little, and another man poked his head in. He here? Stafford asked. Yep. Send him in. The door opened wider, and Riggs walked in. Rach! He immediately rushed to her. Rachel stood up and accepted his embrace. You all right? Riggs asked. Yeah. Other than hung over from a tranquilizer, I'm fine. Yates? Riggs asked. I'm fine. Yates raised his eyes. See, Rach? You called it. Principal's office. The parents arrive. I'm not going to piss around, Riggs said. You obviously took them for a reason. What do you want? Yates raised his hand. You may want to rethink that thinking... Apparently, he's been taking eliminators for a while, and he has not released demands yet. I told you, I took eliminators to eliminate, Stafford said. I can't help it if they get killed in the process, except your team. The Golden Boys were retribution for my family. Now, though, it's become clear what we need. And that is, Riggs asked. Before I answer that question, oh my God, Rachel, Yates said. He falls right into the bad guy element, always a speech. Stafford ignored the comment, remaining unnervingly rational. We want what is given to other starter cities. The food rations, starter greenhouses, medical supplies, but we also want Ramavarin. We have a doctor here that has it working like a vaccine for those not immune. We need more. We wanted eliminators, but you know what? The EPEV will handle all the protection we need. Have you seen what that son of a bitch can do? And I'm sure we only saw the tip of the iceberg. Riggs nodded. You know what? If you would have found a way to ask for these things earlier, ask to be made a survivor city, I know for a fact they would have given you what you needed. But you kidnapped eliminators. Where are the ones you took? They didn't meet the challenge, so they're gone. Yates added. Dead, in case you didn't get his meaning. He has no problem passing out my team's tracking devices. It's going to be a hard putt to give you anything, Riggs said. And the EPEV. 
Even if I wanted to roll it right in here, I can't begin to tell you anything that thing does besides track those bracelets. Al here won't give that up. And right now it's surrounded by about 150 United States soldiers. Are you trying to strong-arm me, Riggs? Stafford asked. No, I'm stating facts, Riggs replied. I'll try to get what you need. So here's the deal, Stafford said. I want him dead, he pointed to Yates. I also know how smart he is. I don't think you know how smart this man is. If anyone could bring this world back to tech speed, he can. Again, I want him dead. So that puts me in a conundrum. Since I don't want to directly kill him, that would be bad for us if there really are over a hundred well-trained soldiers in the EPEV out there. I'm going to give him a chance to fight for his life. He's a golden boy eliminator, right? He gets the same chance that every other Eliminator did here. He clears out our little Zed problem that we've contained out back. We'll let him have his manual weapons, not his fancy tech. He beats the challenge. He walks. Hopefully we can talk about what this town needs. If he doesn't, we get the EPEV. Period. That alone is enough power to bargain with. Riggs asked with a slight chuckle, Why would we do that? He's going to agree to it, aren't you, Mr. Yates? asked Stafford. I mean, if you're confident in your skills, why not take that gamble? That Epev is his child. Just like me or anyone else would put our life on the line for our baby, so will he. Yates looked left to right, from Riggs to Stafford. You know what I am? I'm confident. I'll meet your Zed or whatever you call them challenge. Then I'll walk out, I'll get my Epev, and maybe, if I'm nice, I won't destroy your whole town. Just you. But I want two things. That we are the last eliminators you take, and I want a mediator here. Someone to make sure you hold up your end of the bargain. I think it's only fair to tell you it is a two-part challenge. Beat the first part, you have to beat the second with your manual weapons. No guns. Deal. Okay, deal. Stafford held out his hand. Yates reluctantly shook it. I want that EPEV bad. Oh, yeah. Stafford snapped his fingers. One more thing. Your team members never made it past the first one. I'm not them, Yates said confidently. Yeah, but we sent them in as pairs. You'll be all alone, Stafford said. And you? He looked at Rachel. You can go. What do you mean? Rachel asked. You're a smart woman. I can't believe you just asked that. You can go. I have no qualms with you. You're a victim of circumstance. Wrong place at the wrong time. Go with Riggs. That's my sign of good faith. Was there really any bargaining? Riggs asked. I mean, you have him. It was never your intention to do anything else but put him in that challenge to die. Not true, Stafford said. I was going to keep taking eliminators. I'm not now. And he's not going to die if he's as good as he says he is. Him going in alone when pairs couldn't do it? Riggs asked. It's a death sentence. You have perfect bargaining power right here, right now, by letting him live. You yourself pretty much said I don't have a chance of getting anything. And, Stafford lifted his hand, what can I say? Either way, he was going in there. You're right. Riggs nodded. And you're just going to let her walk out with me. I said it. I meant it. Rachel looked at Riggs, then kissed him on the cheek, keeping her lips close to his ear. Thank you for trying. Now you know what you need to do when you leave. What? Riggs asked, confused. Rachel sat back down. Rach, what are you doing? Riggs asked. Well, I stood there and listened to this whole exchange, and I didn't hear anywhere in the deal that Yates had to fight alone, just that he was stuck fighting alone. Now he isn't. You're insane, Yates told her. Leave. Nope. Call it my thank you payback for yesterday. No amount of gratitude is worth this sacrifice. Please. Rachel waved out her hand. We're good. I have no problem with it, said Stafford. If you win the challenge, you can still walk. In fact, any time you change your mind, you can walk. I'm good. Rachel folded her arms. If that's the case, Riggs said. Rach, you go, I'll stay. No, Rach told him. Hands on, no guns. You know I'm the better one, you know it. Other than Casper, I'm his best chance. Go back. Make sure Casper understands he has to wait it out like we all did for you on the roof of that warehouse. Someone has to go inside and someone has to wait. What a nice speech, Stafford said. Riggs stared at Rachel. He leaned down to her, kissed her on the forehead. 
I'll be out there waiting with Casper. He squeezed her hand and walked to the door. I'll send the weapons back with the mediator. Know this. You don't hold up your end of this bargain, you will not have a town to worry about. Reeks took one more look at Rachel and walked out. Stafford shook his head. Such threats. You must have really watched a lot of bad guy movies, Yates said. You're very cartoonish. Someone will be in to get you soon. Stafford walked to the door and left. After he left, Yates turned to Rachel. I thought Casper was dead. He is. Dead-ish. But that was beside the point. I hope Riggs picked up my meaning. I'm sure he did. I didn't, but I bet he did. Yates tapped his fingers on the arm of the chair for a few seconds. You don't have to do this. I know. So why are you? Because of what we are. I may not like you. You may be an asshole, an arrogant prick. But you're an eliminator, Rachel said. And I will not abandon one of my own. Chapter 24 Standard Ploy I'll explain when I get back, Riggs told Barry. He didn't need to. They had listened to the entire conversation, or had Riggs forgotten that. But if he wanted to share the story and possibly the plan, he had an audience with Liz. She had flown into Oklahoma City Command and drove down with close to 40 troops, and they arrived not five minutes after Riggs pulled out of Amarillo. Barry gave her the brief version. He took the unit with him, Fred explained to Liz. So anything you're saying here is what I saved. Could he have left it? He could have, but something like that would have been easily spotted. On the van, it looked like a walkie-talkie sitting on the dash. He'd have to attach it somewhere. Yates has these portable PTs. I haven't figured out how to use them yet, or I would have slapped one on Riggs. What does PT stand for? Liz asked. Peepin' Tom, Fred answered. That's the official name? Ah, heck no. Fred lifted the manual. Most of these things are called Yates something or other with a number, so as I've been learning and reading about them, I've been renaming them for ease of use. He showed her the homemade tabs he had made for the pages. It's a lot to take in. Learn about those portable PTs, please. They may be important. Barry interjected. We started the count when Riggs arrived. In that area of the school are over 300 people. We're getting men, women, and children. Some animals, not much. Not sure how they're surviving. Fred nodded. I was focused on looking for what they had as far as weapons go. I couldn't find a stockpile. Riggs wasn't there long enough. But most of the men walking the street are heavily armed. Probably in case of the dead, Liz said. And? Fred pointed to the screen. Riggs is back. Oh, good. Good information or not, I want to know why he defied my orders. She left the navigation room and the EPEV. Barry and Fred followed her, stepping outside as well. Riggs walked from his RV and moved as if he were on a mission. Riggs? Liz approached him. What the hell were you doing defying my orders? Riggs stopped cold. A look of surprise ran over him. Trying to get my team back. What? What are you doing here? We have a hostile situation. A hostile town. They're problematic to our cause. How many eliminators have they abducted and killed? I don't know. One's too many, don't you think? And there has to be another way to end this. Now, if you'll excuse me, you and I can talk in a minute. But I need to get Barry ready. Me? Ready? Barry asked. For what? You're going to take the weapons to Rachel and Yates and be the... Whatever Yates called it. The moderator. You are not letting this happen, Barry said. You can't. I heard. She can get killed. They both could. Wait. Liz stepped between them. You told me Riggs went there to get them. They weren't giving up the hostages and had stringent demands. Riggs, is that true? Barry paraphrased it. Yates was a target, some sort of personal vendetta their leader has against him. He took the Golden Cavalry for some reason, something to do with his family. How big is his family if he took other eliminators? He took them to eliminate. I don't know. I don't understand why they just don't take out the dead themselves, but I believe it's a sick game. He said if Yates beats the challenges, he goes free. If he fails and dies, they get the EPEV. We have the EPEV, said Liz. How does he propose to collect it? Who knows? In the wrong hands, this vehicle is a game changer, Liz said. No survivors are safe around these things. I know that. Well, he won't get it. There's no way, Liz said. He needs to come here and we'll stop them. That, Fred spoke up, isn't necessarily true. They all looked at Fred. His mobile EPEV tracker can GPS the EPEV to him, or something like that. Fred replied. 
He told me that. And he has the mobile on him. So technically, when they have his dead body, they have his fingerprints and the means to just bring the vehicle here. Why... Why didn't he do that before? Riggs asked, when he was looking for it. I asked that, Fred replied, because he knew it was in the wrong hands, and instead of calling it back, he disabled it. Once it's disabled, it can't be moved until he enables it. Can we disable this? Riggs asked. I can't. I don't have his fingerprints or eye. He scanned his eye. Damn it. Riggs swore, and after a beat, looked at Barry. What, not yelling at me? No, this situation warrants a bad word, Barry said. Fred, Liz said. I need you to work on the portable PTs and disabling this. She turned to Riggs. What are his odds of beating this challenge? Better now, Riggs said, especially since Rachel decided she couldn't leave him to fight alone. What? Liz asked. Rachel decided? They were letting her go, and when she found out he has to do these challenges alone, she decided to stay. I offered to take her place, but... Barry interjected. There are no guns, only manual weapons, and Rachel has a pretty good skill set. And she wants us to come up with a plan, Riggs said. She talked about Casper, about me doing what they did on the roof at the warehouse when I went inside. Easy, Barry stated. She wants us to take out the threat. Watch her back. Use the EPEV, Riggs said. That's why Barry is going to take her weapons and make sure they hold up their end of the bargain. I'm going to stay behind and learn everything I can. If this thing can do it, I'll find out how. We can conceivably lose Rachel and Yates today, Liz said. That's unacceptable. Can I deliver their demands without the EPEV? Do you know what they want aside from a dead Yates? Riggs nodded. Yes, I do. And yes, with the exception of the EPEV, you can deliver. This is not a risk I want to take. Liz faced Barry. When you go in, you tell them I will meet their demands, with the exception of the EPEV. Try to stop this challenge. I will. Then we'll deal with the town after they accept, Liz said. But if they don't, is there a chance they can beat the challenge? If anyone can, Riggs said. Rachel stands a chance. They're going against the dead. To me, I think once they accumulate so many, they pull in eliminators. They have too many people in their town to have too many dead just waiting for some stupid post-apocalypse gladiator challenge. They could turn on them, so the numbers can't be high or too many. In my experience, though, Liz said, you don't need hundreds to take down two unarmed eliminators. Even the best can't handle more than six at a time. I know, we know our limits. Riggs said. Hopefully they don't have that many. Barry dropped the bag with weapons on the ground before Stafford's feet. Immediately, one of Stafford's men began to search it. They better get all of those. They will, Stafford said. We're just checking for guns. No guns. There's no guns in there. You know... Barry took a deep breath. I have been authorized by President Nazinski to make a deal. She'll give you what you want. The greenhouse starters, the Survivor City perks, antiviral. Just call this off and send our people out. What about the EPEV? Stafford asked. She said no. Stafford shook his head. I want that. I'm sure you do. What? What if I got it for you? Barry asked. I'll steal it. I'll drive it right to your gate. And what would the president think about that? I don't care, said Barry. That woman in there means too much to me. I'll get the damn thing if it means saving her life. No confidence in her? Stafford shook his head. I won't tell her. And as tempting as it sounds, I will pass, because I have no doubt Yates will die. If not on this challenge, he will on the next one. Then I'll get the EPEV. But that was a nice gesture. You're welcome to stay and watch. First challenge will start as soon as I give this to them. He lifted the bag. If you want... You can try to convince her to go. As much as I would like to think that'll work, I know Rachel. She won't, Barry said. Can I ask what exactly this challenge entails? This first one? We put them in the yard with the Zeds we've collected, the ones we trapped. We release them, they put them down. How many? A little bit more than they're used to. And that's it? That's it. If they're good and smart, they'll get them. If not... Stafford shrugged. And the second challenge? It's unbeatable. Stafford, with the weapons bag in hand, walked out. Yates tapped his finger on the pane of glass in the window of the principal's office. That has to be it. Kind of demented. It can't be, Rachel said of the playground. A swing set, bloody slide, and an igloo-shaped red monkey bar set. 
There was blood on the ground and smeared everywhere else. Had to be. They have the dead behind the fence. I see them. How many? Yates asked. It's hard to count. Sixteen. I think sixteen. Yates cringed. What's the record? Well, there was that one eliminator from the wolf gangs that took out eight, but he was bit and scratched by the time it was all said and done. Six is the most I've done one-to-one. -one. Me too. Those are fresh, Rachel said. Not very decomposed. They'll be fast and hard to put down. I know. Okay, Rachel faced him. We have to be smart about this. We don't know if they're going to release a few or all at once. Please, they're releasing them all. Then again, we have to be smart. Sixteen can be a piece of cake. What? Yates laughed. Because we never took on sixteen at a time without guns doesn't mean we can't. Look, the reason this failed for the others is I bet they tried to do the exact same thing the brothers did in the dead show. Season three, mid-season finale? Which was... Yates asked. They put the brothers in a yard with zombies, and then when the dead came for them, they were trying to put them down one at a time, which was easy for them because in the show they had the zombies waiting their turn. That's not the way it'll happen. Hardly. They'll come all at once. And we have to deal with them all at once, Rachel explained. If we take the time to kill them one by one, by the fourth or fifth we will have taken too much time and it'll be over. So we need to bring them down first, old-fashioned way, the way we were originally taught to handle herds. Yates nodded. Yes! We pull them as best we can, distract, slice the pops behind the knee or Achilles' heel, he said excitedly. They'll fall, they always do, like cutting the strings on a puppet. Makes them less deadly and then we can hit the heads. This could work, said Yates, but it will only work if we have our swords. Just a knife will be harder. The door opened and Stafford stepped in. He dropped the bag. Get what you need. We're ready. Rachel looked down to the bag and saw both of Yates's swords sticking out. She looked at Yates and smiled. Like condemned prisoners walking the last bit to an execution, Rachel and Yates walked down the hallway side by side, led by Stafford. Nervous? Yates asked her in a whisper. Nope. Me either. I just wish you wouldn't have taken that shot. I needed the shot. Trust me, it helps. So, Stafford, you said no one ever beat this challenge? We've had teams kill all the dead, but they would have been Zeds by nightfall with all the bites. One man made it to the next challenge. And, Yates asked, he lasted a minute. That's being generous. At the end of the hall, Stafford made a left into the room marked cafeteria. Yates stopped walking when he saw a dozen or so people in there. Spectators? Yep. There are those who like to watch this stuff. It's sick. People can be twisted, Rachel said. Oh my God, Barry! She rushed to him. Hey, you. Barry hugged her. I brought your stuff, and I'm not going to ask you. No, please don't, Rachel told him. I'm staying to help Yates. Yates took in the small cafeteria. The windows were grated over as well as the single exterior door that led to the playground. Are you staying? Absolutely. I want to see you guys prove this asshole wrong. Barry leaned forward to kiss Rachel on the cheek. Were you... were you drinking? I told her not to, Yates said. Let's go. Stafford opened the door. You're on. Yates made eye contact with Barry and nodded to him. Then he and Rachel stepped into the yard. Rachel made the sarcastic comment of, Aren't they brave? when she noticed the four men inside the yard. They wore padded suits, helmets, and, and carried not only side pieces strapped to their waists, but automatic assault rifles as well. You'll appreciate them, Stafford said, if you get bit. Rachel examined the yard. The L-shaped building blocked in half of the playground. The other half was fenced in. It was a big area. Only part of it was concrete. A grassy section was near the fence. In the far corner of the yard were where the dead waited impatiently. They made noise, groaning out, shaking the fence, wanting to get to Rachel and Yates. Next to it was one of the padded suit guys. It reminded her of her training days as an eliminator the dead corralled in a makeshift area, waiting to be released. At the other end of the fence was another fenced-in pen, only that was on the outside of the yard. She didn't see any dead there. With that in mind, she kept her focus on the one she could see. Oh my, Yates said. What? Billman. He's in there, still wearing his eliminator uniform. 
Oh, shit, I'm sorry. I'll let you put him down if I can, said Rachel. Thank you. Get ready, yelled Stafford. Then he wished them luck, as if they were doing some sort of figure skating routine, and he walked to the fence, opened up one of the gates, pulled it closed, and locked it. He stood on the other side, watching from his own front seat view. Rachel readied her weapons, standing side by side with Yates, who held one sword up and the other out. Barry moved to a section of the windows that was a little bit away from everyone else. He didn't want to watch, but he had to. He stood there, feeling so helpless. It's about to start, Barry spoke softly, hoping they heard him. Not sure if you're picking up any of this. A single jolt for a response caused Barry to jump. Son of a gun! He shrieked without thinking. The man a few feet from him looked at him. You okay, old man? I'm fine. I'm fine. Bug or something. Thanks. Barry returned his gaze to the yard. When he heard for them to open it up, he blessed himself with the sign of the cross and held his breath. The dead didn't just run. They charged out of that fenced-in area, converging together, causing a traffic jam, with one or two breaking free of the pack. They led the way to Rachel and Yates. He didn't know what to expect or how Rachel and Yates would take them on. Perhaps a bold charge forth by them both in a festival of repeated slash and stab. What he didn't expect was for them to run from the dead. They both started backing up toward the school together. Then Rachel ran one way and Yates the other. The dead started to divide off as well until Rachel pounded her gladius against her honing rod, calling out, Here! Over here! Come on! They changed course, focusing on her. Barry was so worried and concerned for Rachel that he didn't see where Yates went. Clearly, he was able to slip behind the horde, because before Barry knew it, the back of the group disappeared. Questionable huhs and ohs erupted from the small group of cafeteria spectators. Yates raced across the yard to the fence and started to bang on it. This way! Hey! They were too close and focused on Rachel. Nothing Yates did caught their attention until he forged forward to them. Barry watched him raise his sword, slice through the back legs of two of them. Their knees buckled, and Yates swung out, beheading a third while still screaming. The ones on the ground moved, trying to stand, but unable to. They crawled toward Yates, and the remaining ones finally turned. Yates was able to stab through the head of one on the ground, before luring those who remained. Rachel repeated his actions. With the gladius, in a single motion, she cut through the back of the knees of the one, bringing up the blade to another and impaling it in the back of the throat. She left the one that buckled and moved for another, bringing it to the ground the same way. Then there were six. Rachel and Yates had succeeded to thin the herd with the oldest eliminator trick in the book. The spectators went from shocked to cheering. The noise they created in the cafeteria only served to aid Rachel and Yates inadvertently distracting the remaining ones, enabling Rachel and Yates to do what Barry expected and waited for. Slice and stab. Steady, seamlessly, and quick. After not a single stiff remained standing, they walked through and victoriously impaled the heads of those still moving. It was done. Over, Barry lowered his head in relief. It's good. They're done, he said softly. They did it. She wasn't winded until she stopped. Then Rachel breathed heavily, her shoulders bouncing up and down. She would be lying if she said she wasn't expecting one or more of the armed padded guards to shoot them. Instead, she was greeted with a slow, steady clapping. Stafford walked into the yard across the carnage. Well done, well done. I saw one other Eliminator do that, and he was the one that made it to the next challenge. When will that be? asked Yates. Tomorrow. Give you guys a chance to relax, eat, drink. Think of it as your last meal. You're pretty confident, Rachel said. You didn't think we'd beat this one. No, I didn't. As soon as he finished that, Rachel heard it. The demonic growls and snarls. She snapped her views to the once empty pen. It wasn't empty anymore. A pack of growlers viciously jumped over each other trying to get out as they eyed those in the yard. Fuck, Yates said. Yep. Stafford gave a shitty grin. Your next challenge. Chapter 25 Resolution 
Liz's voice nearly squealed with emotion as she met with Barry, Riggs, and Fred inside the EPEV. Dogs! Dogs! They call them growlers, Barry said. I know what they call them, Liz said. How many? Stafford said six, Barry answered. I swore I saw seven. Who knows? Oh, my God. Liz's hand covered her mouth. I don't think even giving up the EPEV will do it. This guy's sick, Barry said. He wants Yates dead and wants to enjoy every moment. She bit her bottom lip. When is this slated to go down? Noon, replied Barry. They'll let one of us in. It has to be me, said Riggs. I need it to be me. No, no. Liz waved out her hand. No one goes tomorrow because we get them tonight. We go in there, guns blazing, Riggs said. We chance them just killing Rachel and Yates. They're killing them tomorrow with dogs, Liz yelled. We go in tonight, we give them a fighting chance. Obviously, there's no negotiating with this monster, so we go and we storm his compound. Only one thing, Riggs said. It's not a compound. It's a town with families, children. We go in there hostile, we will be met with resistance and a lot of angry people when we win. Our whole purpose as eliminators is to eliminate the bad in this world to make it a better place to live. We're defeating our purpose if we don't save those already there. We need to find a way to take out Stafford and his gang. Take him out, the structure will fall. Or, Barry added, you can be kind and bring him to justice. Show everyone we aren't the bad guys here. Maybe go tonight and show force. That might do it. Riggs, Barry, I get it, Liz said. I do, but we cannot take a chance. You... You shouldn't want to take a chance. You know the only way to kill growlers is to shoot them. They're too fast. Rachel and Yates may be fast enough to take down one each, but the others will rip them apart before they can withdraw their swords. There's no way. Fred spoke up. What if there is? Liz looked at him. What do you mean? I have an idea. Hold on. Fred raced into the EPEV and returned. He held what looked like a slightly larger flashlight in his hand. What if tomorrow at noon you're ready to go in? Riggs is a great shot. What if he helps them out and you stand by to take down Stafford? I would do that in a heartbeat, Riggs said. With a good automatic, I could take out three or four right away, but they check and pat me down for guns. Fred handed him the flashlight. Riggs chuckled and turned it on. What am I supposed to do, beam them to death? Open up the bottom. Riggs unscrewed the bottom. Instead of batteries sliding out, a small pistol and clip rolled out. The pistol looked as if the handle had been cut off, when, in fact, the clip was fashioned as a handle that snapped on. Holy shit, said Riggs. Pretty nifty, Fred said. That Al thought of everything. I suggest you practice tonight. You're going to have to be faster than a one-legged man in a butt-kicking competition to get it open, get it, snap it together, aim and shoot before the first dog takes a bite. Fred, Liz spoke compassionately. It's a great thought, but even Riggs admitted he could only get a few. Oh, Lizzie, you are so nice, Fred smiled. But I got us a whole plan. The sound of pouring liquid carried in the quiet teacher's lounge, where they held Rachel and Yates, locked and under armed guard. I wish you wouldn't drink, Yates said. At least so much. Rachel turned from the window. You want me on my A game tomorrow? She joked. This isn't funny. You should call for Stafford now. Or better yet, when Barry or Riggs get here tomorrow, you leave with them. No. Other than the fact I don't think Stafford will let me, you need a fighting chance. There is no fighting chance with growlers. You know that. They may stare you down for a minute, but when they pounce, you're done. A minute. Yeah. She sighed out loudly, walked to the weapon bag, then over to Yates, who sat on the floor. All I need is a minute. Really? Yates asked sarcastically. Look... A year ago, I lost my son. I never got to say goodbye. I watched my daughter get torn apart, and my husband, he sacrificed himself so she wouldn't die alone. Yates looked at her. Like you're doing? Sort of. I've been on borrowed time, Yates. I became an eliminator because I hated these things. I didn't fear death. I don't fear it. I have no family left, no one depending on me. I think maybe Riggs and Barry would argue with that, Yates said. Maybe. I'm ready and okay with dying. Me too, said Yates. However, I didn't imagine my death at the jaws of a pack of zombie dogs. Neither did I. It'll be painful. No, it won't. 
Rachel extended her hand to him. Yates looked down to the object she dropped in his palm. A brown ball. It looked rubbery and not much bigger than a pea. It's a kill pill, he said. They issued them, remember, early on? I always kept them in my bag. I didn't imagine myself ever being in the position to use it. It'll suck to go out that way, but it's better than being torn apart. You said a minute. You can swallow that and it won't hurt you, but... Bite down, Yates said. Death comes in a minute. If there's no other option, they open those gates, we bite down. Yates looked at it in his hand. Thank you. There was silence, a long moment of silence between them. The only inkling of a sound was Rachel sipping her drink. Then Yates jumped up suddenly. Oh my God, I got it! What? I can't believe it! I got it! I really got it! What? Rachel asked excitedly. Ready? Rachel nodded. Yates began to sing in the melody of American Pie. So high five, we take it in stride. We suit up and we roll in the dead they can't hide. He snapped his fingers with a smile. Eliminators coming in their cool ass ride, putting down the ones that don't die. Putting down the ones that don't die. Rachel just stared. Huh? Huh? It's good, isn't it? Seriously? The last night of our lives and you're thinking about the missing chorus to Riggs's parody of American Pie? It was really bothering me. Yates sat back down. Now it isn't. I feel much better. The chorus made you feel better? Strange, huh? But hey, something gave me resolution. And on this last night, having something resolved is important. You're right. Tonight is about resolution. She repeated the word resolution in her mind as she rolled the kill pill gently between her fingers while staring down to it. Chapter 26 Penultimate March 13th, Day 328, Amarillo, Texas It was a strange feeling to Rachel. She truly believed that if ever faced with the reality of her death, she would be scared. But that wasn't the case as she walked down the hall with Yates and Stafford and one other armed guard. Rachel felt at peace. She rolled the kill pill around her mouth like a tic-tac, trying to resist the urge of prematurely biting it, like she used to do with a cough drop or lifesaver. You two aren't being mouthy today, Stafford said. Not feeling as cocky? Stafford! Riggs's voice carried down the hall. His sharp, exhaled breath sounded annoyed as he turned around. Riggs. Riggs approached them. Look, I saw your little display of strength out there, Stafford told him. We aren't scared. I even let you in when I didn't have to. I do thank you for moving the EPEV closer for us. We aren't here to scare you. They're here as assurance. And the EPEV, it's yours. Take it. I'm sorry, Al. Please, one last time. It's not Al, Yates said. You can make another, Riggs said. Your lives are more important. Another? Yates asked. Do you know how long it took me to make that one? Stafford shook his head. Not gonna work, Riggs. We're getting that EPEV anyhow. And we're ready for you guys if you decide you're going to storm this town. It's embarrassing the way you folks are begging. Right now, they have a challenge to meet. Riggs nodded. Riggs, Yates said. I swear to God, if you don't kill this asshole after all this, some way, somehow, I will haunt you. You aren't going anywhere, Riggs replied and turned to Rachel. Hey, she said softly. Please know it has been a pleasure and honor serving with and knowing you. Riggs shook his head. It's not over. Don't give up. Just... He placed his hands on her face. You grab what you can as fast as you can, okay? Don't delay. Grab what you can as fast as you can. I'll be outside, by the fence. You got this. He backed up, turned, and walked away quickly. Yates tilted his head and looked at Rachel. That has got to be the strangest advice I've gotten. We have our weapons. Grab what? Maybe our wits? Stafford nudged them forward. Now is not the time, Yates said, for him to be philosophical. Riggs literally had to run to get to the playground fence before they led Rachel and Yates out to the yard. As with the dead challenge, four armed guards in padded suits were present inside the fence. 
He guessed they were there to put down the dogs after they finished off Rachel and Yates. He was the only one outside other than them. He stared up, measuring the height of the fence. Then he grabbed the flashlight. He knew not to do anything with it too soon. I'm in position, he spoke. Do you have me? He was ready for it, but the shock still made him jump. Four inside with weapons. Do you see them? Another buzz. Another jolt. Riggs cringed. The door opened and Rachel and Yates were moved out by Stafford. Give them thirty seconds after I'm inside. Stafford turned, went back to the school, and stood behind a metal gated door, allowing him to see and call out his command. Rachel and Yates are out here. See them? Buzz. There's another armed guard outside the school. Jolt. Another wince. Double hit me when you're locked on. Riggs slowly unscrewed the bottom of the flashlight, inconspicuously letting the cap drop down. Buzz, buzz. On my call, Riggs said. I wish he wasn't there, Yates said. He's twitching. He must be nervous. Don't look at Yates, Rachel told him. Focus, okay? Don't lose sight of what you have to do. You have the kill pill? On the side of my mouth. I wish I would have gotten to know you better, Yates. Same. And thank you for this. Rachel raised her weapons, as did Yates. It wasn't much of a sound that anyone really would have noticed. A slight sound, or more so a sound like a fast wiffle bat through the air. The noises that followed couldn't be ignored. They came fast. Thud, crack, thud, crack. The double tap shot to the chest and helmet, quick and efficient, took down all four padded guards in the yard, the last one falling just as he opened the gate to the growlers. Stafford's loud shout of, No! rang out across the yard. Riggs! By the time the fourth had fallen, Riggs had the piece together. Instantly, Rachel spit out her pill and spoke rapidly. Grab what you can as fast as you can. Shit! Yates! They're guns! The growlers sped forth, bumping into each other, paws sliding on the pavement as Rachel and Yates both ran for the guards. Pop! Pop! Riggs took down one, then another. Three feet away, Yates dropped to a rolling slide at the guard, grabbing his automatic weapon and swinging it around to fire just as a growler leapt for him. When Rachel lifted the pistol from the ground, she expected to be tackled by one of the dogs. Instead, she saw they went after Yates. She shot one, then another as she stepped his way. Yates fired off another round. It hit the growler in the chest. The animal rolled back, gained his stance once more, and lunged for Yates. Rachel picked it off a second before the growler had him. Rachel! Yates called out in a warning. She spun around and would have been able to get the final dead animal that came her way, but a bullet to the head took it down immediately. Was it down? Were there any more? She looked over at Yates, then saw Riggs climbing over the fence. You son of a bitch! Stafford charged out of the building, armed and aiming at Yates. You son of a bitch! Riggs was only halfway down when he jumped and raced over to Stafford, holding his weapon steady. Drop it! Drop it now! He walked closer, putting the gun as near as he could to Stafford's head. It's over. Stafford turned around to face Riggs. It's over for you, Riggs told him. All these sick, twisted games. Done! Stafford lowered his rifle just a little, and Rachel stepped from behind him and took it. She stood next to Riggs. Still holding an aim on Stafford, Riggs lifted his radio from his belt. Are you in? Copy that, Barry said. We're in. Go on, Stafford told him. Shoot me. What are you waiting for? No. Riggs shook his head. No need to. Right now, as we speak, our people have entered your town. They're disarming your men and taking control. Eventually, you'll be executed, but not by my hand. Riggs said what he needed to say, despite what he wanted to do. He was proud of how in control he was. He was expecting some snide comment from Stafford. What he wasn't expecting was the fast whoosh sound that preceded the clean slice through Stafford's neck that took his head from his body. His head landed at Riggs's feet. His body remained standing for a second or two before it, too, finally fell. Riggs looked up from the head. Yates stood holding his sword. Really? Riggs asked. Really? Fuck him. With a slight spin of the sword, Yates placed it in his sheath. It was a good speech, though. 
He took a step forward and stopped. Oh, my God. Fuck. What? Rachel asked. I bit the pill. Oh, shit, you bit the pill? Rachel freaked out. Oh, my God, no! I did. Wait, did I? Yates tilted his head and thought. No. I swallowed it or spit it out. I didn't bite it. I'm good. I need that drink now. He walked from the yard. Oh, that was close, Rachel said. Phew. What pill? Riggs asked. Don't worry about it. Rachel took a few steps to follow Yates, but stopped. Riggs? She looked over her shoulder. Thank you. You're welcome, but Rach... He followed. What pill? Chapter 27 Season Finale Liz sent teams into the town, and they were met with little, if any, resistance. A sweep team captain even commented that it was nice to not have to go into a city and shoot. The hecticness was dying down as a lot of the troops pulled out. Riggs double-checked the RV for supplies and just kept shaking his head at Yates. He stood by his EPEV playing that expensive guitar, singing the parody version of American Pie that Riggs had started. Everyone that walked by him stopped to listen and tell Yates how cool the song was. He didn't stop playing. Then again, the original song was nine minutes. Jealous? Rachel asked as she approached Yates. Nah, I like it. Never could figure out the chorus. Yeah, and it just came to him. He's written like three more verses. Casper would be proud. Yep, Rachel agreed. Casper would be proud. You think Yates will be okay? Riggs asked. I think he'll be just fine. Barry stepped from the RV. Sandy's ready. I think it's getting late. We need to find a place to settle for the night. Liz thinks we should take some R&R. &R. Maybe talk about that before we hit Weatherford and finish Stroud. Rachel nodded. Sounds good. Let's, uh, go say goodbye to Yates. The three of them walked over to him. Hey, Riggs said. We're getting ready to go. Oh. Yates stopped playing, stood up, and took off the guitar. Riggs extended his hand. I want to thank you and wish you good luck. Wish me... Wish me luck? Yates asked. I thought... Never mind. No, wait. I thought I would be on your team now. Riggs looked quickly to Rachel and then to Barry. Really? You want to join the Flaming Saffrons? If you'll have me. Only, Rachel said, if you don't rely 100% on your techmobile. Yates held up his hand. I promise that. After fighting with you, I see how important it is not to lose your edge. Good. Rachel extended her hand. Welcome to the Flaming Saffrons, Yates. You know what? He winked. You guys can call me Al if you want. I don't know, Barry shrugged. Not going to be as fun if it doesn't annoy you. Liz inched in. Excuse me. Hey, I'm getting ready to roll out. Rachel, can I speak to you alone, please? Um, sure. Go ahead, guys. I'll catch up. Rachel joined Liz and walked off a few feet. Well, Riggs said while he exhaled, why don't we go tell Fred and Sandy while we wait for Rachel? Sounds good, Barry replied as they headed back to the RV. Get ready to roll out once she gets back. I really want to set up camp early. That R&R &R may not be a bad idea. Riggs stepped in first. Maybe we can work on the remaining verses, said Yates. What's going on? Sandy asked when they entered. Meet our newest team member, Barry said. Al's joining us. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so glad, Sandy gushed. Fred asked, How are we doing the RV thing? I mean, his is really nice. Why don't we take both? Barry suggested. We can combine it to one when we check in with command in Oklahoma City. Sounds good, Riggs replied. Fred, why don't you ride with Yates and get ready to take off when Rachel's done talking to Liz? For sure. His IC kicks better than a mule in a mud bath. Fred saw the looks he got. I need to teach you people some of these sayings. As he stepped to the side door, Rachel appeared. Riggs saw it right away. She looked shocked. Rach, everything okay? Slowly, Rachel stepped inside. Um, we need to report back to Center City in six weeks. What? Riggs asked. I thought that going east to eliminate stuff was in the past. It's not for that. Seems Dr. Stevens contacted Liz. He made progress and wants us to do a test run. With? Riggs asked. Casper. Hold on. 
Barry said. Casper is dead. Ish, Yates added. Dead ish. That's what Rachel said. Riggs just stared at Rachel. They want us to bring Casper with us as a test run? Yes. Casper. I think it'll be fun. All of us together and with new members? Think of him as a special version of Casper, Rachel said, excited. Oh, and wait until he hears the new words to American Pie. Uh-huh. Riggs turned. Barry, let's go. Riggs, Rachel shouted. You didn't give an answer. And Riggs would not. In fact, he didn't know what to say. He just continued getting the RV ready to roll, pretending that the inconceivable subject was never brought to his attention. But how could he ignore what he heard, or even not think about it? After all, it was Casper. The dynamics of the team weren't the same since they lost him. Admittedly, a part of Riggs was a bit curious how things could be if the special version of Casper would come back. Flaming Saffron's Log, March 13th, Day 328. Entry, Jeremiah Riggs. We really aren't very good at being diligent with these logs. In our defense, we had a rough couple of days. We are, however, back on the road, back to our mission of being eliminators. With two new members, a high-tech new vehicle at our disposal, and a new theme song, I think we're ready for whatever lies ahead of us. Things are different. Not just the faces, but the way we look at things, the way we will do things. Our goal as Eliminators is to not stop, to keep going until we can't go anymore, to do all we can to rid the world of the risen dead and make it safe. We are driven to make the world a better place. Each of us carries a heartache we wish would go away, and the memory of loved ones we never want to forget. It's a pipe dream to think we can make it some sort of happy utopia, where everything is roses and happy. We learned the dead aren't the only bad in this world, and no matter how much we do, we can get rid of the dead, but never all the bad. So all we can do is keep moving and keep trying, onward to whatever adventure the road ahead will bring. This has been The Eliminators, Volume 2. Written by Jacqueline Druga. Narrated by David Dietz. Copyright 2020 by Jacqueline Druga. Production copyright 2020 by Jacqueline Druga. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.